Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I would even dare say a special star-studded edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is March 2nd, 2022. I am here with my partner in truth and righteousness, Kara Burrell. Hey, hey. Kara, how are you feeling about today's episode? I am so pumped. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah. Have a, this is going to be an epic, maybe three part or maybe four. We're going to yeah. spend all day. This is so, going to be all buckling. day with John and Kara. So you got your shoulders out and you're ready to go. Your uh, guns out, ready to party. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, today we are interviewing somebody with probably tens of, if not hundreds of thousands of kind of like community members or supporters, we are here to interview uh, Rod Meldrum. Hey, Rod, welcome to Mormon Story Studios. Well, thank you, John and Kara. <laughs> glad to be here. We're glad that you're glad to be here. <laughs> For those who have no idea who Rod Meldrum is, because there's always like silos of, of information and communities, uh, Rod Meldrum is known as one of, if not the leaders and or if not the founder of something that's referred to as the heartland theory for the Book of Mormon. Uh, Rod can clarify or correct any of the introductions that I give. But basically, if I were to kind of tell you what you're in store for today, it would be the following. So, um, so you know, the Book of Mormon is clearly a foundational scriptural text for Mormonism created by Joseph Smith. We've covered it a gazillion times on Mormon Stories podcast. And uh, I think for many, many decades, if not a century or more, it was just kind of understood that uh, the Book of Mormon covered, uh, let's just say in terms of geographically, the Book of Mormon kind of tied to North, Central, and South America, that if you were to ask Joseph Smith or most, if not all, of the early Mormon prophets, seers, and revelators, where the Book of Mormon took place, uh, they would say throughout the Americas, from the from the top of the tip of Alaska all the way down to the bottom tip of Chile, like that's where the Book of Mormon took place. And if you were to ask Joseph Smith or any of his prophets, seers, and revelators up until just the past few decades, if you were to ask any of them, you know, where's the Hill Cumorah? There would be no question the Hill Cumorah is in upstate New York, and that is, you know, and that's the deal. Let's just say several decades ago, there sort of emerged within, this is my understanding, within Mormon thought, uh, particularly with uh, Farms, the Foundation for Ancient Research in Mormonism out of BYU, with Daniel Peterson and Lou Midgley, and even before him, before them, uh, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, the, the apologist Egyptian guy. I'm, I can't believe I'm spacing his name. Help me out here. Um, Hugh Nibley, Hugh Nibley and others. And then also John Sorensen, there came to be this concern that modern science couldn't support North America as the place the Book of Mormon happened. And I'm relying on a recent, I, I'm always fuzzy on a lot of this history. And so I, had a phone call with RFM just this morning to make sure I understood it. As, as BYU scientists slash apologists started really studying anthropology, linguistics, geography, archaeology, evolution, and all the different flavors of modern science, they're like, uh-oh, we have a problem. If the Book of Mormon happened in North America, uh, that, that doesn't speak well for the Book of Mormon. So that's when kind of this two Camorra theory of the Book of Mormon emerged where, oh, we can't have Palmyra being the place where the Book of Mormon, you know, wars happened and battles. We got to stick it somewhere in Mesoamerica, Central America, maybe Guatemala, because at least, at least it gets it out of a place where the Book of Mormon, a geography gets it out of a geography where the Book of Mormon couldn't have happened. But it also gets it to a place where there might be a little bit more scientific evidence to support that the Book of Mormon actually happened. And that's where kind of a Mesoamerica or a Central America or a limited geography theory of the Book of Mormon and a two Camorra sort of a version of, of the Book of Mormon started to emerge that became supported by Daniel Peterson, by Lewis Midgley, by John Sorensen, and by the 
BYU farms people that then migrated into the BYU Maxwell Institute people. And that, but, but what was interesting is then there became these two camps, kind of like the Central American, Mesoamerican, limited geography, Mormon, Book of Mormon apologists. But then that led to the emergence of Rodney Meldrum and the Heartland Theory, um, Book of Mormon apologists that said, no, 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 can't be Central America. It's more all of the Americas and or primarily North America for the Book of Mormon is taking place. And it even got more interesting because they started uh, criticizing each other's approaches. And so you've got farms in the Maxwell Institute saying Rodney Meldrum and the Heartland Theory people, they're bad, they're harmful, don't believe and follow them. And I wouldn't say that you've returned those no, levels of really criticism, yeah. but certainly you would say, here's why the Mesoamerica or the Tucumara theory isn't legitimate from your perspective. And so, so you've got, and, and that's for, for those who are kind of like not sure about the Book of Mormon's historicity at all, or who are just kind of interested to see, to observe Mormon apologetics. It's been at times over the past few decades, kind of theatrical to watch two different forms of Book of Mormon apologists kind of um, critique each other and challenge each other. So anyway, what's interesting about that, in addition to everything I just said, is that what's emerged from uh, Rod Meldrum's uh, kind of Heartland Theory movement is tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of more conservative, more fundamentalist, more, let's say, orthodox Mormons who are really interested in this point of view because it pulls young earth creationism. It pulls, you know, a questions about the age of the earth. It's sort of a, let's just say if I were to characterize, um, you know, the heartland heartlanders as they're often called, there tends to be a belief that the earth is, is seven to 8,000. Yes. You know, let's just say 7,000 years old and not billions of years old. That evolution is kind of bad that Adam and Eve were the first, uh, you know, humans or mortals on the earth, that Adam and Eve are were literal humans, that a global flood happened. And most stunningly, and Kara, this is where kind of, you know, you've, it's been fun to kind of watch your um, perspective on this. You know, what that pulls is a concern that uh, where did the water come from and go to that would have filled the whole earth? And it's led to even theories as controversial as, um, is the earth, you know, is the earth's core truly magma or molten lava or is it water? And, and so, uh, Carrie, you, you attended even a conference just this past summer. I went to the Book of Mormon evidence conference. Yes. Where you observed. Yeah, summary. that was a shocker. I thought I was going to hear a lot of things to do with like, yes, the Heartland theory, but there's way more than that, that I learned at that conference, put it that way. <laughs> Including the belief that the earth's core is water, not not molten lava, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was taken aback. But uh should we continue? Yes. Okay. So I, that's I, I kind guess, of I was just gonna say that that was a pretty accurate you know monologue there. He's a me, good little Wikipedia article, yeah. isn't he? <laughs> he just he can whip it out. Yeah. I have no idea what I'm talking about Very three quarters of the time. But that's my way of summarizing you, summarizing you and your work. But um, you know, I'll just say you told me just I in terms you of got the stats, basics pretty much there. Um, some, some nuances that need to be maybe addressed and we will eventually as, as we move along through the, through these, uh, interviews. Is there anything you would add or correct to my summary? <laughs> uh, well, well, as far as just things like the earth and the, the age and, uh, and some of the, you know, the interior of the earth things and there's nuances, but in, in general. Yeah. Okay. We have five hours to get to it. All right. That's right. That's <laughs> the nuances right. will be taken care of. Yes. Anyway. Okay. So, yeah. So just to kind of <laughs> let viewers and listeners know what they're going to be experiencing today, this is going to be an all day interview. We will probably do eight hours in total. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me for that, but we don't do shortcuts or sound bites on Mormon stories. Eight hours won't be enough, but here's how we're going to break it down. Part one is going to be, Rod's story. So we do Mormon stories here. We're just going to spend an hour or two just learning about the human and what motivates him, his history, and, and that sort of thing. So part one will be a story. Then we'll stop and we'll start again for part two, which is going to be us talking to Rod just about his views on 
Mormonism and its truth claims uh, just as a general survey. So we're not going to be digging into the Heartland Theory on part two, but we'll talk to him about you know, Joseph Smith's polygamy, the peep stone in the hat, like Book of Abraham, and just kind of get his, and, and the modern church and what it is to be a prophet and what modern revelation is and what scripture means. And just talk at a, high, at a higher level about his approach to Mormonism. That'll be part two. Part three will be us talking more in depth about what the Heartland Theory is, where where it comes from, and uh, and and just asking him questions about criticisms of it. And I'll just say as a disclaimer, we are not going to pretend to be getting into the deep science of the Heartland Theory today on Mormon Stories Podcast. What we've told Rod is we would prefer to bring back Thomas Murphy or Simon Southerton legitimate scientists where he can explain his scientific perspective about the heartland theory and the book of Mormon. And then a scientist can discuss the geology or the DNA or the archeology, span um, et cetera. So I just don't want people to think we're Karen and I are going to pretend to be scientists today. We're not scientists. And so we're not even going to try, but we are going to be talking about just what his positions are and how he, um, how he reconciles his positions with some criticisms uh, w- without pretending that we're going to dig into the science. So is that, is that okay? Yeah, that's good. And then the only th- other okay. thing we've promised Rod over today is we don't do gotchas on Mormon stories. We, we don't, we try not to be antagonistic. We're not here to try and embarrass him or argue with him or debate him per se. Uh, but I also have a commitment to, um, and, and I don't say this in a disparaging way. And these are words I've used with him. I'm really sensitive in 2022 to misinformation, disinformation, and what I would call pseudoscience. And so for people who are followers of Rod or supporters of him, you might get frustrated at times if I don't allow the conversation to get into deep areas of science. It's not out of disrespect for Rod or a desire to mute or muzzle him. It's just because I'm really sensitive to to false science or pseudoscience. Uh, you having my platform be as a place where that goes unchallenged. And I'm just going to admit I am not qualified to talk about DNA or you know geology. And so I, I'm not going to try. But I'm also not wanting the conversation to go too deep there. Sure. Do you have a response to that? Because I know it's a delicate thing. Uh, to go into a really deep dive would take literally weeks Semesters. probably yeah, yeah, yeah exactly so yeah oh so yeah it, absolutely you have to keep it at kind of a not not the sixty thousand foot level but maybe the thirty thousand foot level at sure. some point but uh, we're not going to get into the weeds in too much detail um unless you have other other people here that we can uh, yeah. talk to about it too okay. hopefully okay. they're watching yeah yeah, yeah. we've so. got we've already got okay 350 people on the live stream and i'm guessing it's going to grow throughout the day so that's fun care anything you want to add about why do you care so much about this issue? Like, it's kind of personal for you, but I don't know if you even want to go there or not. Um, I mean, we'll get into it throughout the day. I know my mom has probably tried to talk you out of coming on what she might term as like an anti-Mormon podcast. And I hope that that is not your experience today. I hope that we are very um, just like pro-truth, pro-transparency, pro-people. And I view people yeah. as, you know, products of their genetics and their conditioning. And so I'm excited to start this podcast by just understanding if you're the one of the biggest proponents of the heartland theory, I just, I'm curious of yeah. where did you come from? What motivates you? And so just from that starting point, I think is a beautiful, like, yeah, jumping off point for that. will lead the discussion the rest of the day. All right. That sounds good. Okay. So Tell me and, where we want to, we want to jump in. Yeah. Yeah. Let's jump in. <laughs> and I, I'm going to just go quickly to, okay. So we actually have slides um, that Rodney has brought uh, for the storytelling part of of today um and and so rodney you'll have to tell me kind of when to go to the slide as you change the slide if you'll tell kind of weave it into your narrative because rod brought visuals and these visuals are fun i've already reviewed them and what's fun about these visuals is they show him kind of you know in the in the 60s what he had (laughs) (laughs) they show his his upbringing growing up in cash valley and i think the visuals are a fun way to accent your your story so i've i've got the computer hooked up here and you'll just have to tell me as you change the slide i'm going to go back between the shot of you 
and the shot of your slides. Sure. And I just need you to kind of tell me when to kind of advance to the next slide. Is that you okay? Bet. You bet. Well, kind of, maybe just a, a explanation as to why I have this in the first place. Because sure. like a number of well, probably about three years ago, I had the um, the opportunity. Somebody said, "I'd like to. We'd like to come and speak to our group, but not about the Heartland stuff." And I go, "Oh, oh no." <laughs> um, but uh, they said, actually, what we'd like to do is have you tell a little bit about your um, your story, your your uh, how how you came to believe the things you believe, and uh, and so that led me into a, a, a number of things. But one of the big things is, is we have a lot of issues nowadays with uh, with suicide and uh, suicide prevention. As I think uh, is a big thing, we have way too many kids who are dis dis deciding to just end their lives and um, and. And I think I, a message of hope kind of thing would be, that's kind of what I decided to do in this particular case. And I actually think it works out pretty well for what we're doing here because it, it, it kind of introduces not just that, but, you know, basically hang in there, bad things happen. Um, and uh, so that's, should we, should we jump into that? Yeah, real quick? And, I, and I guess what I hear you <clears throat> saying is maybe there've been times in your life where you've been so low that those types of thoughts have even entered your mind. And you're saying, you, something that you feel like you've been through some of those rougher feelings and well, you want to give other people hope that it maybe if you yeah. work through some hard things, they can too. Well, and, 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 and full disclosure, I, I really never had the the thought that I'm going to end it, but I just didn't know how was, how was this going to come out? How was this going to, but you've hit, how was I going to survive this? <laughs> you know, you've hit desperation so bad. Yeah. I was just desperate. Okay. But, but as far as, yeah, I haven't really ever had any thoughts of actually ending it, okay, okay. which has been, I, I think, kind of a blessing because I, I know that that plagues a lot of people. Yeah, but you want people to have yeah. hope. You want your story. Mm -hmm. If your story can give people hope, exactly, it'll be good for you. And I, and I think and in the process, it also kind of tells me a little bit about my my faith, basically how I uh, how I view things, I guess, would be a good way to to yeah talk about it. so so the the the, uh, the the slide here says uh you know do bad things happen for good reasons or as i like to uh call it uh my miserable horrible terrible life full of trials <laughs> all right now now you have to understand I, as uh I, I don't really believe that that's that my life has been horrible okay in any way shape or form but there's been times and i think all of us have experienced those times when it just looks like there's just no way out or things are going to be horrible. In fact, uh, I like this little, uh, this little meme here as this author meet the author of the book called my miserable life. And here's her, her parents. And she says, look, we're sorry. If we had known you were going to be a writer, we'd have been better parents. <laughs> and so I have to say that, uh, unlike the, uh, the writer in this meme, um, I instead was born of, uh, as the book one would say, goodly parents. Um, this is my my mom, uh, Carol Jean Tuttle Meldrum, and my dad, uh, uh, Calvin Ray Meldrum Jr. Um, this is on their wedding day, years and years and years ago. And uh, just a just a really just very brief background. My 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 father served a mission in the Central States Mission, oh. and it was for three years. And he came back kind of dejected because he had absolutely zero baptisms, convert baptisms. He was just like, oh no. And he kind of felt like that that was, uh, you know, that he had that he'd somehow had failed or whatever. So when he met my mom at BY Academy, um, she was from St. Louis. He is from uh, Oregon. And uh, they decided that uh, that if he couldn't um, baptize anybody, have any con converts, uh, maybe he could raise up some converts. And mm -hmm. so they uh, so they they decided early on to be really good parents. And, uh, and so we had, uh, the, the obligatory, you know, the scriptures every morning we did that. Uh, we went through pretty much all the scriptures at least several times before I, you know, became of age to go on a mission. And, uh, and I have to really give a lot of credit to my parents for that. We had, uh, and a lot of you may have heard of like living scriptures and they had these dramatized, you know, book of Mormon tapes and so forth. We'd listen to those and, and, uh, we, we couldn't listen to the radio in the car until we'd. Uh, listen to the same amount of time <laughs> in the living scriptures and stuff. So I got a pretty big dose of that as a kid growing up. And I hate to say this and mom, whatever, both, both my parents have passed. And so, uh, so uh, I, I will have to say that I, I was probably the, uh, the one that was the most resistant to all of that. 
I probably gave my parents the most rash about, uh, about doing that kind of thing. But there was a couple of things that, uh, that really kind of stuck. And one of the things that, that helped me um, when I was, uh, I had some friends that were members of the church as well. Uh, and uh, Kevin Glenn and Corey Parker, and, and uh, they're still around. <laughs> so so uh, we had um, different times in our lives when we would kind of fall off the wagon, if you, if you will. And, and then the other two would kind of pull the other one back in and so forth. But my mom really had the most influence. I like this, this picture. I kind of photoshopped it a little bit, but, but, um, but one of the things that she always told me is, Rod, you know, if you just do what is right, if you follow the truth, then, you know, you'll be blessed. And if you don't, then there's no promise. So you don't have, uh, you know, so if you, if, so just Lord is bound do when you do what he says. says. Exactly. You kind of thing. 8210. Is that exactly. Right? Yep. Yeah. And so, uh, so that, that really, and she used that pretty effectively, you know, so, you know, uh, Rada, you, you, you should go to this fireside tonight. And I'm like, oh, mom, I got, I'm too busy. I don't want to go. And so forth. Well, you know, if you do what the Lord wants you to do, <laughs> I'm like, oh, mom, I hate when you say that, <laughs> you know? So anyway, um, can I can I ask you? Yeah. So you were born what what year? Um, in '63. You were born in '63. I'm old. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. So you're you're went to uh, Skyview High School. I, you're actually, six years. You're six years. So you're fifty. I, fifty. I'm not trying to out your age. I'm just. Yeah. I like to. So you're fifty-eight. Okay. 50, um, technically fifty-nine. 59. Now, okay. I just barely had my birthday. Okay. So you were yeah. born in '63. Yeah. So a year before the Beatles came to America. So your teen yeah. years would have been in the seventies. Yeah, seventies, eighties, rock and roll, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm just trying to like yeah. get so so you would have you would have been alive and, and aware when like Joseph when, when David O. McKay dies. So you would have been you would have might have even remembered David O. K. McKay being prophet. Just barely, yeah. But then yeah. but then Harold E. Lee and Joseph Fielding Smith and then Spencer B. Kimball probably would have been your main probably the one that yeah when that I when I was on my mission and whatever that he was at that point. But this but this mid seventies is like when the church was. Oh well, you would have been you would have remembered the ancient America speaks kind of oh we played Mormonism right numerous times right so you would have been you would have been watching seminary videos of the church really well I guess if it's um, Sorensen but also Thomas. It's Ferguson, Thomas Ferguson, Stuart, Stuart Ferguson. So you would have okay. I'm sorry, I'm just putting but, this but together. I don't tell that he really had much out there at that point in time. I didn't remember anything from him, but but all uh, I'm saying it, it is that Jack you, West, and uh, that was kind of the. All I'm saying is like when the group. when the church was really starting to, um, gather evidence from its Central America explorations and expeditions to yeah. try and find evidence for the Book of Mormon. And then produce videos and those film strips, dude, yeah. dude. You know, <laughs> you would have been growing up at the time where the church was really using starting to do Central that, yes. America archaeology as a way to bolster Book of Mormon veracity. So you would have been exposed yeah. to that as a as a kid. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You remember that? I remember that in seminary. Yeah. Did that get you absolutely. excited? Like, oh, the church is true. They found a baptismal font in Central America, <laughs> or they found a tree of life. You know, on a wall in yeah. In surprisingly, Guatemala I didn't or whatever. It didn't really affect me. Too. I mean, I, I I just thought, well, that's interesting. There's people who are a lot smarter than I am that have figured this out. I'm glad that they did. And and uh, uh, but as I read the Book of Mormon, though, numerous times through my my youth and 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 up into my teenage years, basically, um, I had uh, the impression from the book of mormon that you know they, take, they keep talking about this mighty gentile nation about above all other nations it talks about a land of freedom and a land of prosperity and a land of liberty they call it you know eight different times the book of mormon and and I, I was kind of having a hard time reconciling well how okay so if that's guatemala um does that fit better and we'll get into that discussion when we get into the heartland stuff but so you're saying was, as you I, studied... always, I always just kind of had a little bit of a uh, hesitation in part as far as just like I said, well, you know, I, I, I'm just a dumb kid. I don't know anything. So I just kind of accepted it as well. That's OK. I didn't I didn't internalize it, but I just kind of said, well, that's OK. There's there's some interesting potential evidence there. And we did play the the uh, the film strip, you know, on, while I was serving my mission in Milan, Italy. We'll get into the, the mission thing in here in just a minute. But 
But as you, you're yeah. saying, as you were reading the Book of Mormon as a teen, you and you were watching church film strips or videos about Central America potentially being the location of the Book of Mormon. You had questions as yeah. early as then yeah. about whether that fit yep, I would the text so. that yeah. you were reading. Yeah, I just didn't didn't seem to. I thought, well, yeah, I, don't, I like I said, I, I don't know much about it at this point in time, and so I just kind of interesting, just kind of deferred to the to the experts. Okay, <laughs> but you read the Book of Mormon like as a teen? So, uh, yeah, from it? yeah, several times. In fact, uh, one of the things that my parents did is that if you read the Book of Mormon, then then uh, there was some you'd get to go. Um, by the time I was eight years old. Then I got to go out to dinner with my mom and dad. So it was the first dinner in, ever in a restaurant was in my, my, when I turned eight years old. And uh, Let me guess, Bluebird or and, Maddox? Uh, Which one? Bluebird um, or Maddox? Actually, we went to Piccadilly Fish and Chips. <laughs> I've never heard of that. That must be not be there anymore. <laughs> no, it's not there anymore. It was up there in Logan. Yeah. First time I ever had the little English chips, and I thought it was the best thing ever. And my, my, my parents didn't like fish, and my mom didn't like making fish. So we never had fish, really, growing up. But I like fish now. But anyway. Enough about that. <laughs> but you're a Cash Valley boy. Yeah. Cash Valley actually it's a little place called Young Ward, which is between Logan and Menden, Utah. Yeah. And it's a and we, my dad had a little dairy farm. He uh he, he is that kind of northwest Cash Valley? Does that sound right? Um it's kind of central and west. Central yeah. west, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um people know where Wellsville is. I went to Wellsville Elementary School yeah. and then South Cash as far as junior high and then Skyview High School. I understand you have some uh, some of your family went to Skyview. Went to Skyview. You lived yeah. in North Logan and yeah. so forth. So yeah, so you know the area. Yeah, but yeah, so Young Ward basically grew up there on dairy farm. My my dad uh, um, worked at Utah State University though to support his dairy habit. Was it called and, Agricultural uh, College at the time, or was it? Yeah, it was the Aggies. I mean, it was always been the Aggies, but it was an agricultural college, and I think they still consider it to be an agricultural college. I think it was named like. Yeah agricultural college before yeah. it was renamed yeah. to usu anyway so i grew up milking cows and and uh and and uh hauling hay and so forth. i spent my summers a lot of times uh you know hauling hay for my my dad or other people they pay us to do that so anyway but then that actually leads into that's that's uh this the next little picture here this is uh we had uh this is part of our our uh, farm there we had horses this is lady it's my little sister on the back with me and uh we would I just spent my summers. I think I kind of feel like I had a kind of an idyllic, you know, uh, childhood. Grew up ahead of the Logan River was in our backyard, and I spent a lot of time playing back there. And so are those forth. the Wellsvilles behind you? Yeah, those are the Wellsvilles, Wellsville's back there. Yeah, and this is my family. So I have an older brother and uh, and an older sister and two younger sisters. I'm right. I'm right in the middle, so I'm the the problem child. <laughs> and uh, this is you can see the hairstyles here. You know, um, this is back in the day. Got those uh, polyester co collars. Oh, yeah. and Oh, it was great, wasn't it? Those prints and stuff, <laughs> they were just fabulous. But anyway, so. The wide, wide ties and gla <laughs> yeah. glasses, I love it. Exactly. So this is kind of me. I, you know, I'm, I'm a kid. I'm growing up. I've got two parents that love me and a pretty stable home. We live in a great ward. You know, I mean, life is good. And I'm thinking I'm I'm really happy. You know, I'm, I'm really happy. And then, um, then life goes, just wait a sec, <laughs> right? Never ever have that happen to you. You know, Never. you're kind of thinking, man, things are finally just working out. Oh, things are wow. great. And all of a sudden, wham. And uh, one of those kind of ever things. Ever happened to you, Kara? Has that ever happened to you? Yeah, Kara. No, I was birthed 33 years ago and I've never had a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> good deal. Well, so uh, so one of, the, one of the good things that was kind of happening is I had this neighbor, uh, Lance Bohm, who, uh, who had a mink ranch. And so over the course of time, um, you know, he was in our ward and, and uh, he knew I was work looking for work here and there and so i'd still i'd help him with different jobs around the mink ranch can i just say i have to ask you this yeah i once had so i i know that even today there's still some mink ranches in idaho kind of southern yeah, idaho i think there's a couple of them cash totally, valley but, yeah. area and but but cash valley used to be a big producer of mink and maybe it still yeah. is but and no, I, I don't think so. <laughs> I have heard, Oh, you don't think it is? I doubt it. Okay. Well, I've yeah. heard, I've, I remember when I was living there, someone yeah. telling me, and, and I'm not was, trying to it make was, it, it was though. I'm yeah. not trying to make this darker, but, but I, I, because I've got this memory and you've worked on a mink farm, I have to ask you, somebody told me once that they lived by or drove by a mink farm and it was actually a very scary and dark kind of experience because apparently they, they skin the minks alive, and when they do, they make a really awful shriek. And this isn't me 
trying to like do a gotcha. Yeah. That's just yeah. all I literally have ever heard about yeah. inks. Well, let me, you let me, ever let me, there let me when kind of were... set it straight because okay. I, I was okay. there and helped with some of that. I, I didn't do most of the, uh, the 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 killing part. Basically, were you there when the killing happened? Oh yeah. Oh okay. Yeah. Okay. They 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 have to you know they they grow the mink and so forth and then they they're in these little teeny cages and uh, it's it's you know they're they're small animals so they don't need uh, apparently a lot of space but you know I mean they anyway I won't get into the humanitarian aspect of the whole thing I'll just say that that was you know it was a um that the way that they were primarily primarily killed there was a there was a tool basically and uh, they bite on the tool and you just twist it back and then just pull it and just and it just and it breaks their their skull at the back and 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 uh, there's no they just go limp really there's no screeching they're not skinned alive or anything like that okay but it's kind of an interesting uh way to make money but it's, you know it's the same way that people who uh you know cattle industry do cow you know yeah. cattle or chickens or whatever i mean Pigs. something's gonna die you know yeah. for for what we are doing so yeah. that's kind of the uh you know the situation there but basically, so I, I I was helping with feeding the mink and that kind of stuff. Oh, I've also and, heard and, that and mink are nasty. Oh, like they are mean little critters. Is that yes. true? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, how how would you like if you were stuck in a cage your whole life and could get out? Yeah, I'd be pretty. But upset. when you say they're mean little critters, what do you mean? Uh, they're 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 part of the weasel family. So I mean, they they it, when they're when they're cornered or whatever, they they uh they have sharp little teeth and they'll they'll tear you to shreds if you're not careful. So you have big big gloves that go up to your elbows and mm -hmm. so forth anyway but the point basically i was trying to make here is that is that the um that when it comes down to the mink sheds they were expanding because uh you know people there's a there's a demand for mink coats back at that time and uh and, and furs and and collars and things like that, that people would use for you know to show kind of status because they were expensive because they, you know they're animal skins basically they're very soft anyway so the uh so the deal was, is that, uh, he came to me and said, I need you to, uh, this is my, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the summer after my senior year in high school. So I'd gone to Utah or, or not to Utah state, but to uh, Skyview high school. And, um, he came and said, I need to build like four more of these sheds in the back. And there's a lot to do. As you can see, one of these sheds has, it involves, uh, making these wooden boxes and all these, uh, wire cages and the, and the, the roof structure and all that stuff. And he says, uh, I think it's probably kind of take you all summer to do that. And uh, so here's your job for the summer. We'll just have, have you build these mink, rent, mink, mink sheds. Well, I'm, I'm a pretty focused guy. So when I get started on a project, I, I go for it. And about, uh, about four weeks into the summer, the mink sheds were done. And I was like, okay, so now what? And he's going, well, that's, that's really all I had planned for you for the whole summer. I said, so what you're saying is, is, I was getting paid by the hour, not by the job. So, so, uh, so you have nothing else for me to do. And if you know about summer jobs, basically they're not that easy to come by. And so, uh, so I was like, okay, so what am I going to do now? And I, uh, at, at the time I had this, uh, this awesome, uh, car, my, it was my, my older sister's car and I bought it from her. It's a, it's a, uh, those who recognize it's American Motors Javelin SST. It's a sweet ride. It was a sweet ride, man. It was, it was, it was fast. It had a big 390 motor in it and so forth. It was pretty hopped up. But anyway, so that was my, uh, my, my car. Uh, other than that, my, my parents had a, a Robin egg blue Ford Falcon station wagon. And when I would drive that to Skyview high school, most of my friends would like crawl down in the back seat and lay down so nobody could see them. Yeah. Coming in to high school. You ever had that experience? No, no. I've Apparently never done not. anything wrong in my life. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did that, but with like 20 kids in a minivan. Similar okay, though. Okay, not, yeah. not quite as cool. Yeah. Well, but but you probably don't even know what a Ford Falcon station wagon was, right? I can Google it. Okay, oh, there we go. Okay. So there you Our go. family actually did have a station wagon growing up. It was up. a Robin Egg Blue, so it made it even more sweet. fun. Okay. So I so I had I had to get something. So my sister sold me this car for I think 500 bucks or something, and the transmission was blown. And so I I uh, took a course and and, and uh, rebuild the transmission and auto shop but anyway the point basically i'm trying to make here is that this is this is in a time frame i also had a girlfriend who was kind of preparing a for a, uh, a mission i always wanted to go on a mission that was one of my things that you know hope they call me on a mission right when you're and you're in primary now is that photo literally you with the girl sitting on your bed yes that's you that's, that's your room. room that's my room 
Yep. Okay. My mom was taking the photo. photo. I mean, somebody had to take so the photo. So you got right? your sweet stereo there. Yes. I had to you, you probably take play, stereo, had the stereo. Record, record, record player. player right there. See on the left hand side there. The vinyl you and were posters in the vinyl. on the wall. Yeah, this is in our basement downstairs. And so I have to I have to ask you something. This was this was breakfast in bed, by the way. So it was my birthday. And so my What's a girl doing over. sitting on your bed, Rod Meldrum? My mom was there. She was taking the picture. I just said that, right? But that's your girlfriend. <laughs> yes. All yes. right. It's a little, it's a yeah. tiny bit sketchy. No, I'm kidding. I'm just joking. No, it's, Rod, I have to ask Come you, on. Okay. Looking at this seventies <laughs> vibe, like it's, it's reminding me of my older sisters. Um, you need to tell us the top five to 10 vinyl LPs that you would have listened to on uh, your uh, okay. record player. Cause, cause I'm, I'm in the 60s, 70s. Well, I, I, I like that. I mean, there's a bunch, but I had like Eagles, you know, I had, uh, have you ever heard of Pablo Cruz? They came and did a concert up at Utah state one mm -hmm. time. And, and I was at that concert and just loved it. The, 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 the pianist and, the, and those guys were just absolutely amazing. The drummer loved that. Uh, I had a, I had carpenters. Yeah. America. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Um, I had REO Speedwagon. Uh, some there of that. Some of the rock and roll Boston was always a yeah. big deal there. Yeah. Journey. Yeah, one of my that's one of the favorite things for uh you know for for dancing and that kind of stuff you know dances that we'd have. Anyway, what about Rush? Um, never was into really Rush or or like Led Zeppelin or you know the really like ACDC. I kind of thought they were disgusting and gross. I thought that Gene Simmons was kind of a what about Foreigner weird guy? Loved Foreigner though. Yeah, liked Foreigner. Who Graham? To Toto. Toto. Yeah. Sticks. Yeah. Um, not 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 huge on Sticks, but yeah. Fleetwood Mac. Oh Fleetwood yeah, Mac? yeah. How about Beatles? Come on. Never a big Beatles fan. You know, they were just, just never old was. Stuff. That was yeah. just old stuff. Yeah, it was a little older, I think. Okay. Oh, but I got you... into a lot of the older stuff because of my older siblings. They would listen to. Did you stuff. say Led Zeppelin? But, but, no, no, you didn't like. I, I, I didn't like. Okay, you know, really quickly, I have to ask this: Scorpions or Leonard Skinner or you know some of those. You guys. didn't like. You did or didn't like Scorpions and Leonard Skinner? Um. I mean, this times. is one of my this is the most important part of this interview right right now. there so john gets angry yeah what this is where john gets angry when people don't like the same things that he likes so <laughs> you said you didn't like scorpions and leonard skinner or you uh, did well, like no scorpions? not a big fan of those guys i i, I actually even liked the uh, like like john denver my my older sister yeah. she True. she worked up at grand teton national park for a number of years and so most of our family vacations involved going up to teton national park to uh, do it and i, and I love she was a big john denver fan and she kind of got me into that uh whole genre so i love that you know, rocky james? mountain high and all that kind of stuff okay what about james taylor nope what about elton john uh i liked a couple of his songs okay yeah not, not a big deal really yeah. quickly so i remember a book called pop music and morality by lex de azevedo yeah the guy who wrote saturday's warrior did you have yeah. saturday's warrior lp i could probably sing you most of the songs of saturday's warrior <laughs> yes. yes you, you yes. love saturday's in warrior. fact that had a real impact on my life personally yeah when we went we went to uh we drove all the way from logan Whenever we got out of Logan, it was a big deal, right? Because, I mean, like I said, the first first time I was in a restaurant was eight, eight years old. But um, but we we came down to uh, the play, actually, Saturday's Warrior, down, I can't remember, it's probably like at West High or something in, in Salt Lake City. And uh, and it just had a profound effect. And then we had the, the what? How did the, it the affect tapes. you? Um, just kind of how, the, uh, how important family is. And uh, you know, in the pre-existence, and 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 then throughout, you know, how that affects everything throughout our lives and in the future. Yeah. And so that's kind of that was a big big deal for me. Anyway, so you're saying about Lex De Azevedo and his book? Yeah, Lex De Azevedo had that book, Pop Music and Morality. And I think there used to be, I w I was in Texas, so I didn't get this, but I hear there were people who'd go around the circuit, kind of the fireside circuit, and like talk about the evils of rock music. The evils of backmasking and yeah, Satan I remember, worship. I remember that about uh, one of the stick songs or something was uh, was they. I remember going to that kind of a fireside, and they played some like uh, I think it was "Come Sail Away" or something backwards, and it had some interesting stuff. But uh, but you know it's interesting because as a heard kid, "Come Sail Away," I, I, I wasn't even I wasn't even uh, listening. You know, as a kid, you don't. You don't listen to the music, and I guess you know. I, I listen to some of the songs now. You didn't pay attention. I listen to the, lyrics, to the so. lyrics and go, "Whoa, is yeah. that what that's talking about?" It's yeah. kind, of, kind of like I went to. In fact, this is going to come up here in, in the next part of the, the my story here. Okay, we'll get <laughs> like, to I, there. I, I took okay. this, this this particular girl. I'll leave her name out just for you know for anonym, anonymity. So that's why you can't see her face there. Okay. But anyway, really sweet gal. Um, and I took her to a concert down in Salt Lake City, and it was the uh, Doobie Brothers. Which I love. 
Doobie Brothers, you yeah. know, and uh, and and, and now long, you're long train why? running you're, and all that kind of stuff. You're embarrassed to admit that now. Why? No, no, I'm not. I don't, no, I'm not okay, embarrassed not to admit embarrassed. that. I'm just I, I, that the reason why I was embarrassed because I had no idea what the, even the 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 band's name came from. Jared, do you have any idea where the <laughs> band's the name came, came from, from? Or you maybe have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> I am so innocent. So, so somebody actually was interviewing the Doobie Brothers, and they said, "So where did you come up with this name, Doobie Brothers?" And they said, "Well, one day we were sitting around smoking a doobie, and I said, well, we should call ourselves the Doobie Brothers.' Like, yeah, that's what we should call ourselves." So and you yeah, said so, smoking. So, so smoking marijuana, marijuana was the how they got their name. I was like, "What?" Anyway, so <laughs> a little bit of a of a background about that so i think they have great i listened music. to a lot of the, the lyrics and i realized wow that's what they were talking about yeah but yeah. i loved it i loved the beat i loved the song i love you know the, the the chords and so forth there it was awesome but uh you know and now i just listened to nothing but uh motab is that true no that's not true <laughs> <laughs> anyway mm. okay but moving along <laughs> Well, so, this would have been a cultural revolutionary time where the Woodstock would have happened in the seventies, yeah. drug culture, free sex culture, yeah, you know, just stuff, Berkeley yeah. and Haight Ashbury and all that stuff. Yeah. And so the church, the brethren would have been really and, concerned and, and, about and long the, hair, hippies. Yeah. Did you remember oh, wait, wait, the culture well, we, war? We, we were on the verge of destruction because we knew that there was not going to be enough oil anymore in the world to supply we were all going to be within five years the, the prediction was that we were all going to be uh you know that you know the science was is that that uh the oil is going to run out and we're all going to be basically on the eve of destruction as one of the uh old songs on the verge of so destruction who could survive who could survive well, one of that, us will be alive yeah and then there was there was all this uh talk about uh you know oil shortages and so forth going on because there's not there's only so much oil in the world and and uh, we're going to run out of it soon and so we need to we need to do something that's kind of reminds me of things going on today but anyway but also the brethren would have been really concerned about sex drugs and rock and roll the, oh, absolutely. the, the church leaders yeah yeah right yeah oh absolutely and and that was obviously a part of me as well i mean you know that whole you know, the, uh, the, 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 although I think that they were pretty open, you know, I, I don't know of anybody that was coming down and saying, you know, okay, well, you can't, uh, you know, pass the sacrament if you listen to rock and roll, that never happened, you know, anything like that. But, you know, I, I think that we all have to make our own decisions. It's kind of like the, uh, the, the whole thing with, uh, with, you know, caffeine and Coke and so forth. You know, my, my parents were pretty strict when it came down to that. They're like, we don't drink caffeinated drinks. And I still, to this day, really don't. You know, I, have I ever had one? Yeah, I've had, you know, I've had a Mountain Dew or whatever here and there, and but I, I never developed a taste for it, and I don't really drink much soda at all. So we drink milk. I mean, we had we had horrible water. We couldn't afford soda, and so we drank milk. That's what our that's what our family did. We the probably cows had, were your water filter. Yeah, yeah, ten or ten <laughs> or fifteen uh, gallons a week we would go through our as a family. So uh, we that was our that was our main staple for drinking. So I won't ever ask you if you were ever lured into the temptations of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I'll, 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 I'll avoid asking. You <laughs> well, I had a girlfriend. I mean, obviously, there's a temptation there, right? Yeah. And uh, rock and roll was at a DB Brothers concert, and coming back. And that's, so this is where it actually ties into the story here. Okay. So we we went down to this uh, Doobie Brothers concert, and on the way back, my uh, my car was over overheating, kept overheating. I thought, what the heck is going on with this thing? And I learned a valuable lesson. And probably you already, maybe you already know this lesson, but uh, never assume that your gauges in your car are, are faulty. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I got out, I, I, I looked at it, everything seemed to be fine. It was, it was warm, but you know, I said, well, maybe the gauges messed up. Well, it, it happened that just the, uh, the thermostat had gotten stuck. And so it wasn't the, 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 the coolant wasn't going through the radiator and basically it was just overheating the engine big time. I didn't realize that going all the way back um, to uh, to Logan. I got up to the top of Sardine Canyon, if you know where that's at. The gnarly canyon. And all of a sudden, it just, just the, the engine just erupted out from underneath. So I had myself, and we it was a double date. So I had my friend uh, Kevin and his date was in the back, and, and I had myself and my date in the front. Anyway, and uh, so we cozed it down. Bottom line is that it, the the engine was fried. It uh, it it burned the valves of the engine to the point where it, it wouldn't even start or anything like that. So I'm in a situation where I just finished uh, this job with the mink and I got my last paycheck. Now I just blew the engine in my car and I'm like, 
what am I going to do for the summer? And I, and, and, and I hadn't been very valiant as far as paying tithing. Okay. So this is, this is where kind of my, my thoughts about tithing come into play. And I hadn't been paying tithing for a while. So basically I owed as much in tithing as I was getting from the check. And I had enough to either pay for the, you know, to redo the heads of my car or the valve, get a valve job on my car or to, um, to uh, pay tithing. And my mom, her words came into my mind again, said, now, if you do what the Lord wants you to do, you'll be blessed. And if you don't, then you have no promise, right? So I decided to go to, uh, to do this. So I, I have this slide in here. Sometimes good things fall apart so that better things can fall together. And that's become kind of a bit of a mantra in my life, I think, um, as, I, as I look through and as, you, as, we, as we talk about some of these things. And the point basically is, is that I, I was at this, this low point in my, this low ebb in my life. I mean, I'd had no money, um, had this girlfriend and so forth, but I couldn't get my car fixed. I had no wheels. You know, my freedom was taken away. <laughs> you know, you have a, how you feel when you don't have a car, right? Anyway, and so, uh, and so I, I had to make a, a, a pretty big choice. I had to make a decision. And I remember I, uh, it was a Sunday afternoon. I, I uh, took the, I, my mom said, if you do what the Lord tells you, you know, you'll be blessed. So I went to the, uh, the bishop's home back then. You could go to their home. And I came up to our, our, our bishop's place and I, and I had this, uh, this stack of money in my hand basically. And, and I rang on the doorbell and he came and says, Hey, Rod, uh, what's going on? And, and, uh, and I said, um, I just kind of had, had that money in my hand. I just kind of shoved it out to him and said, here. <laughs> and he says, uh, what's that? He says, well, it's my tithing. He says, well, you don't have to pay tithing. I said, uh, I don't. <laughs> My parents always had kind of taught me that you do, and it's just something you do, right? And uh, he says, no, come on in here. So he sat me down and basically explained. He says, you know, you know, tithing is really kind of a privilege to be able to do that. And, uh, and, if, and, and, and you know, you, you have been blessed to be in this wonderful family and, and we're in this ward and we're in this, this gospel and so forth. And uh, bottom line is, is that, uh, you know, this is a good thing and you'll be blessed for it. Well, I, I went home that that night. I now had no money to fix the, my car, and I had no job. And I'm like, okay. And then um, later on that evening, I got a phone call from my friend Kevin Glenn, and he said, "Rod, he says, what are you doing?" I says, "Oh, I'm sitting here with no job, and my car's broken, and and uh, and I and I'm, I'm I'm pretty miserable actually." He says, "Well, how fast can you come to Colorado?" I says, well, what's in Colorado? He says, listen, he says that the, the, the job I took for the summer and a bunch of other of our friends was over in, in Colorado doing coal exploration drilling. He says, um, they need some more helpers over here. And, um, and let me tell you about what, what the pay is. I said, okay. I'd been, I think I was making the seven fifty an hour at the time, which I think that at the time, I think, uh, five twenty five or something was the minimum wage. So I was making a little bit over minimum wage. I said, okay, well, how much do they pay? And he says, well, actually, it was, uh, I, I still remember this day, he says, it's $14 an hour, but then it's, um, so that's like twice what I was making. But then we worked 10 hour days and we worked 10 days straight and two days off. And bottom line, then there's a per diem per day and, and then there's a food allowance and a, and a housing thing. And bottom line, by the time I added it all up, it was like, it was a lot of money. And I'm like, whoa. I said, okay, I will be there. He said, well, how are you going to get here without, without uh, your car? I said, I'll take my dad's old truck. <laughs> so so I, uh, I, I had to trust God and believe in good things to come. And that's basically uh, one of the things that was a big, big factor for me. You know, this is a big, a, a big uh, thing. I had to trust that if I paid my tithing, it was going to work out okay. This is the Book Cliff Mountains in, uh, in uh, South, well, kind of, Western Colorado, essentially by uh, uh, Grand Junction, Colorado, and I started this job that involved helicopters. And you know, you're an 18 year old kid um, flying around in helicopters. That's cool, right? <laughs> you know. So, so basically, uh, it, it involved uh, this coal exploration drilling, and we we would uh, drill down into these mountains into a big coal seam that's underneath there. 
uh, enough coal to run pretty much all of the United States coal needs at that time for 200 years. It's about a 30 foot wide uh, or thick uh, seam of coal that runs down through these mountains there. And they, and they need to get, they, 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 they drill down and take actual samples of the coal so they can see how pure it is and, you know, and all kinds of things about the coal. So when you, I, I, I watched a, a bit of some videos with you and when you talk about drilling and, and the mantle and geology, you actually have had some experience drilling and some, some well, I mean, geology yeah, th th this is, this is really, you know, uh, surface drilling. I mean, it's not deep, deep core drilling, like was done in you know, scientific boreholes and so forth, but, uh, but it's not nothing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, but, it, but it was funny. It was, it was kind of cool exposure to the whole drilling process and how it works. And in fact, uh, one, one of our main jobs as, a, as we were basically grunt laborers is, um, is to, to help set up the drilling derricks and, then uh, and, and, Hull in the the drilling muds and so forth. We'd have to dig pits to, for the for the stuff to come in, so it wouldn't contaminate the uh, the area and so forth. And then I'd pump all that stuff out. Anyway, this is a, a llama helicopter it's called a, it's a, the brand is a llama. It's, it's a really powerful helicopter that we used a lot to do that. And there's one particular time we'd have to have uh, water up there to be able to drill. So they had these big water tanks, and then they'd have these big like two two and a half inch thick steel braided hoses that would uh, connect on there. And we'd have to have water with water trucks down at the bottom of the canyon. They'd put water in tanks with great big pumps. They would pump the water up to the drill sites up on the mountain. And so we had, one of our jobs was to lay these big water lines. And so we would start, we'd hook it up to the tank up at the top and we'd kind of wind it down through the trees. Um, and one particular time we got down to these points where they were going off of these cliffs. And uh, so we're up there, we had uh, you know, backpacks on for the day working and, uh, and we'd be taking this water line down. Well, we got to this one particular cliff. We couldn't look over the edge of it. We threw the, the water line off the, off the edge of it. And long story short is that uh, I started crawling down and got down to the bottom of the hose. They have about 200 foot sections of hose on top of about a 50 foot leader. that They would bring these pieces of hose in with the helicopters. And I got down to the bottom of the hose and I was literally hanging off the bottom of the hose and it was about 25 or 30 feet more till you got down to the, to the jagged rocks below. Mm. I realized I was in trouble because I'd already come down off the, off the cliff about 150 feet. And I, there's no way I could have the arm strength to pull myself and all of our tools and everything up there. So I got on the radio and said, Hey, I need some help here. So a helicopter, they brought in another helicopter with another piece of hose. And they had to swing it out. They couldn't get close enough to the cliff. So had <laughs> Here's a there's a, a shot of kind of what, what we're talking about here. This isn't actually from the from my work. This is a different thing, but but you see that that then so this is uh, this is what happened is I, I I had to grab onto that hose. They swung it over to me. I had to grab onto that one while I'm hanging on to the bottom of the other hose there, hanging at the bottom of this canyon, and then reach over, jump onto this other hose, and then kind of swing it out of the canyon. So anyway, but. The whole point basically is this was a fun job for an 18 year old, you know, adventure seeking, thrill seeker scary. guy. That sounds scary and dangerous um, to me. Yeah, it's a good thing OSHA wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, so we, uh, but, but this was, I made enough money actually in the three and a half, four months that I worked there to actually pay for my entire mission. And I had saved some money before that, but that was really, um, so the, uh, the, the mink job basically had to fall apart so I could get this job which made a lot more money a lot faster so they could actually have some of these other things. So this is my actual car and my motorcycle and other stuff that I had prior to my mission. So to give those sweet things up to go on a, those sweet rides. You had to give well, those I had sweet, sweet rides. rides. I mean, I had sweet rides. I had, I had my girlfriend I had, and then when I got back from the summer, then what happened was, and this is, the, this is another interesting part of it. Um, by the way, so I've never had any issues with pain tithing ever since then. I've just, I just do it. You know, it's just, it's just, uh, one of those things that I just do automatically because of the experience I had literally the day of, then I get this call from my friend and so forth. You could say, well, that's coincidence, but, uh, I look at it differently, but, uh, anyway, I think it was a, a blessing anyway. So I get down to this point and, uh, have this girlfriend and, um, and everything's going on. I come back that fall and uh, my birthday is in February. So I was looking at, sometime in February, I was going to be heading off for my mission. Right. And, um, then I got a, an interesting side swipe. 
basically my the, the guy that owned the mink ranch came to me and said roddy says um we have had a, a banner year last year was great um you know we you you're, you're over the summer we've been using those other those other sheds that you did and so forth and we've expanded and so forth and so on and and the mink prices are way up and uh he says we're building a new house and uh and so we're going to be leaving the house that we're currently living in which was on the property and um you know you have to deal with that smell all the time but you know he said it was the smell of money you know <laughs> What was the smell like? Really, the, the, the mink smell. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, it's not pretty. You've been you've ever been by a mink? You you said you you kind of knew about some mink stuff, but my it, only reference for minks is Guys and Dolls, which is now ruined by the <laughs> ideas about mink farms. All I had is take back your mink, and I had this wonderful like striptease version of Guys and Dolls in my head until oh, I went into this go. mink farm yeah, business. Mink ranch, but no, it's ruined no, now. I mean, I've dark. been my cattle you know by like dairies and they smell off yeah they smell it worse and, and than pig farms it's not probably it's not as bad as a pig farm but it's uh it's probably about the same as as a dairy okay. dairy farm yeah but yeah when you grow up in a dairy farm you know it's just you used to it's it. just get used to it so that's where it is so anyway so so he came to me says roddy says I want, I want you to manage my ranch we're going to move into this other house and i want you to manage it and uh he says and just before you you know whatever i know i know you want to go on a mission but we got to have a manager for this ranch and, and we really like your work ethic and what you do and so forth. So, so we're, we're, we're willing to offer $60,000 a year. Whoa. And the house that is on the property is yours for free. Whoa. And I'm thinking, dang. That's yeah. kind of like when Lucifer takes Jesus to the top of whatever mountain and says, <laughs> all this can be yours if you abandon your mountain. Well, but, but yeah, but I mean, temptation, it, right? It was, it was, well, I mean, it was an offer. It was, a, it was just a straight up offer. And, uh, and I was like, whoa, so let's see. So I could marry this gal and I already have my, my car. I, I mean, I'd be making almost twice as much as my dad was making up at Utah state university working up there. And, um, and in fact, he was kind of like, well, you know, son, um, you know, it's but my mom was like, well, now remember if you do what the Lord wants you to do, then be blessed. And if you don't, then you have no promise. Man, man, I hate that. But um, but I still, I, I just always had wanted to go. It's just one of those things. And so I, I told him, I says, you know what? I, I, I appreciate the offer, but I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to go on a mission. So I went ahead and turned my papers, got my mission call to Milan, Italy. Thought, man, this is awesome. This is benissimo. You know, I would love to do that. And uh, so got in the MTC and, um, and this is where I um, had another, a uh, bit of a of a uh i don't know if you want to call it my conversion story but well that's what i would call it is that this is around 83 i'm guessing yeah yep okay. so i graduated in 81 from skyview and then uh this is the this is the, the beginning of 83 and um and so in the mtc and i and, uh, and i and i realized you know i'm kind of giving up a lot here yeah you know, I'm, I'm giving up a sixty thousand dollar a year job and back then sixty thousand dollars was something you know I mean, it was, I don't know whether it'd be the equivalent, maybe hundred grand now or something. I yeah. don't know. Something like that for a young snot nosed kid, you know, just barely out of high school with no, no college experience or anything. That was, that was pretty substantial. Yeah. And, um, that's kind of funny. Cause I, now, now I look at it and think I was thinking then what a sacrifice I'm making. And now I look at it back and go, what a blessing. Yeah. But anyway, so, uh, so I'm in the MTC and I decided, you know what? Um, I am not going to go serve a mission unless I know absolutely that the bookworm is true. At least that. And, uh, and so, it, up until then you weren't sure. Um, I, I mean, I'd read it several times with my family. I mean, I, I, I didn't have any reason to really doubt it per se, but it was, you know, it hadn't, it hadn't really, in other words, I, I was making a life decision. I knew I was making this life decision that I had to make, you know, and uh, this is going to be a big deal. Um, and so I just, I, I, I kind of, I hate to say this, but I kind of made a deal with the Lord. I said, you know what, I'm going to, I've been reading the book Mormon again for the, how many ever time. And, uh, and I, and I, I need to know, Lord, is this true or not? Bottom line. And uh, I said, if I don't have an answer by the time I get to the end of it, I'm going to go home. I'm going to marry this girl. I'm going to take that job. I'm going to basically live happily ever after there in Logan raising mink. 
And, uh, and so I remember, you know, a couple of weeks go by, I was in, in, in the NTC quite a while to, you know, learning the talent and so forth. So I was in there for several weeks. And I just remember one night my companion got into bed. I was getting down to the end. I had about, uh, about, uh, maybe 10, 15 chapters left in the, in the book. And I said, you know what, Lord, I, I still don't have an answer here. And I'm serious. I'm going home if, uh, if I don't know. And, uh, then my companion got into bed at night. He was, uh, he was sleeping. I was sitting there reading. I got down to some of the last parts in the book where it talks about how depraved the people had gotten, the Lamanites had gotten so wicked and they were, and they were describing how evil they had become and, and the, 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 uh, things that they were doing. He says, and that's, and if you think that Lamanites are bad, the Nephites are even worse. And he's explaining that. I'm just like, my heart just sinking like, you know, cow, how could people who have been so enlightened, if you will, have lived so long, you know, peaceably among each other to, you know, to some extent and, you know, with wars intermittent and so forth. But, uh, but the bottom line is that, uh, then I got to the, uh, the promise there in the, towards the end of the book of Mormon. And, um, I will just say that, uh, I had, um, an experience that has really shaped my, my attitudes in my life for the rest of my life. And I just say that uh, I, at that point, uh, I, I spent hours just wandering the halls, just filled with a uh, with a, a love, just just a pure love. It was it was really it was powerful. It was astounding to me. Um, it's a personal experience, you know. Obviously, people have different things. Some people have uh, talked about you know that, that testimonies coming like like the sun, you know, kind of slowly up in the morning you can barely perceive it and then it all of a sudden it kind of breaks over the mountains and whatever um some people it's like a flipping on a switch and for me i had although I'd, I'd been brought up that way basically this was this was a turning point and at that point um i knew um knew what that, that, that what i was reading was was true it was a it was a real history there was there, there was really people who were involved with this it was a historically accurate thing the book of mormon yeah the book of mormon and uh and if, and of course then all the things that flow from that you know you hear you know from when you're you know in seminary and so forth well if the book of mormon is true then joseph smith then blah 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 and so forth and so on right kind of goes down the line that's kind of the foundation that's the basis we, we of, have of half of our listeners and viewers aren't have never been mormon yeah, so just yeah. to fill in those dots yeah if the book of mormon is true joseph smith was yeah. called of god he saw god in jesus this is, do you want to fill in the blanks I'll, of that whole thing? That was, say, what you just for, said. For non Mormons, yeah. what, would, what would the other blanks be? Um, that God well, that, lives. That, 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 yeah, that God lives, that there's a, uh, that he has a, a, a prophet, there's, there, that he had a gospel that he established and then it was lost and then reestablished again. The, restor the restoration. restoration. Yeah. That kind of so, yeah, those kind of things. And Jesus, right? Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, that's one of the things that, has, that the Book of Mormon talks about is, is, um, the uh the, you know, the resurrected christ coming to the nephites here in america so that was one of the big things and then just the the yeah. church of jesus christ of latter-day yeah. saints what uh um, that the, 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 the the gospel the doctrines and so forth are 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 true the church um a lot of people have this tendency to think that the that the gospel and the church are the same and and uh they you know i, I make a little bit of a distinction just for my personal yeah, you know, there's the church and the the administrative aspect of that, um, things like missions and so forth, and uh, and things that go on. But then there's also then there's the gospel, the principles, the doctrines that are that are part of that. And so I, I I do distinguish them somewhat, but I think that generally speaking, they're pretty similar. But back there then, <laughs> and even now, the discourse in Mormonism is that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the one true church. Would, was that how you would have? That, that's what I was taught basically growing up. Yes, yeah. You and, would have you would have believed that back then, at least. Um, well, there there are there are doctrinal aspects of it that are unique to any other church. I think we'd all agree with that. I mean, probably our, our plan of salvation is something that's that's different than really anybody else's. You know, as far as that's concerned, I think you know. It's, I mean, a lot of the core beliefs, just things like honesty and integrity, and you know, and and uh, and those kinds of things are are things that. Pretty much, I'd say almost any almost any, you know, uh, church 
even even non-christian and so forth i'm not I'm not sure if satanists would believe that maybe i don't know don't know much about them but <laughs> so so uh my friends who belong yeah. to the church of satan actually say honesty is really important to them but also yeah. the church of satan is why'd you look at me <laughs> I noticed Kara's shoulders are out. She must be in tune with Satan. <laughs> Say it. Kara, do tell. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I, just to stick up for my Satanist friends. I'm not, I go. don't yeah. identify there as a Satanist. But. There we go. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> anyway, so but, but there's, there's, there's doctrinal things, you know, things like you know, the, the basics like baptism and, and uh, you know, conversion and, and uh, accepting Christ and so forth and so on. Those kinds because of there's that, that famous uh, Joseph Smith quote that, the Book of Mormon is the keystone of our religion. Yeah. So I'm sure you would have grown up with that idea yeah, that yeah. then everything would follow from that. So it was a, a great catalyst moment. Yeah, so I'm if sure. the Book of Mormon is not true, I mean, pretty much, it, I mean, kind of everything else crumbles. And if Joseph Smith um, was lying about it or if the Book of Mormon doesn't have any historical evidence. And uh, and so, have, so, so hopefully you can kind of see from my, from my experience there in the MTC, my my underlying my baseline is is that number one it's true okay but that doesn't mean that i just can turn a blind eye to everything you know i mean basically you still which is the reason why i do what i do because i like the physical part of it you know if if the if the uh if the if the gospel basically is true then basically we were a spirit you know i mean if our plan of salvation if that's accurate then in, in the pre-existence before this life, we were spirits and spirits don't die as we understand it. And we were living with our heavenly father, basically God. And uh, if that's the case, then we're going to live forever with God. That sounds like kind of a pretty good deal. You know, like, like, why can't we just say, hey, you know what, game over. Let's just stay here. This is great. We'll just stay right here. But according to the church's, uh, you know, the, the plan of salvation, we had to come to the earth for what? To get a physical body, right? Get those shoulders, you know, and <laughs> and and this lack of and, and guy with hair, you know, I mean, a guy with no hair in comparison. Anyway, you'll be resurrected to look like me. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully, <laughs> I hope. Well, I'm, I'm hopeful. Maybe, maybe I have Did hair you like say you. It was a good deal. Uh, but maybe I mean, not such a good. Maybe deal. I had really good okay. hair. My hair was so thin and wispy. It never, you know, it had no body. I mean. You know, Kara's hair's got some body. You know, it's, it's all it's me. Good. This is actually thinned, by the way. Just okay, there you go. It. There you go, and highlighted. So, anyway. yeah. Um, but anyway, so where were we at? <laughs> uh, church that, is true, this, or church at least true, the gospel's yeah. true. And the Book of Mormon's the salvation, right? Came salvation. here to get a body. Came here to get a body. Okay, so if that's one of the reasons why we had to come to the earth, then um, what's the point of that? What's so great about a body? I mean, basically, it just gets old. Your hair falls out. Hair grows out of weird places where it's not supposed to grow and, and stops growing where it's supposed to grow. And then we get diseased and we get old and we and we get sick and we die. Okay, so what's great about all that? Well, I don't know what's so great about all that, but I do know this, and that is that if our plan of salvation is correct, then we can become like our Heavenly Father is, right? That's kind of the, one of the other core things that make us different and unique from other religions that we can become like he is. Right. Um, so apparently um, God has a physical body and that's one of the things that, you know, that Joseph Smith and so forth. So if that's the case, um, maybe it's not enough just to have a spirit. Maybe you have to have a spirit and a body. And when the two get together, a spirit and body united, then that's when the scriptures call that a fullness of joy. Right. Okay. So that being the case, if that is how a fullness of joy, we can't have a fullness of joy because we can't become like our our heavenly father is. In other words, if I understand it right here, John, I don't think God would be God if he didn't have his physical physicalness, his body, his his you know, whatever you want to call that um, thing. At least in in the, the Mormon ideology and 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 understanding, that's that would be would that be accurate? I think. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. So, so there's something about the physical and the spiritual coming together. And that's one of the things that is really important to me because that kind of goes into the whole science thing because, you know, there's, you, you can, you can have theories all day long, but if you can't actually show it, replicate it, you know, have other people do experiments and, and verify and validate things, then, then basically it stays in the realm of, of, uh, of somebody's idea. But physical laws have to be things that can be 
seen, observed, replicated, and so forth, according to the scientific methods and so forth. So, so that just to kind of finish up here. Can, wait, um, can I can I just yeah. ask you about one thing? Yeah. So, I don't know how much you've read about kind of early 20th century Mormonism, but there was a time where scientists were kind of elevated in the church as being really important. So, like Woodstow, Talmage, Iring, not Henry Iring, but yeah. his dad or grandpa, whoever it was, yeah. and like even B. H. Roberts. Sure. There were there. You well, know, Talmadge was early, a geologist, and uh, you know a lot yeah. of these guys were yeah. So early to midnight twenty, early to mid twentieth century Mormonism, yeah. there was a real strong pro science uh, strain within the top leadership of the yeah. church. Then Joseph Fielding Smith came out and, like and basically opposed and so those scientists, and especially was concerned about well challenges to the Book of Mormon historicity. B. H. Roberts specifically, but then also the the emerging oh. beliefs around Darwin Darwinism and evolution, yep. and basically there were battles between Joseph Fielding Smith Mormonism and yeah. There's a lot going on in the background and, that people didn't know. Yeah, and then <laughs> and then eventually yeah. the scientists died off. Joseph Fielding Smith outlived them, and then he built into Mormon correlation or Mormon curriculum a real kind of anti science mentality. And so if you look at the book's Doctrines of Salvation, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, if you look at Bruce R. McConkie's Mormon Doctrine, and then Boyd K. Packer kind of became the successor there, you'll see a real, you, you and I would have grown up in a very, I believe, anti-science church in this one way. We would have been taught that the earth was 7,000 years old, that a global flood was literal, that Adam and Eve were the first humans, that there was no death before the fall, and that Darwin and evolution were were evil, and that they were principles of of mankind that 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 were causing people to lose their faith. Now, Carrie, you're raising your. Hand. I just wanted to ask yeah. when you say when we were raised in a very anti science. What do you mean by anti science? What do you can you define like just not mainstream? Like, what do you mean by anti science? Well, by by the 70s and 80s, Darwin, you know, evolution, organic evolution, you know, would have been accepted by mainstream science as as a valid yeah. explanation for the evolution of human life, but also that the earth was billions of years old. Carl Sagan would have been raging by this point yeah. that that humans had been around for hundreds of thousands of years, if not, you know, yeah, longer man and, and that that yeah, um yeah. that uh there was no global flood, that Adam and Eve were not, not the first humans, that would have been the accepted scientific consensus by by the 60s 1960s and 70s yeah. but but joseph fielding smith bruce R. mcconkey mormon doctrine and ces curriculum would have all been condemning that consensus condemning the consensus okay yeah. all right i just kind of wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page yeah. what what kind of era you're talking about yeah so yeah. so all i'm saying is yeah. you would have grown up in the same church that i did where in seminary it's like evolution's bad scientists be skeptical of them, the the wisdom of man, the pride of men. Like I'm just saying, that, like, that's probably where I'd make maybe a little bit of a distinction between it. I don't know it was anti-science as much as it was anti. Um, well, let's just let's just kind of put it this way, and this is this is going to be a core thing that we're going to be probably talking about throughout the uh, throughout these uh, these interviews here, um, and that is that, uh, and this is kind of my position, just for whatever that's worth. That is that if there are discrepancies between um, what we have from the scriptures and the prophets and, uh, and the teachings there and what science is saying and what, and what they teach and what they're talking about, if there's discrepancies, uh, I, I do believe, and I know that this is something that's going to come across maybe to some people a little bit uh, difficult, but uh, I do believe that there's actually truth. There is a truth out there. Yeah, you know, we have. If, if somebody sees a car accident, and the police officer goes over and he talks to three different people, and they all saw exactly the same thing, but each one of them saw it from their different lenses, their different perspectives, and so they get kind of three different reports. They may all come to the same overall conclusion, but but everybody has their way of looking at things, right? Well, my way of looking at things basically is this, and it is if if there's a discrepancy between what we are, are being told from science and what we understand from true religion. In other words, if it's true science and true religion, I don't see how there's any possibility how they can not be fully compatible with each other. 
In other words, if, if, the, if the science part of it's true and the religion part of it's true, then they should be fully compatible because there is only one truth really out there. But that way, what we've had in the past is we've had semi-true religions going up against partially true science, and they're at, they're at loggerheads with each other. In fact, there's been really, to a large extent, there's even been animosity between the two. I mean, you look at you know you look at Copernicus and and uh, and Kepler and all these different people. I mean, there was there was a there was a state-run church that was attacking them as scientists because what they were seeing, what they were looking out into the heavens and seeing didn't match up with what the interpretation of the, of the scriptures of the, of the, of the, you know, the, the church, basically the state run church, um, they, they didn't match up. And so they were persecuted. So actually in, in a lot of ways, the persecution has gone on both sides. <laughs> you know, there was persecution from, you know, if you go back historically, there was persecution from the, uh, from the you know the the, the Church of England and, and and the Roman Catholic Church to persecute those who contested the um, the beliefs and thoughts of of things that that uh, like for example the the nature of God I mean if you take a look at that that's really interesting the whole you know the whole uh, Council of Nicene you know they had a whole bunch of guys get together uh, philosophizing about uh, the nature of God they come up with a particular uh, they all agree to what God is and who he is and what his attributes are. And then they kind of almost like take a vote on it and then they say, okay, well, that's what, that's this, this is now God. <laughs> so everybody just has to agree. Okay. That's, this is now God. He's, he's everywhere and he's nowhere and he can dwell in your heart, but he fills the entire universe and all these different kind of, you know, conflicting things. And it created a tremendous amount of confusion. Yeah. And then if it's okay, let me just restate yeah. what I heard you say is yeah. that you believe there's a single truth yeah. and that if, um, and that if science is making some assertions that conflict with, with religious interpretations that we, we've got to figure it out because there's a truth. And if, but, but I, but I guess, and this is the way I would ask or summarize what I've heard there is a degree to which if you've had your spiritual confirmation that the Book of Mormon is true and that this is, you know, God's church on the earth, and then science comes out with assertions or consensus that conflicts with our interpretations of the Bible and the Book of Mormon and the way that they try to describe the natural universe, yeah. you are going to say science must have some things wrong because they're conflicting with how I understand right. the scriptures. Well, one or the other of them has to be wrong. Right. Now, it is possible that they're both wrong. <laughs> okay, you know? Of course. Yeah, you know, I mean, that, that is one of the other possibilities, that both science and religion are wrong. But let's assuming that one of them is right and the other one is, you know. You assuming know, there's one truth. Assuming there's one truth, and let's just assume for a second that, uh, that if, if, if the religion has it right, then science is wrong. If science has it right, then the religion is wrong. But when you try to reconcile both of them together, which is what, I, unfortunately, this is what I, I feel, and this is my, my overall you know, view of, of uh, apologetics, even within the church, is that um, a lot of the, the players in the apologetics community have kind of a one foot in both camps. So it's like they're going to, you know, they, 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 they want to accept the, the, uh, the, the scientific research and information and, and consensus, but they also want to still be part of the church and the gospel and, and those kind of things. So they, so they're trying to reconcile the two. And honestly, sometimes it works and sometimes it just does not work. There's some things that you just can't reconcile. And I guess the thing that I just want to lay down is like, I remember Carrie Molstein one time, a, a BYU book of Abraham apologist saying, admitting, we, we start with the assumption that the Book of Mormon, the Book of Abraham, this is the true church, and that the leaders are inspired. We start with that assumption. Any information we get, we try to fit within that paradigm. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and we, yeah. yeah. And if there's ever going to be a conflict between what science is saying and your understanding of the gospel, you're going you're gonna to have to just keep working out the science part because, because when push comes to shove, you're going to pick 
the scriptural interpretations <laughs> yeah. over a scientific interpretation. And that's, yeah. I'm actually asking you a question because yes, it's true. There's yeah. one, let's just say we all agree there's one truth and that religion and science are both imperfect, but, but there is, I would ask you, isn't there, and this is the mindset I was raised in. So I'm, I'm relating to you. Yeah. The way I was raised is when push comes to shove, if science is saying things that conflict with what the prophets have said and, and what the scriptures say, you're going to, you're going to rely on the religion more than you are the science. Is that fair to say? That you're going to prefer that, the religion that, that, to the that science. Is, that is pretty much a dead on analysis. And when it, when it comes down to it, I think if there's a conflict between the two, one of them has got to change. Now this is, this is, there's some caveats here because you know, do we understand the scriptures properly? I mean, are we, are we interpreting them correctly? You know, but the scriptures say what they say, and I'm, I'm pretty much a real, you know, a, a literalist when it comes down to these things. Um, and I think in the apologetics community within the church, I think that, that uh, some of them have done a real disservice because they've tried to reconcile things that are non-reconcilable. Um, like, for example, Adam and Eve and, and evolution. I mean, you know, so are, are, are those, you know, th 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 there's ways you can try to make them reconcile. I say, well, what happened was, is God actually used evolution in making everything else. But then when he got down to people, then he, then he put a soul in them and uh, Adam and Eve were the first two beings that had a soul. I understand trying to reconcile it that way. Unfortunately, that's not what the scriptures say. That's not what any of the scriptural accounts that we have in all three of the, the, the creation accounts. That's not what it says. It's not what it says in the temple ceremony and so forth, right? The endowment. Um, so in doing so, a lot of times they end up throwing basically both religion and science under the bus because science does not say that there was any direction from God. Right? So when you, so you're basically trying to put words in their mouth. They're saying there is no God basically, or, or, or they're agnostic about well, it. They're silent. About yeah, they're, yeah. So they're they're just silent about it and, and and say you know there there was no direction from any intelligent being basically that we know of that we know of, and um and so so they're not really following the science, so in that sense they're they're not being true to what the science is saying. Yeah. But on the other hand, they're not being true to what the 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 church has taught and that what the scriptures say. And and one of the things I think we that that I feel like that we try to do. With uh, with my organization and the firm foundation and so forth is to uh, is to put exclamation points behind the uh, you know as you've, you've heard that that you, talk when, about uh, instead of question it. marks put exclamation points right yeah. but science is all about questioning yeah it's it's about coming to different conclusions and and uh, and, and and talking about them and 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 showing forth evidences in support of your particular area. But this is one thing I've got to say, John, and I think it's, it's real important for everybody who's listening and that is that, uh, and I've told the, the people who I associate with or I, that I have around me, I've told them, I says, if I ever get to the point where I'm more interested in defending my position versus telling the truth, then I want you to call me out. Because once you start to defend your position, that's when... Um, Pride can enter in, and and you start to uh, be more interested in, in not being wrong than you are about what's the truth. So I think as long as we as we focus our efforts and our energy on finding out, okay, what is the truth here? Yeah. But the but the truth is not easy to find. Yeah. As you know. Yeah. Um, there's lots of different ideas about truth, and there's a lot of ideas about uh, can truth even be known? Yeah. I mean, if in the scientific realm. They don't even talk about truth anymore, right? right. Because there evidence. is no they talk absolute about evidence truth and interpretations of evidence, right? Right, yeah. right. So, but so just to summarize, and then I want to get right back to your story. Yeah, you would agree. You 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 are okay with the characterization that if your understanding of religion conflicts with the modern scientific consensus, you're going to have a bias towards favoring the religious interpretations. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, and I'm not I'm not trying to pull any punches. I mean, absolutely. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, but, that, but that means I also, I, I, I do question, um, um, we, in, in, in working with, uh, Dean Sessions, the universal model project, one of the things that we talked about quite a bit, that is that if, if God really is out there, 
Okay. And obviously we believe that he is. Um, then the, 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 there's, there, there are truths and trying to find those truths out. Sometimes God allows us to know things. And sometimes I think it's just not the right timing, just like the timing for all these different things in my life. You know, it's kind of like with, I was just coming here with GPS this morning, right? Well, in GPS, you put in your final destination, but uh, I didn't know exactly how I was going to get here this morning. But in the GPS, it gave me, okay, go, go to this point and then make a turn. That's all it gives me. I, I, I mean, I can, I can go through and, and it'll tell me more about it, but, it, but to not confuse the issue, it basically says, go to this point and then, have, and then trust me that I'm going to take you on the next point. So then right. we make this turn and then you make that turn and you make this turn and that turn. And pretty soon I'm pulling up in front of your place here. Right. And, uh, and I didn't know turn to turn to turn what yeah. was going to happen. I look at it, our lives are kind of like that. Maybe, maybe that's a good analogy. Kind of line up, line up on line, precept. Yeah, precept. You, you kind of have an end point in, in, in mind, but then how you get there may have detours and all kinds of different things. Right. But if you just have faith in the GPS, um, sometimes it's taking me on gravel roads and kind of weird places. You know how that goes. And it's like you know, recalculating, yeah. recalculating all the time. But, um, and it's the church. But, and kind if, you, of the but if you can hang in there with it, it will eventually get you there. So basically, that's kind of my feeling about the church. So you're saying the church and the gospel and the scriptures tell you where you're supposed to go, and you may it, the church and the gospel and the scriptures and the prophets may not always know all the details between. Well, I don't but know if all the details faith, between. Yeah, I don't know what God has in short in store for me, yeah. which is kind of the whole point of this thing with this uh, my with my presentation here. Yeah. People get in situations where um, they think it's hopeless. They think that it's a, it's there's 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 no way out of this situation, including losing their faith in the church. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But God always has a backup plan. I just love that. I mean, when the 116 pages were lost, God had a backup plan. We ended up with the with the the, the first books from the from the book of Nephi, which was the more the less secular record and the more spiritual record. So we ended up with something I think is probably better than what was originally there in 116 pages. Right. Um, but God has a backup plan for every single person. Yeah. And I love that part of it because um, we all make mistakes. We all do stupid things. We go to Doobie Brothers concerts and we let our cars, you know, blow up and, and so forth. But, you know, but God has a way out for everyone. So, yeah. if, if, so if nothing else, maybe that, that message right there, um, may help somebody who's watching this, this podcast, you know, hang in there. Don't give up. God has a plan for you. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and it may be so much better than you ever dreamed. I mean, I look at what I do now and I just almost have to pinch myself because, you know, I, I get to basically talk about things that I love and my deep core beliefs pretty much on a daily basis. I mean, how many people get to do that? You do. I agree with I agree with you. <laughs> Karen and I can, yeah. we can I agree would, with you on that. I would say in my reinterpreted secular version of what you just said that yeah. I agree with is sometimes it's like you're standing on a cliff and life can kind of kick you off the cliff, but then underneath that cliff is like the universe, like something else will come about that will yeah. like hold your hand that will that's still there to like rock you to sleep. It's or not some, completely falling Somebody else off. comes into your life or sure. circumstances change or, you know, so, yeah. so basically never give up. I mean, that's really kind of the, the message between that. Yeah. You know, the only other thing I just want to do, just kind of state in summary, well, two things actually. One is that you were raised in a, in a culture that did condemn, that either did condemn certain teachings about science, like evolution being listed as one of the seven deadly heresies. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's how you would have been raised. Yeah. And you would have been raised... Yeah with a very fundamentalist type of Mormonism championed by prophets, seers, and revelators that Adam and Eve were literal, yeah. that, that 7,000 year earth global flood was real. I mean, that kind of a, in that sense, an anti certain parts of science and a yeah. very pro more fundamentalist, yeah. a literalistic interpretation of scripture. Yeah. I, I think that probably, uh, I, I can't remember now who actually had the quote, but, uh, said we, we embrace all, truth scientific and so forth um 
but then it comes down to you know again the uh, the interpretation of the scriptures. Do, do we have that right? Number one and number two, yeah. um, is it okay to question science? And for a long time, you know, in, in fact, when I first started working with uh, Dean Sessions and Universal Model, um, I was really struggling with wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you mean science can be wrong? But all of us can point to. I mean, I could point to a, a thousand, course. a thousand different things where science once believed this, of course. and now we know it's that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so, so if you follow that course of, of 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 information, you have to realize that science is also evolving. Of course, it always evolves. It keeps moving forward, and and uh, and hopefully, it's moving towards certain things. But <laughs> I, I, I got to say, there, there there's there's one interesting aspect in the Book of Mormon. It's that it's this vision that Lehi has, and he has this, sees this great and spacious building, right? And there's all these people in this great and spacious building, and they were laughing and mocking at those who were partaking of the fruit, right? But the but the building is that it has an interesting little 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 description of the building itself. It says it was standing as it were in the air. Does that sound like a real building? I mean, how many buildings do you know of that stand in the air? In other words, it's 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 not even real. It's like a, it's like there's no foundation. It's no, there's no basis for it. It's just kind of there. Uh, I look at it kind of like a, a house of cards, basically. If if one foundational pillar upon which that that building has been built, if one of those things is not right, if it's wrong, or 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 if, or if several of those pillars are wrong, then what happens to the whole rest of the building? And you're likening that unto what? Um, to basically, uh, science to some, some aspects of science. Now there's, there's now one other, one other thing that we have to, that we make a, a distinction about when it comes down to science stuff. I know we don't want to get too much into science, but this is kind of at the 30,000 foot level still. Um, and that is that, um, but, but science basically, um, it's all about questioning, right? And, um, and the thought as far as the, the science is concerned versus religion is that the um, the consensus somehow makes truth? If ever if enough people agree, then it must be true. But we've but how many times in history have we seen? Yeah, I understand that. A lot of people agree on something, and then, and it turns out that it's not the case. I mean, it's kind of like the whole. I mean, as a latest example, maybe is uh, is the whole. You know, pandemic and the way we handled the pandemic and the masking and the mandates and all the other things that went along with that. I mean, now we're now we're seeing of uh, you know uh, all of masks really it may have helped. It probably did help in some ways, but it wasn't the cure all that people yeah. thought. And I and I I, yeah. I made sure to let you know that for me it would be a, a straw man to assert that, you know, to to think that it's a really noteworthy thing to say that science is flawed you know that people yeah. think science is perfect and people worship science or, or that science can't make mistakes science yeah. will science is a method of discerning truth yeah. and scientists would be the first to acknowledge yeah. that science can be flawed that science has made a lot of mistakes in the past yeah. and that it will make mistakes in the future it's nothing to be worshipped or to be viewed as absolutely true it's literally a way of understanding gathering knowledge and understanding and explaining what's around us it's, it's and, kind of a and, it's kind of a framework, really, to 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 of understanding. to explore the world around us and, but, and and the natural the natural world. Now, but, oh. but but also that that I mean, I think someone could easily take that dream, Lehi's dream, with the building in the air and no foundation. Yeah. They could say, well, well, once you really understand the Mormon Church and its truth claims and its history, that it's. That's, that's the that's thing that's another, lacking. It's another another the viewpoint. That, that's right. You know, it's another, yeah. another view. Yeah. But but I I was just wanting to establish yeah. that. You would have been raised that, that if if I were to oh, yeah. put a gun to your head when you were 25 <laughs> and said Darwin's teachings good for mankind or bad and you had to give one word what would you have said? Uh bad. Yeah. yeah. And if I would have said yeah. you know earth 7000 years or billion years old and you were 25 you would have said what? That I don't know yet. That I was only 25. Okay. But, but I now mean, I would probably say yeah. But, but well Thousands, we, 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 thousands, we, not billions, right? No, actually, um, our, our position is is that the materials that this Earth is made from is right. probably billions of years old. But that, but the formation of this particular right. orb, this particular planet, was somewhere around thirteen thousand years okay. ago. Thirteen thousand. Okay, 
Yeah. And that's just it. We, we grew up in a, in a, I, we grew up in a church that was very suspicious of science, critical of science yeah. and a very well, fundamentalist a, a biblical science. Yes. And, and a, yeah. and a, and a fundamentalist biblical interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the only other thing I just want to say and care, this is just, there's something that you have to respect about fundamentalist Mormons. There's a consistency and an integrity in fundamentalist Mormonism. And I don't mean polygamist. I mean, right. right. This, the, the Book of Mormon and the, and the, the Bible. Foundational teachings. If you read basically. the Bible yeah. and if you take it seriously, if you read the Book of Mormon and you take it seriously, there's not a lot of wiggle room for how you interpret the age of the earth and the literality of things yeah. like the Tower of Babel and Noah and a global flood and, you know, how things are and, and, and have been and will be. And, yeah. and there's also... Yeah. Little wiggle room for calling these men prophets, seers, and revelators from Joseph Smith until the present, including Russell M. Nelson. If the science is correct, calling them prophets, seers, and revelators, but then saying they got all that wrong and they, they, they didn't, they didn't understand where Palmyra was, and they didn't understand what Joseph didn't understand what he was doing with the Book (laughs) of Abraham. You know what I mean? Like you, there's a there's a level of integrity that I think fundamentalist Mormons have that I think apologists like Farms Maxwell Institute type apologists and even neo apologists of today like Bushman Givens and Mason and yeah. uh, and Fluman and others they yeah. lose integrity because they just start to massage words in ways that that lo- that make words lose all their meaning and in that sense I'm actually giving you and other more fundamentalist ultra orthodox mormons yeah. of tipping my hat because you're basically saying when they call themselves prophets, seers, and revelators, I, I, I believe it. Yeah. And when the scriptures say something, they say that. what they mean. Yeah. And, and that's, I, I guess I'm saying at least you have yeah. some, some consistency, some integrity on, on, on your side that, I appreciate that, that. that's respectable. I yeah. appreciate that. And don't you say Rob that like, if the book of Mormon happened, it had to have happened somewhere. So where did it happen? Yeah. So, uh, there's, if it's a real history, I mean, well, of course, this is kind of a, uh, a catch-22. Name me any other civilization in history that we know that actually existed that there's no that there's no evidence for their existence. Well, of course, if there if there was, <laughs> there wouldn't be any, right? But but we don't know of any history that doesn't have evidence to support its claims. So you kind of made it your life work to support those claims. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least look for them. Where, as as opposed yeah. to kind of John's point that there's um, other apologists, even the like modern church will not actually pin down where these things have happened. And well, there, they have actually, to be a little bit more progressive. There's actually somewhat of a it. movement within the kind of some of the more progressive areas of the church and apologetics where they basically are saying, you know, maybe Joseph Smith just made this stuff up. Maybe it's just a really inspired fiction and he was just kind of uh, making it up and uh, it didn't really happen anywhere. Um, I'm definitely not in that camp, but I know that that is a movement that's no, going on. Yeah, yeah. Spencer Fluman and Patrick Mason and and Givens and Bushman, they're all moving towards like Book of Abraham wasn't a translation. It was a revelation. And Book of Mormon, maybe it wasn't a historical document or maybe it's loosely historical, but it's more of a revelation, a spiritual right. thing, like not a, an actual uh, an historical inspired document. novel. Yeah, an inspired yeah. novel. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks yeah. for letting me establish that. I really appreciate it. Let's yeah. jump back to your story. Uh, cause, cause... <laughs> well, one of the other, one of the last things I was going to mention, and that is when it comes down to science, there's a lot of people who, who, um, uh, they, 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 they look at science as being, well, you know, science brought us cell phones and, and, and space, GPS, space, and space technology, and so forth. space travel. Yeah. But modern but, medicine, but what you just said was the important part that we, we, we differentiate between science which is the study of all these things and technology, which is the application, sure. basically arm of it. I mean, nobody can make a theoretical cell phone and sell it, right? Because it has to work. Yeah. yeah. When, when when you when you do the functions on the phone, if it doesn't work, you're gonna you know say, hey, you know, this is this is garbage. We, we don't. I'm not gonna pay for this. But yeah, and and in some fields of science, we get away with a lot of theoretical stuff that is not observable it's not repeatable it's, sure. you, you, there's no experiment you just have to kind of accept it on faith that this is how it is and so what we try to do is try to separate the the observations and the analysis of it from the interpretation of the you know, it's just like data and the the interpretation of the data 
the data doesn't lie, but like we all have heard before, the, the old saying about that, uh, that, that data doesn't lie, but or excuse me, that figures don't lie, but liars can figure. <laughs> okay, so so data can be manipulated in different ways to, sure. to create different outcomes totally. that are needed. Yeah. And that's one of the things that's also, it happens, and, and I'm, all of us are guilty of this, scientists are guilty of this, I'm guilty of this, everybody is. And that is that you, you look at everything through certain lenses and those lenses. And so in my particular case, I'm kind of, I guess you'd say, you know, more fundamentalist. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm you know, believe in kind of the, the core principles that were originally established and things. Um, and, and so when it comes down to the, um, you know, the, the acceptance of those things, um, yes, I have a bias. But I'm also looking for, okay, if it can't be reconciled and one of them is wrong, where are they wrong? You know, in, in nature, nature abhors a vacuum, right? I mean, you can't just say evolution's wrong, for example, and not replace it with something else because that's the best explanation that we have at this point in the scientific realm. Right. So, uh, so you have to replace it with something else. And that's what the universal model and, and, and my work with uh, Dean Sessions and, and a whole lot of other people that are involved with that project. That's one of the things I feel very blessed to have had that opportunity to actually question the very foundations of science. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So that's where I'm from. Okay. Okay. So let's, so let's back finish to the, your story. Back to the yeah, story. So, you're so going on a mission to Italy, right? So I go, I, I go on this mission to Italy. I'm finally happy. And, uh, life goes, uh, wait a sec. And my mom, thank, thank heaven for her. And she go, you know, if you do what you, if you do what you, uh, want, what, what the Lord wants you to do, you'll be blessed. Right. And so that's when I decided to go on a mission, trust God, believe in good things to come. And uh, there we go. That's me. Is that a me Fiat? Is that a Fiat? Fiat Cinquecento, eh? <laughs> we, could get, we could get seven elders into that little beast. Really? It's like, <laughs> like a clown car. Yeah, it does. It, it totally does. Um, yeah, it's a, it, it's, a, it's a Fiat 500. And they're all over the place that they were back in that time frame. But this is in Italy. And I, I mean, just some of the experiences is my first companion here. Um, of course, we are in Milan, Italy. And my, my, my first day, now you got to understand, I'm I'm a I'm a backwoods kid from from Young Ward, Utah. <laughs> Biggest city I've ever seen in my life is Salt Lake, probably. And I'm dumped into 11 million people there in Milan, Italy. I've never seen a city like this before. I mean, it's totally. I I feel like I'm yeah you know, I'm I'm a farm boy, right? Anyway, so it was quite a quite an uh, amazing thing. But I loved it. I just I loved it. I mean, I just you know had a great time with it. This is one of our districts there. So forth has the district leader there. And Where are you in that photo? Pictures. Top left? Yeah, I'm in the top left on with this the one. the shades, with the cool shades? Yeah, they have these cool the shades. shades. You could get these sunglasses for like really cheap over there. It's awesome. And, the, and, and this, this, I'm in the uh, the third one over from the left there in that shot there. That's in the in the, in the, the plaza, the piazza. And you the, had the hair. You had hair? Yeah, look at all the hair I had, man. It's like, <laughs> dang, totally. This is a couple of, uh, of uh, guys that we had this over for dinner. These guys were so poor that we had spaghetti with butter on it. That was all they could afford. Hmm. Um, but they were just amazing. This is my, uh, this is my, uh, my, I don't know if you want to call it claim to fame. This is, his name is Moroni, Moroni. <laughs> and he was my, um, he was a baptism. Now you got to understand that when I, when I left my mission, I felt pretty proud of myself because I doubled the mission average of baptisms, I had two. <laughs> so most missionaries would serve two years and get one baptism in two On years. an average, which means that for every every missionary who got two, somebody else was going home, like my dad yeah. did with with nothing, yeah, yeah. right? With no, so you no got baptisms. two baptisms, and Moroni was one of so your one, one, He was one of them, yep. He was and named Moroni how? He was just named, that was just, just his name, yeah. Moroni Francesco. Okay. Anyway. Maybe he was from the Camorra Islands. Yeah, probably it was from the Camorra Islands. No, 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 no. he wouldn't be from there. But it's not there. That was pretty good, though. You know, that's good. You've been studying our stuff here. All right, and then this is coming back from the mission. And more than just hair. And uh, and and guess what? What? No girlfriend. You got dear John. I got the big DJ. Yes. <laughs> yeah. About three, 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 three months before I was coming back, she met the. Uh, um, she was 
she started going out with the uh, actually the son of the of the assistant head coach at Utah State University. Yeah, not Stu, not Stu Morrill. No, uh, Pella. Okay. I don't know if you know, remember Pella. He was, no, I think he's the head coach know. after a while. But anyway, so it, it was his son. You got Dear John. Dear John. Friend. Yeah. But in the meantime, what I didn't know, because I was completely out of, you know, I was, I was serving a mission. I was kind of, you know, completely out of the, uh, the, the new circuit. But uh, during the time that I was on my mission and not managing the mink ranch, you know what happened? PETA. Uh, PETA happened. PETA happened. People for the ethical treatment of animals happened. Yes, yes. People for the... <laughs> People eating tasty animals. No, just kidding. Uh, people for the ethical treatment of animals. And uh, and they began to spray paint Hollywood stars and so forth. But if, if they were wearing mink or furs and, uh, and the, the inhumanity of the whole thing, they basically created a huge backlash against anybody who was wearing that stuff. And you were basically afraid to wear it. I mean, Kara, do you have mink? No, I wouldn't. Yeah, see, I would there you go. So they I, now they have all the fake furs and so forth samantha like would excommunicate you if you had that's right no hammered. i was a vegetarian most of my life so there you go till so. i married a red-blooded american and started eating meat now i'm <laughs> cursed forever but i had a good run there for a while i was a good uh like human rights and animal rights type person kind of thing yeah younger. anyway so it became suddenly absolutely you know i mean this is some of the things you know fur is dead go fur free print or animal prints not animal skins and so forth and by the time I got back from my mission, my friend had, um, I'm not sure if he actually declared bankruptcy, but basically his mink business was done. Mm. If I'd have taken the bait um, and taken the job, I'd have been married to this gal. I'd have been working at a mink ranch that basically was closing down or shutting down. And I would have never had the experiences that I had on my mission. So I'm kind of like, dang, man, that's pretty amazing. So how do you interpret that? So the way I interpret that is that, that uh, because I followed the path that I felt that God had for me to do, I was blessed. I wasn't in the middle of all that. I wasn't married to the wrong girl. You know, this is interesting. I like this, this quote here from Elder Bednar. He says, strong faith in the Savior, submissively accepting of his will and the timing of our lives, even if the outcome is not what we hope for or want it. So, I had to submit my will to his timing. And because of that, sometimes good things fall apart so better things can fall together. And guess what fell together? You found a better woman. I found you. the best woman for me out there. And that's my sweetheart, Tanya. Are you getting emotional? Um, no. Okay. I don't get emotional. That's I just, Tanya. I just cry like a baby when I need to. Okay, okay. just kidding. <laughs> so that's Tanya. So this is my sweetheart, Tanya. I'm um, so grateful that I didn't marry this other gal. Um, she's probably a sweet person. I have no idea. I haven't had any contact with her ever since that time. But uh, I do know that she's she has left the church. I know that. Um, and uh, and my wife, Tanya, as, is a, the absolute love of my life. And, uh, and she hasn't left the church. And she has not left the church. And, and we've <laughs> or been able you. to. Or, or me, which is equally. Not, <laughs> Two important, Kara, most important things. Just so you know. Kara left the church. Yeah. Yeah. I'm assuming that. Yeah. <laughs> Let the I mean, cat out I, of the I bag. I did not leave the church, by the way. I did not leave the church. <laughs> okay. 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 All right. I, I didn't. Okay. I'm just being silly. Okay. Yeah. Keep okay. going. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically, she didn't leave me or the church, and we have uh, four beautiful children. We have three of them are still living. And uh, so that's basically a little bit about uh, my, my thing. So when it comes down to it, my hope is basically when people – who are listening to this podcast, um, you know, if, if you're going through a hard time, if there's something about your life that you just feel like that just uh, you've been forsaken as you, as, as it might be as the case here, um, this is a, this is another quote it says, because the failure to restate reestablish the saints on their lands in Jackson County, Zion's camp was considered by some to be unsuccessful and profitable endeavor. I mean, they didn't, you know, you could, you could argue that they, that what they set out to do, they didn't do. And uh, they spent a lot of time, effort, and uh, and blisters and so forth, you know, in doing it. And uh, and and it kind of reminds me here. This is um, there was a brother in Kirtland. Uh, this, is Bednar, this, is Bednar writing. this is Bednar's writing. Yes, and uh, this is in the Enzyme in July 2017. He says there was a guy who came to the camp and met Brigham Young on his return from 
Missouri. And he asked him, he says, well, what did you gain on this useless journey to Missouri with Joseph Smith? And the answer came, all we went for, promptly replied Brigham Young, I would not exchange the experience I gained in that expedition for all the wealth of Geiger County. As individuals and families, we too will be testified or tested, sifted, and prepared as members of science camp. That's basically kind of my, my overall feeling. The scriptures and teachings of the brethren are replete with promises that if we follow him, that we'll you know, get that. So that, that's just the final slide here. Uh, if God is all you have, you have all you need. That's again, not kind of my, uh, there we go. So then we, that brings us to, uh, that's kind of my foundations, if you will. Um, and since that, that point, I've had opportunities to, uh, to explore lots of different things. I've had the opportunity to, to really study, um, a lot of the church history and things like that in some depth and specifically relating to Joseph Smith. And I know that that's one of your areas of expertise as well. No, I'm not. And, an uh, <laughs> uh, well, anyway, and, and, and so, uh, so that's, can, can I ask you, can I, yeah. can I yeah. ask a little bit more about your story? Sure. Okay. So you served yeah. a full two-year mission. Actually, I was called the two years and then I was in the MTC when they changed it to the 18 month. So you did the 18 month. Yeah. Okay. Which, which also that, that this is going to play into probably some of our future conversations a little bit. And that is differentiating between the church and the gospel. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll never forget. I uh, was in the MTCs called for a two year mission and, uh, and they, they called us in real early when um, I think it was on a Saturday morning, everybody in the MTC, all the missionaries were to come to a special thing at like six 30 in the morning or something like that. They had a big announcement to make, and so we were in the MTC, and they came in. They had um, a general authority that came out to the MTC, and he basically came and he said, um, "In in the next uh, in the next couple of hours, at the in the in the opening session of the conference, the general conference, um, you're going to hear um, that um, that mission time frames are going to be changed." And then, he, then they, they proceeded to, to give us the outline of it from two years to one, you know, one and a half years and so forth. I'll never forget there was a young man, one of the missionaries that was there. And after he kind of explained what the situation was going to be, he said, do we, does anybody have any questions? And this one uh, elder gets up and he says, um, so is this, is this um, something that's inspired is it, is this a, you know, a revelation from the Lord or, or is this inspired or, or what is this? And uh, or he says, or is this just a good idea? And I, I remember the, uh, the general authority kind of uh, railed on him a little bit and just said, you know, obviously this is, you know, this is, you know, inspired and so forth. But yet um, three years later, I think it was, they went back to the two years thing because it was a, I would consider that to be, you know, as a missionary serving in a, in a, in a foreign language, really that last six months of your mission, you're probably the most effective because you stop having to translate into Italian. You start just thinking in it. And so, uh, you lose so, some of so your six most year, effective months. So yeah. So six of your most effective months, you're, you're, you're not being able to do that. Yeah. So I think it was a good move that they went back to it. Was it a mistake? I mean, I don't know. You know, but it was an administrative idea. It wasn't a doctrinal thing. And so there's a lot of things that the church does that are administrative that may or may not, you know, they, they sure. test the water, see what happens, you know, and then if that doesn't work out well, then, you know, then we go back to, or we change it or do something else. But the core doctrines remain unchanged. And I think people have a tendency to, to uh, think that they're the same thing. And uh, my my good friend uh, and and partner in in truth and righteousness, Gerardo, he writes in the comments, you know, the question. So was it revelation? And and I guess that that does, and we don't we don't need to dig into this now, but it does invoke the question of like, how how do you know when the when the brethren are speaking inspired revelation, or if yeah. it's just their opinion, or if it's just wrong, or if yep. it's Satan's influence? We all have to kind of wrestle with that. I mean. Yeah. Those of us who are, you know, um, believe that they're prophets, we have to, we have to say, okay, um, was, okay, is this inspired? And that's one of the things I really love about our, our, our current prophet basically is that, uh, is that one of his, I think his, one of his mantras, if you will, or things that he says, you know what we, you, you should, and, and even Joseph Smith said this, you should never just accept what a prophet or any other person says at face value without checking the source of all truth, which is 
essentially the Holy Spirit. So, but the trick, the hard the part trick is, 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 how do you do that? You know, and and, and, yeah. and 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 what if you get something different? And yeah, and that all comes into the whole vaccine things and all kinds of stuff, which we can go into. If we, we will do we'll that. get into that later. <laughs> okay. um, but I mean that you you yeah. even said you even referenced earlier the Wendy Nelson kind of idea of put an exclamation point if the prophet says it. Yeah. I mean, it, the, sometimes the church and or believers want it both ways, where it's like they're prophets, they're inspired, they're men of God, but they I don't reveal like the this. truth. And if they make a mistake, then it's like, well, they're just men and, and you know, and yeah. they got it wrong and you have to use the spirit. And <laughs> you're admitting that it's messy. I, I don't think you're trying to claim yeah. that it's that when the brethren's mouths move. Okay, true or false? When the brethren's mouths are moving, they're speaking God's doctrine. True or false? False. Okay. Yeah. I, and, and, and it's kind of funny. I, I was reading an article. No, oh, I mean, a, a it can be ago. true. I, I would just for, for your sake. Right, right. I'm guessing you would say sometimes true, sometimes false. Well, right? I mean, I, I think if uh, if the prophet has a, uh, you know, goes to a, a, a McDonald's and has a Big Mac, that, that doesn't mean that all of us should be, you know, following suit and having a Big Mac at the same time but a brigham if so brigham every young, decision that they make is not necessarily but when they make important things i think that as a, as a prophet they have the right but also the responsibility to tell us when it's revelation and when it's just their right but sometimes not, but when brigham young yeah. says adam and god theory kind of stuff can you allow yeah. for the fact that prophets can actually get important things wrong sometimes yeah and in fact um joseph smith even said that he says you know Unless, unless a man is speaking as a mouthpiece from God, he's speaking as a man, and you have to somehow have a way to discern that truth. And uh, and so that's kind of my. Uh, oh, I, you know I mean, for me, that's that's another example of integrity because you're you are willing to stand up and say sometimes prophets, even when they claim their its revelation, they can sometimes get it wrong, I, and I, and that we have to rely ultimately if it's absolute reliance on things prophets say versus the witness of the Holy ghost, I'm guessing you're going to say at the end of the day, Holy ghost, personal revelation of Holy yeah. ghost might need to Trump when the prophet's speaking. Well, and that, and that's the, that's one of the, uh, I think one of the, the, the factors and I, I believe in a hierarchy of laws, for example, um, there's just like in the judicial system here in the United States, you have local laws like jaywalking and so forth. Then you have, there's county laws, there's city laws, there's state laws, and there's national laws. And each one kind of trumps the other. I mean, you know, so, so you could be, you know, uh, you could be busted for, for jaywalking or speeding at a certain level, but, uh, but ultimately, you know, the Supreme court's not going to hear your case, <laughs> but if the Supreme court does hear your case, they're, they 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 supersede all the other laws, and there's there's similar kinds of laws. For example, "Thou shalt not kill" or "Thou shalt not take," you know, uh, innocent blood, right? But yet here we have you know, examples Laban. of, uh, Nephi, of, of Laban. Nephi and Laban, you know, Laban, Captain Moroni, you know, yeah, and and so forth. And they, these people killed people. I mean, there's no doubt about that. So how do you justify that? Well. It's an understanding of, you know, in the Book of Mormon, it tells us the, the justification was it's better that one guy should perish than an entire nation should perish and dwindle in unbelief. Okay, well, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a higher law, if you will. So I, thought, I think a lot of times we get confused with, uh, with different laws, and I think one of the highest laws that, that, that the Lord has um, for us to do is to receive confirmation through the Spirit of the things that we are being told and taught. I, I, I read it. I, I kept smiling a couple of times here just a minute ago because I remember an article I read not too long ago. It says what well, the funny thing between Mormons and Catholics is is that uh, is that Catholics believe that the that the uh, that, that well they 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 teach that the Pope is infallible, but they all know that they're fallible. And Mormons believe that their prophets are infallible, even though the prophets themselves say that we're just man and and we're fallible. <laughs> so yeah. i think it's just kind of an interesting uh dichotomy so yeah, yeah. can i ask a follow-up question real quick yeah. do you mind john so you talked about like a hierarchy of laws is how we're supposed to understand god laws that sometimes they trump other ones and you need to understand that where do you like what's your evidence for where god said that that's where he wants you to follow them sometimes and follow them 
not so much other times? Do you have like a scripture uh, document um, that you can point to of why you follow it that way? Well, ba well basically, you just look at uh, different different uh, commandments and so forth, and then the exceptions to that. You know, like uh, there's no commandment thou shalt not lie. You know, it says thou shalt not bear false witness. But then we have, um, was it Ruth that basically, I mean, Abraham lied about his sister. <laughs> you know, his, God his told wife. Him, maybe right. God told him to. Right. So, so does that mean that, you know, so is lying the commandment or is it, you know, or, or when is it okay to lie, for example? You know, I mean, those are, those are things that everybody has to kind of wrestle with. Well, how do you square that with so, like, yeah. if God says, God is, God says, I am not a God of confusion. Yeah. So shouldn't he, shouldn't he put forward some more clear understandings of when you're allowed to break that law? Because it sounds like it's kind of like up to interpretation for whatever situation. And now we're living in 2022 yeah. and a lot of people will lie for the Lord and they'll say that I'm doing this because God would want me to, but there's not really, we have no, we have no way of interpreting what that, that God actually wants you to lie for the Lord. You know, it's really up to everyone's interpretation. So it just, it, it falls into this big mix of just a, a very confusing God that a lot of people have trouble following. So like when the church yeah. gives the 1890 manifesto saying they're stopping polygamy to the world and then they keep, or when Joseph Smith claims, for a while, continue when, to Joseph, yeah. when Joseph Smith tells right. the world, I'm not a polygamist and yet he is practicing plural marriage or when the church issues the 1890 manifesto saying they've ended, the polygamy should be done with and we should stop it. And then for another 15 years, they secretly keep doing it. You're, they're, you're saying God sometimes wants us, wants well, let's, us let's to just put deceive. it this way. Um, when, it, when it comes down to, uh, you know, God being, you know, not being a God of confusion, um, truth is actually pretty simple. But we complicate things because of our understanding. Um, on, on the other hand, even Christ, when he was with the, uh, when he was alive, um, it's interesting because usually over in the, um, in the old world where, when, when Christ was living, you had the Pharisees and Sadducees and so forth. And most of the time he taught in parables. Well, why not just teach straight up doctrine? Because sometimes the people are not ready to hear the straight up doctrine or they wouldn't, or, or they wouldn't accept it or they wouldn't understand it. And so using it through a parable gives them more of a, an understanding of, of, of kind of how that is that the, the, the usefulness or the purpose of that. Right. But it's interesting when he comes to the Nephites in the book of Mormon, how many parables did he teach the Nephites? None. He taught them just pure doctrine because I think they were, they were prepared to listen to and hear it. So I think that there is also, there's something to be said about uh, the message to the right, you know, the right message to the right recipients that makes sense and so, yeah, so, so I mean, some, sometimes people are just not ready to hear it or they don't or or you know i mean i'd like i look at for example polygamy i mean back in the back in that time frame um i mean practically every ancient civilization practiced polygamy in of some sort i mean you know whether it was actual marriage or just by you know concubines or whatever there's a lot of that going on um, and, and, but, uh, but when it comes down to, you know, Joseph Smith and, and that, um, is there a, a time and a place? I mean, you know, there's, in other words, I think God has a timing aspect as well as his, um, you know, so, so things that seem like they're a dichotomy may actually be just a, just a, a difference in the. The yeah. hierarchy of laws. Does that make sense? And of course, I, would, I think you would acknowledge yeah. if you think about like the book Under the Banner of Heaven by John Krakauer that talks about the Lafferty brothers, where they literally like stab a pregnant woman and kill her because they feel like the Holy Ghost told her to. Like you would acknowledge that this Holy Ghost uh, inspiration. It's not always rule, clear. It, it, well, that it can lead to some really dark and dishonest. Uh, well, uh, not, not, not if it's coming from. Well, just the, the fact right that, source, but, but there's lots of different spirits. There's a lot of different, uh, you know, there's, there's positive yeah. and negative energy. <laughs> you know, well, I don't want to do your bad. story. I'll just yeah, say that, yeah. that, um, once you start teaching people that their feelings are truth, yeah. then when they start paying really close attention to their feelings and their feelings tell them to do awful dark things, you've set yourself up for an epistemology that can have really dark consequences. Yeah. And I, I, I hear you saying, you acknowledge the messiness of all this. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're not claiming that it's clear and concise and neat. And it's it's, it's hard to know sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Is it is this coming from the Lord? Is this there? Is this just my idea? You know, I mean, it's 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 not easy to know. Um, however, I think that the that the scriptures and prophets do give us some guidelines. If it's going, if if there's something that's going directly against the teachings of the church in that sense, then then I have to question. Okay, so is this where's this coming from? You yeah. know, if, if, if I'm getting the impression that I need to, uh, you know, rip off a neighbor or whatever, or not be truthful or honest about certain things, um, where's that inspiration coming from? Because I do believe in, I don't know if you want to call it the dark side of the force, or <laughs> whatever, yeah. you know, there's, there's good and bad, there's evil and, and, uh, and, and, and righteousness and, uh, and they all exist. And so it, sometimes it's not easy to tell sure. what it is. Yeah. Makes sense. And so yeah. if we go to your narrative, the one and a half year mission change was back to from, yeah. from two years to one and a half. Probably back to looking two years. back, it probably wasn't a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but uh, so you're okay with profits making mistakes? Uh, yeah. Administrative mistakes, administrative. but not, but not doctrinal. So, mistakes, so, so se. Adam yeah. got there with Bruce, with uh, Brigham Young. Um, I think again, that's, that goes into a hierarchy situation where, and I, I, I haven't studied that extensively. Okay. Uh, I know that that's he talked he talked about that. I mean, I think kind of atonement. I think it kind of goes into atonement. into a lot of the different um, aspects as far as you know the nature of God and those kinds of questions. Okay, so you're still open to yeah blood atonement and Adam God theory as being legitimate God doctrines. Um, well, yeah. you're saying you haven't studied them. I, yeah, I, 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 would, I would have to probably say uh, no comment on that particular area because it's, it's, it's not an area of my expertise. Yeah, that's I fine. haven't really studied a lot. I mean, I've, I've, I've looked into it, some things, but you know, it's, it's kind of like, I, and, I, and I told you this before our, before our, our interview here, said, you know, everybody is expert in certain things and ignorant in everything else. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I have to, I'm going to have to claim ignorant on sure. that part. That's fine. But I also do have faith that, we, you know, eventually we'll probably know yeah. what the deal was. Why, why did he say that? Sure. Was he talking as a man? Was he talking as a prophet? Um, you know, yeah. those are all open questions to me. Yes. Do you have a quick thing here? Um, we could get into this later. I don't want to derail the story too much, but I was just, I always like to lock down on like kind of definitions of what we're talking about and what the difference between a doctrine and a policy might be. Cause you talked about administrative decisions versus yeah. unchanging doctrines maybe. And I do so want can, to ask that in the next yeah, we'll, we Well, I'm sure we'll probably get into that, but I just want to make sure that we, we know that when we eventually do have this discussion, we will for sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So back to, can I ask some questions just about your story? Yeah. Uh, before we stop this part one and go to a part Absolutely. two. Okay. Yep. So uh, what about, what, what events in your life led you to become kind of the Heartlander guy? So you get off your mission and, and th I'm sure there's, there's decades that you could talk about, but just as in an abbreviated way, take us through your chrono chronological timeline of how you end up Kind of as the Heartland Book of Mormon Heartland guy, you know. <laughs> All right, well, so you well, get home from yeah. your mission, and then get home what? from your mission. Uh, I, I, I get uh, started at uh, Utah State University. I'm uh, studying there and uh, doing business administration. I kind of figured that uh, I, I, I like talking to people. I, I enjoyed that. I never really got to talk to many people outside of my family and our ward, kind of thing. You know, some high school friends and so forth there, but but not just open to the public, you know, kind of thing. And I realized how much I just enjoy people. I just, I love people. I think, you know, people are interesting and, and I like talking to them and I'm kind of a talker as you can tell. Anyway, so, um, so I started going to Utah state, um, um, during the summers I would, I would quite often, I would do, um, one, one summer, the first summer I got back, I was, I went to, uh, work for a company called Eagle systems international and, uh, they had these blue book of Mormon uh, illustrated uh, Book of Mormon sets and so forth. And uh, they had all kinds of church history and so forth. And uh, that's something that interests me. And I thought, hey, you know what? I would like to bless people's lives with this information, you know, be able to, to help them in their teaching their kids and so forth. So I uh, went and uh, did that for a year and, and, and excelled in that. And then came back the next year with a, with a team of people and uh, went to Colorado. Went, the first year was down in Arizona and went to Colorado after that. And it kind of miserably fell apart and everything, <laughs> the wheels came off. But 
I, I needed to be there in Colorado for a real important reason. Which was? I had to meet Tanya. Okay, that's where you met her. <laughs> so okay. even though the business aspect of it all kind of fell apart, um, one of the greatest blessings in my life was to meet her the day before I was heading back for for home, um, kind of licking my wounds after a pretty hard summer, and uh, and met this this sweet gal and and uh, so then we started back and forth. She came over for for Thanksgiving, and I went over for Christmas and so forth, and uh, realized it was costing us more in phone bills. This is back in the day when actually phone bills they actually charge you by the minute. Remember yeah. that day yep. statements? Yeah, exactly. Yep. So, yeah. so, uh, so it was, co- it was costing like four or five hundred dollars a month just for phone bills. I said, you know what? We can actually back in those days you could get a you know you could get an apartment for practically that. So I said, yeah, it's going to be almost cheaper for us if we if we uh, decide that this is the right thing and uh she kind of knew it right away and it took me a little bit longer to figure it out kind of a little more hard-headed that way but anyway so uh so then we we ended up uh getting married there in logan temple and uh and i moved down to arizona realized that uh, i got about a year and a half almost two years of of uh, of school in at utah state before i before I, I took a position with Weathershield Windows, with Weathershield Manufacturing, uh, as a as a as a and, rep for them for the state of Arizona. And, and so, for the sake of time, you don't have to mention all the major things. Yeah, mention the ones that sort of tie right, into. Right. Well, that, this ties into okay, it because okay, a lot of okay. people basically are going, "Well, where's your credentials?" You know, I mean, you know, we're not going to listen to people who don't have you know PhD or master's degrees or something like that. Yeah in their particular realm that they're 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 speaking in and uh, and so that's that's presented a bit of a challenge for me because i don't have any credentials i mean realistically um i don't have even a a a degree at any university but i've always had a very you know uh curious mind i mean i i love learning i just don't like learning things that i that i feel are not correct and not true um there's a lot of that that goes on um at the university level you're taught a lot of a lot of things that are philosophical and so forth and I, i'm kind of more of a realist i guess so anyway so i i, I decided i was going to work I, I would eventually I'd come back and i'd finish my degree and then then life happened and we had children and and uh, so then anyway that 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 kind of plays into it so over the course of time, I worked with uh, window and door companies for a while as an architect rep for Anderson Windows, and then uh, and then I started my own business, and uh, and a lot of I, I will have to say this though that a lot of the guidance that I've had from my life or in in my life has resulted from a patriarchal blessing that I had when I was uh, seventeen years old that uh, gives some outline of things in my life, and uh, so that has been that has played another major role for me. What is your patriarchal um, blessing? What are the main points of your patriarchal blessing that well, really have influenced? Well, probably you? one of the most interesting things is the word truth is in my patriarchal blessing like 13 times. It's more than any other word other than like is and the and a. Uh. Um, there's you know, that I would be free to pursue truth, that I would recognize truth, that I would be able to uh to to um be drawn to other people who are seeking truth. And it's and it's in there like 13 different times. And there's 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 a lot of other things, obviously, in patriarchal blessing, you know know share with as you know but uh but basically um had this uh you know this this feeling that that somehow truth was going to be a, an important part of my life's mission yeah. can i ask a follow-up though yeah and i don't mean this disrespectfully at all yeah. so when well, you mentioned that people are you know ask often where are your credentials so if truth was so important was it ever on the table for you to go back to school so that the oh, truth yeah. that you were going to be learning and teaching other people would have some backed credentials behind it. So the truth it, would kind well, of stand on its own some more. Well, well honestly, it would be a lot easier. Sure. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's kind of my if question. If I had the credentials and say, well, I'm a PhD and so just take my word for it. But it, but what, it, what it's done for me though, Kara, is that it's made me. But did you consider not rely? Well, well, yeah, I, in fact, it's still on the table that at some point, you know, if something in my life calms down, or if I get hit, by a bus and and can just only go to school i don't know online or something <laughs> i don't know um that uh that i would go back and finish that finish that degree and probably you know maybe even look at getting uh, something else but i mean higher degree like a phd or you know master's or whatever but um 
but oh, what was I going to? My point was is that uh, I've had to, because I don't have those credentials, I can't just say, "Well, take my word for it," because I'm Rod Meldrum and I have a PhD, and you should just believe me because of that. I've had to back up what I'm saying with actual, you know, facts or information or research from others that is credentialed. I think, that makes sense? Yeah, I think the the natural argument to that, though, would be that if you did have a PhD, you would have learned a certain method of discovery that wherein your yeah. current level of what you call facts, you would probably not have that same lane that you'd be staying in if you did go through a credential program. I think it'd be the argument. Yeah, there. yeah there, there's definitely a possibility of that because I think that a lot of um, education has that, you know, there's, there's, I think, too much of this that uh, in education today is the teaching of what to think instead of how to think. And so I think there's a lot of just rote memorization and things that goes on and, and just accept us because this is the current. Well, what about in like theory. higher academics? Like I, I could understand yeah. that in maybe like a schooling setting up until 12th grade. But I think once yeah. you get into higher academia, you're encouraged to go out and write thesis, like write and perform experiments and yeah. make your theory stand on their own. Yeah, and 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 when it comes down to the educational um, areas that we're that we're talking about specific, specifically with higher education, I think that there is a lot of um, a a a, uh, a tendency towards uh, specifically with the like the Department of Education and so forth, and 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 I can only speak. On the kind of towards the scientific aspect of this and not education in general um but in, in the scientific realm there's uh there's you know, in, in higher education you have to go out and you have to basically create money for the university you have to get grants you have to write um, grant papers and so forth you have to go to the sources of the funding of that money to, in order to get funding so as an example in the scientific realm uh, there's three primary uh, scientific organizations that 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 uh, get with Congress and so forth. They lobby Congress, and they get the money that is that is uh, generated for scientific research. For example, is funneled through Congress through one of these three scientific organizations. Is that there's the NAS, the National Academy of Sciences, the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the NSF. The, uh, I lovingly call them the non non-sufficient funds. That was the National Science Foundation. Okay, those those three organizations receive the funding from Congress, and then they get to decide who they're going to give grants to for scientific research. Interestingly enough, by their own uh, internal surveys, they are about ninety seven percent atheist. They 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 self identify as atheists, basically uh, the upper echelons of those three organizations. So if you think that they're going to get funding. For scientific research that doesn't go along with their current understandings and current thoughts, um, then you're fooling yourself because you're not going to get funding for things that would directly go against and contradict what they want to have taught in the schools. And I, that makes this, sense? Is, this is a, this is a, we could get, we could get into this for a while. Yeah. So yeah, I, yeah. I don't this want to a, get right down, yeah. but, but it's a fair question. Like I, I, yeah. I did spend six years, I spent nine years getting two masters and a PhD and I can say that a graduate degree brings you into an understanding of the scientific method of research and of the scientific community and the standards of excellence uh, sure. that is really useful and that makes you, that gives you um, a set of sensibilities and allegiances uh, and, a, and a knowledge base that really helps inform positions you take or assertions you make or claims yeah. you try and develop later on. And Kara, I just think you're saying, man, Rodney, wouldn't, wouldn't you have really benefited from some masters or PhD level work to inform and shape uh, the theories that you've ended up yeah. kind of. A, yeah. I just trying to tie it, to tie it back to if your patriarchal blessing had truth so much in it, why did you go to grad school? Why did I do that? Yeah, like, <laughs> and I think you're going to say well, your life got too busy. Well, well, yeah. and, and, and well, there's that aspect, but I really think that um, is higher education where all truth is 
manifest. And no, again, that's kind of a straw man because no one's going to yeah. say that yeah. higher education has all truth. Right. But but it does play into the overall question, which is basically, why didn't I go and, and do that? Really, the first answer is that, you know, life got busy. But the second answer is, is that if if higher education isn't, if, if, a, if, if much of what higher education is actually teaching is not founded or based on observation and, and so forth, but based rather on philosophy and, and uh, theory and so forth. Um, and that's then, your, and you can spend an awful lot of time learning about things that are, are simply, you know, not correct. So is that, is that kind of your base that view? Sense? Yeah. I have a follow-up question though. But is that basic? So I just want to establish that your base yeah. view is that what's taught in master's level and PhD level, maybe the majority of what's taught in master's or PhD level education is theoretical and not based in no, practical. No, okay. it, 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 there's, a, there's a few fields that probably are more susceptible to that. Okay. Things that you can't actually do. I mean, when it comes back to, for example, engineering, mathematics, um, you know, I mean, things that's benign as like English or or history or those kinds of things. I mean, history is obviously fraught with all kinds of different <laughs> ideas, but, um, but there's, there's some of them that are more, um, more susceptible to theoretical. And the, what are input. those fields that you think are more susceptible to? Um, well, you would, you wouldn't, that are relevant think, you wouldn't to think so, but for example, rocks. So geology, geology. you would say yeah. geology is more theoretical. There's, there's a lot of things that are theoretical in geology. There's, there's aspects. I don't want to dig into that. Yeah, just yeah. give the high level. Yeah. So geology, I'm going to, going to guess you're going to say physics, um, um, theoretical no, physics. A lot, most, a lot of physics is based on real observation okay. and right. so forth. So yeah, geology. So, yeah. Um. What about biological sciences? Yeah, biological science is probably the one that I, I would have the most um, problems with. difficulty with. Because um, of evolution. Yeah, okay. primarily because Kara, of evolution. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, but we can get into that. But, that, that, that. but geology is where everything else geology is really kind of the foundation upon which all the other natural sciences are based. And you're saying you view bi biological and, sciences and, and geological sciences. Well, as well, being for example, biology, theoretical. Bi biology can't tell us the ages of the earth. For example, that comes from geology, but if the ages are different than what geology says, then that, that obviously going to affect evolution. Well, actually, if you don't have millions of years, then that. I think biologists that. would say that DNA can actually do a really good job of helping us understand the yeah. age of yeah. human life. Um, just like uh what's the name crick the, I, don't, um, I don't know i don't even know anyway care go yeah, ahead yeah, yeah. okay um, i don't want to get derailed here but sorry i have uh, there, <laughs> um as the only self-identified atheist on the podcast i have uh -huh. a follow-up question so yeah. you mentioned um did you say 97 percent of people in these fields are self-identified as atheists yeah. um and i wanted to question you well, that, why that, that, was, you... that was back in 90 i mean no it was 2000 and it doesn't matter eight or something like that it's was probably when, was when that's survey, fair enough it's true it, it was an internal survey they didn't they actually publish it anyway. okay so fair enough um yeah. so i just wanted to read so there's a definition for motivated reasoning which is the phenomenon in cognitive science and social psychology in which emotional biases lead to justifications or decisions based on their desirability rather than an accurate reflection of the evidence so would you say that atheists in the scientific field have a motivated reasoning that they have something more a different bias to draw the conclusions about science that they do. Okay, I, I would say that everybody, because of their life experiences, has certain biases. Sure. And uh, and and the, the hard part is getting people to admit what biases they have. Sure. <laughs> you know? So I, I've, I've admitted my bias. Obviously, in this particular case, is you've that done a great I'm, job. I, I, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm a believer, basically, right, kind of thing. Um, I think a lot of times um, that doesn't come into play or people don't tell what their biases are. Um, but, but I think just the experience of being human gives us biases. I mean, each, each one of us and go through different life experiences that create uh, certain outlooks. And then we look at everything in our life through those lenses. And Kara, the first point on my bullet for part two is epistemology. So we are going to get to that. Okay. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll repeat this section later. <laughs> well, yeah. it's just it's stories. If you yeah. take too long, the stories drag on forever. Yeah. yeah. So as, I think that all kind of ties it back again that we, you know, we can all agree that to a certain point we have our biases, and that uh, yeah. from the beginning, Rod talked about. I mean, like, science his... is not without its own bias, and, and neither is people. You know, I mean, everybody has a bias. Yeah. 
we'll get into that. But I think it's yeah. important that we talked yeah. about throughout Rod's story of like you you just kind of admitted that your bias has to do with having this emotional experience and MTC yeah. recognizing the Book of Mormon yeah. is yeah. true and then living your life in a certain way congruent with that. So yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay, so the important parts of your story that lead to the Heartland stuff, without going into too much detail, like what brings you into the Heartland? All right, so uh, so yeah. essentially. Um, after, after, um, I had a, a business that I was helping people with, uh, with food and food storage and that kind of stuff. And I, I had a manufacturing company called high country gourmet. Um, I, I got, I got it just for, just for those listening here. Um, I do have a relative by the name of Jeff Meldrum, uh, but I, I think he's at Idaho state university. He's probably the world's foremost authority on Bigfoot. That's not me. I'm not him. He's not me. We're different. Okay. So I've been, are you buds? I've, no. Are you buds? I, we know each other. I mean, yeah, we're, you're not, we're not you're close not homies. or anything. You're no, not we're friends. not homies. Yeah. Okay. okay. And, uh, and in fact, I would probably say that I, I would disagree with the Bigfoot research, but anyway, nevertheless, um, so where were we going with that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, how you got into the heartland stuff. Yeah. So, uh, so essentially what was happening, I had this, uh, this, uh, manufacturing business. We were providing soups for all these different, uh, companies and so forth. We wholesale manufactured it. And then, uh, Y2K, you know, I mean, the, the predictions and the prognostications there were, were pretty, uh, grim, you know, everything was going to shut down, you know, at, at midnight on 1999 and beginning of 2000, all the computers were going to go haywire and basically, that didn't happen. And so we had a big, there was a big buildup, people kind of freaking out about that. And, uh, and we, we were supplying food for that. And then at the end of that, um, there was no breakdown. And, and the bottom line is, is that the, uh, the food storage industry basically went completely bust. And I found myself sitting on about, was about $780,000 in accounts receivable that I couldn't collect from all these different companies that we were doing business with. And so that led to another one of these uh, crises, if you will, about uh, about things, and and uh, and that led to still another um, a computer. We didn't plug it in, so uh, maybe Jen can it plug died. it in um, yeah. while you're talking. Go ahead. Yeah. Anyway, so that actually was another low point in my life. I was like, you know, I'm having to. Uh, I'm looking at bankruptcy, and and uh, we had to close down our business. We had. Uh, 35 employees we had to let them all go and and things just got real ugly so your soup business goes bankrupt yep this is the soup business right here this is the canning line and the other stuff that we did here the, the fully automated canning facility here and um some of the other pictures as my kids working in the uh thing that child labor laws you know just kidding <laughs> oh, they were just helping clean it up one day so there we go You've had a rough day. You're trying to stay positive. It's great. It's great. Everything's great, right? You ever feel like that kind of thing, right? So then, uh, th th this is a, this is something I thought was was really uh, helpful for me, at least. And I said, don't tell God that you have a big problem. Tell your problem you have a big God. And uh, and I had a big problem because I had predators coming after me in, in every different direction, and we had to shut everything down. I couldn't even sell the equipment. I mean, nobody wanted it. The entire industry evaporated overnight and basically it was a big problem but again going back to the original thing sometimes good things fall apart so better things can fall together and one of those better things was my I, I i called up a friend of mine down in arizona that i'd met from years before that and he said Roddy says uh how's it going i says honestly it sucks <laughs> you know life sucks and uh you know my business has failed i mean we're 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 going through the throes of all kinds of issues going on there he says he says actually he says you know what it's kind of what i've been praying for for the last couple of years i've wanted you to come and help me work on this project who's this person this is dean sessions and the universal model and uh, i said well yeah i could i could use a job right now you know i'm 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 dead in the water and so that's kind of what was uh, his what was his business background? Dean Sessions' business background. Um, his, his business background. Well, he he graduated at BYU for, and uh, I think it was organizational psychology, and then uh, then he started a, a company in Arizona. It's actually still there. It's called KS Appraisal. He was a he's a commercial uh, real estate appraising company that's still there, and he was about thirty something, thirty two, thirty three years old when he essentially. Um, 
decided that it was time to retire. He bought a bunch of properties and then uh, was able to sell them and, and so forth and was blessed to be able to do that. So he, and, and part of his patriarchal blessing talks about uh, being involved with science. Anyway, so he started this, this project and that's when I got involved with it. And so for seven years, he and I worked together in the scientific aspects of this. It's actually kind of nice. Um, this is uh, just some of our outings there, just the, the Grand Canyon, and this is other stuff here. So, all right, we'll just kind of do that. But bottom line is, is so this, can you this is how I got involved in like 30 seconds what his vision was for why he hired you. I'm hiring you because yeah. I want to, what would he say? Um, help with the research. Of what? Being the primary researcher for the universal model. Why would he want project. to create a universal model? What was his motivation? <laughs> okay. What was his? Well, I have to let why, him why was probably universal address model, that. Yeah. Why was a universal model even needed? Sure, he, he would have given you a vision. Yeah. Here's the problem that I'm yeah. solving for that I'm trying to develop a new scientific model for. What, yeah. what was the problem that he was solving for? Um, well, just that, that there's there's certain things like, for example, creation, the flood, things that you've already talked about, you know, Adam and Eve, uh, age of the earth and those kinds of things. And, um, and you know, what, you know, wh where did all this kind of start from? You know, where did, where did, where did the, uh, the, the, the scientific understandings that we have today, what, what was their foundation? What was their basis? And so that's what we were kind of doing. Anyway, so that's just, just some of the Im images from that. I'll just no, no, no. Of, uh, Let me just, this that. is, this is actually really important. So, so Dean Sessions, it, it, you sort of realize at some point, man, Mormonism's got a problem or Christianity's got a problem because the scientific, the scientific, the scientific consensus that's emerging is, is not, completely conflicting yes. with the fundamental, fundamentalist reading of both the Bible and the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Rod Meldrum, you just went bankrupt come help me develop a new scientific model that can challenge the prevailing overwhelming sort of consensus of well, just what's the truth of science what's the truth but he's not a scientist either he probably doesn't have a master's or a phd in science Correct. Correct. right right so yeah. it's two non-scientists yeah. developing yep. a new scientific model that yeah. that uh, consumes or that um, is an umbrella model for all of the scientific disciplines in aggregate which is really hard to believe how, I mean, yeah. When, when, in fact, when we first started this, I was going, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, we're talking about some pretty fundamental things here about science. I mean, could all of science possibly be wrong? And the other, another big question that people have to be you know, aware of, and, 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 and I, and I like to bring this up or I don't bring it up often, but occasionally when it's needed, I bring it up. And that is that have people who are, who are sends a, PhDs have have there been people who've made major contributions, or um, or even have gone against scientific consensus and so forth that have made huge contributions to our knowledge base of as humans. And I think the answer to that is yeah. I mean, you look at some of the some of the founders of uh, of Apple or or Microsoft or so forth. I mean, how many of those guys have uh, PhDs in their particular field? No, no, no. I get it. We don't have to drill you know, down so there. I, I, what yeah. I'm saying is, is, I think that there are people like like myself and Dean and others, and and there's millions of other people who have made or can make really significant contributions to the knowledge base of humanity of without course. a PhD. Of course, and right. I yeah, okay. <laughs> yep. But but that's what I'm saying. That's all true. Yeah, there are. I'm sure in history there are non-scientists that have made important contributions, and and scientists who have, that, right. that are. But but also I'm saying that it is. You are acknowledging yeah. that it's a really audacious thing. It's pretty. That two like, non yeah. two Mormon non-scientists decide they're going to develop this grand unifying theory of science yeah. that helps to explain a global flood, and a fourteen thousand year old Earth, and that evolution's yeah. not true. And dinosaur bones. Well, not to make any comparisons with with other people that we that we all would recognize, but I mean, pretty hard to believe that a carpenter's son, or that, could what, a, or a or a farm boy in New York, or or, or, you, or you know, those are just things from from the from from the church. But but what about? I mean, there's there's lots of other examples that have nothing to do with any kind of religion that you know that, that you know that people have risen to be able to make big contributions to things when they had humble circumstances, you know, I mean, like at, uh, 
you know, if you were going to political realm, I mean, Abraham Lincoln, I mean, what was his circumstances? Did he, did he influence things? Did he change people's lives? Did he, did he affect the direction of an entire nation? Did he have a PhD? Was he highly educated? So I guess my, my, yeah, people have, I think, too much of a tendency to put too much emphasis on the education of a person and rather than what's the truth. So let's just, so that's, that, that, that's what I, that's, that's what I'm thinking. Let, let's talk about we truth. We can all agree. We can talk about truth all day long. I love that. We can all agree with that. Yeah. And I, I hope you would agree that the idea of two kind of Mormon non-scientists coming up with a grand unifying theory is a pretty that hard thing to all believe. science <laughs> is, well, it's, 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 yeah. it's, it's almost as fantastic as Jesus resurrecting and being the creator of the universe. I mean, it's not quite there. Well, no, but it's, not, it's not even in that realm, I don't think. But it's, it's pretty, it's pretty it's close. It's kind of out there, though. I, I, I totally get it. I Depending totally on how admit, much you, you respect know. science, yeah. it is actually pretty but that, close. But see, that's the thing that's so nice about it, though, John, is that people don't have to take it based on what we say. Uh -huh. And this is one of the things I loved about being a missionary is that in the, in the church said, you know, don't take our word for it as missionaries. You read the book and you pray about it and you find out, you know, that way. Sure. But, but there's a problem with that. And that is that, um, if the, if the, if the book is claiming to be a historical record and there's no evidence for its history, its historicity, then why would anybody want to read a book that claims to be a history book that, uh, yeah. that, that there's no history to back it up? Yeah. You, you, you guys know, are basically trying yeah. to re trying to explain re-explain science in a way that saves Christianity and Mormonism. It's a, there's a real, the core of your motivations are to save Christianity, to, the to save the Bible, to save Christianity and to save Mormonism yeah. from secular slash scientific yeah. theories and explanations that undermine all of the things you hold. That most are godless. Well, well, basically I, I would put it this way. What well, was what I said if, wrong? If, um, Yes, because it, because the, the primary motivation isn't to disprove or to prove anything. It's what's the truth? Just what's the truth? No, you know, but there's and, a motivation. And how do we I get could, to that? That sounds I could, pure. I could yeah. argue. I could argue for one, like when I was at the Book of Mormon Evidence Conference yeah. and Dean Sessions talked about how science goes in one way when the like church was restored in this year we had like darwin's theories being yeah. unveiled the same year and so yeah. he gave he gave a speech about how science goes one way and the church and the the truth of the gospel goes the direct opposite way and the more i studied what he said i felt like he had strict motivated reasoning to push science and say things that were actually quite untrue about what the scientific consensus even is about the creation of the earth for the strict reason that I think he was trying to make them look polar opposite so that people had to choose one and they had to force themselves into a stricter lane where if you don't want to choose Darwinism, you don't want to choose um, evolution and you don't want to choose the scientific method, you're going to have to kind of walk on our line over here, which is Joseph Smith's restored gospel. So I feel like since I know a lot of the things Dean Sessions teaches, yeah. I feel like I feel like I already know too much to really believe that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. That they don't but, work but, in concert with each but other. But one of the things, when, when you go to the conferences, kind of the assumption is, is that people have already kind of gone through a lot of the other pre, you know, previous stuff. That, that's one of the reasons why I really appreciate John, um, you know, letting me come and kind of give the, um, the, the, the basis why we believe these, these things that we believe, you know. And, uh, and, and because without that basis, there's really... I mean, it's kind of like uh, trying to explain, you know, physics to somebody who's just learning their multiplication tables. Okay, but the, but that doesn't it, make sense. We could talk that, about this next session, okay, we'll but I, but I just want to say this: I think we have established the basis of what's the model called? The universal model. Yeah, universal. The model, basis yeah. is. Tell me if I'm wrong. It's not that you love truth, although I believe you do love truth. Yeah, and I believe you're sincere. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't think that's the basis. I think the basis is you had that witness, that emotional witness mm -hmm. that the Book of Mormon's true, which means Mormonism is true, which means Mormon prophets have been true, which means the Bible's true. And there's all this prevailing science now that is challenging your yeah. sacred beliefs. And like you like you admitted, and I'm not this yeah. isn't a yeah. gotcha. Yeah. I really think I'm staying true to what you've said. You admitted that when your cherished beliefs rub up against science, if you have to pick one, you're going with the cherished beliefs. Yeah. That is yeah. the core of the universal model. Yeah, that's what I was trying you, to explain. You are not building, you are not just 
yeah. unbiasedly truth seeking, gathering evidence and then <laughs> interpreting it, which yeah. is what science well, like at its best yeah. tries to do. Yeah. You're not doing that. You're saying we have all these things that prophets have said, things that are in the scriptures, things that are in these historical books that we think are historical. Science is really undermining that and challenging it. So we got to figure out a way to come up with a new science. Uh, okay. So that, that, that's in, based in, in truth. In, in but, general, I would, I would say that that it was a pretty close okay. assumption, but, but not a hundred percent. That makes sense. That's fine. Okay. I, I, that's fine. That's yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So, that's so good. the, uh, so the, the situation I, as I see it is basically, um, and again, it's, it, it, it's going to sound like circular reasoning, but, uh, but you have to kind of had the, the experience that, that I had kind of thing to be able to understand, you know, the, uh, basically it's like this. If the, what, uh, the experience that I had was the truth. Okay. If that, if that was, if that really established my baseline and so forth, then, and like, you, like you've already stated the, um, if there's a, a discrepancy between the two, then yes, I'm going to be looking very hard at the, at the scientific aspect of it and saying, okay, so if there's a discrepancy, where's the discrepancy? Why is there a discrepancy? What is the discrepancy specifically? And uh, is there, is there ways to, to uh, address that? Um, how did we come to those, those conclusions in the first place? Like I, just kind of give you one quick example in the science realm. Well, I just think, I don't, yeah. I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't think we need, I yeah. just, I just, I, I think it's enough if we're talking about your story, which is the emphasis yeah, of this yeah, episode. Yeah. I think we've established your, your faith as a foundation and what you're trying to do with the universal model. And, and yeah. I, I mean, I, I just don't, well, there's, there's a lot of people, not just, not just Mormonism, but I mean, you have, you know, the Muslims, you have Jews, you have yeah. all of Christianity. I mean, pretty much anybody who uses ancient world history, whether it's through the Pope al Vu or the Torah or the, uh, or the Quran or the Holy Bible, um, all of those are ancient histories. Are they all wrong? Are they, they all have similarities in, for example, Noah's flood is pretty much universal throughout, uh, throughout all of the ancient, uh, these ancient texts and so forth. Um, were they just, you know, were they just imagining this flood or was it a local flood or what, you know, what, what was the deal with this flood and, uh, and, and what were the mechanisms? Are there any scientific mechanisms to explain potentially how, where did all the water come from? Where did it all go? Right. You know, those kind of questions. Um, it's questions that really, and, 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 and maybe, uh, this would be a good, a good point to, uh, I, I brought a, I brought a couple of, uh, of, of things here, I think. Well, what I want to talk wanted, about wanted really to, quickly, to you, just yeah. to finish out your yeah, story, how did you get from teaming up with sessions to do the universal model? Just yes. tell us briefly how you got from there to becoming the Heartland model guy. Okay. Like, what was just the high level chronological touch okay. points? Yep. Yep. Okay. So, so you're helping him do. So, so he was just working stuff. on universal model stuff. Okay. And then, uh, and then that's when it came out with, uh, with my first book. So the very first book was actually this one right here. Uh, okay, so let me, let me go back into how, what was the catalyst that kind of got me involved with the Heartland research? Because prior to this point, it didn't really matter to me whether it happened in Central America, North America, whatever. Just and, and like a lot of members of the church say, you know, it doesn't matter where it happened; it just matters that it happened. Yeah. Right? Um, but to me, where it happened, I mean, there's over 550 passages in the Book of Mormon that specifically talk about geography. So I'm thinking, well, obviously, I think that they wanted us to know. <laughs> what the geography was right yeah and uh so they didn't you know uh, again this is based on the assumption that you know, the book of mormon is a historical record which obviously is is my foundation right. okay so the uh the the heartland research really started by because i had i was the uh, young man's president of our ward i had this young man in our ward uh won't name any names or whatever but uh he was just a great young man and and for whatever reason he been, he turned 19 and was not going on his mission and we're going well i wonder what's going on with the family or whatever anyway so long story short is that uh is that they moved we helped him move to into another place and then his mom shows up at my doorstep about three or four days after the move and she had this dvd in her hand and she came up and she says no brother Meldon, you do uh you do scientific research right and i said well yeah we've been doing that for a number of years 
and she said, um, you need to watch this. And I took the DVD from her, and it's the DVD that says DNA versus the Book of Mormon by Living Hope Ministries up out of uh, Brigham City, Utah. Yeah. And I went, oh, okay. I, I had heard about it, but I didn't really know much about that at the time. And I said, well, why do I need to watch it? She says, because it's true. And, uh, and she and her family um, were in the process of, uh, of leaving the church. And it became kind of kind of a personal thing to me at this point. Um, I'm going, well, okay, so number one, why, why would DNA, I mean, how could DNA evidence disprove the Book of Mormon? And number two, is there an answer for it? And, um, and so I started looking at apologetic sites and so forth, you know, Fair Mormon and, and, uh, and you, know, you know, Maxwell Institute, which by the, you know, they, they hadn't actually made the change over. They were still uh, farms at that point in time. And um, so I started looking at some of the stuff. They had just published a book about the DNA stuff and essentially saying that there's no DNA evidence, that there's, that there's you know, it's, it's inconclusive. There's no way we can know one way or the other and so forth. And I was just like, well, I had access because I was still with the Universal Model Project. And so I had access to some of the top research libraries in the country. And so I started doing my own research basically on that. So it was, it was kind of a personal decision to, to do that. And then, one, another catalyst was I was up at the uh, the the April uh, general conference in in uh, what year? Two thousand two, I think it was. Okay. And uh, it was the right the Winter Olympics had just happened, and uh, so forth. And it was no, it was, I guess it was two thousand three. This is the Book of Mormon title change you're about to say, right? <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, okay. No, um, although we can talk about that too. But basically, so. Um, there was actually an interview that was done by a, a German reporter with President Hinckley at the right. time. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and basically says, so what's going to be your church's position when DNA analysis shows that there's no evidence that there were Hebrews basically here in America, whatever. And, and President Hinckley got, I mean, he's almost visibly, I don't know if he's going to say perturbed at the question or whatever, but, uh, but he, you know, he, he, he kind of just stopped the guy and basically said, wait a minute, that, that hasn't been established. Nobody knows the answer to that. Not at this point. That was in 2002, if I remember correctly, and um, and this was just before the Winter Olympics. Well, then uh, it, it turns out that that actually, I mean, for better or for worse, it turns out to be kind of a prophetic statement because uh, right after that, in 2003, articles began to come out about the DNA research that we'll talk about in more detail later on. This is a, a little, uh, you know, promo for next episodes. <laughs> so. So, uh, so that led to, uh, the, the next April conference, I was there, um, with my family and there was these big signs that outside the, the conference center says DNA proves the book of Mormon is false. And so that's, I sit, stand there, they, they had the big lines because they had just put in the protocols for, you know, the, uh, they had to check everybody, you know, for security and all this kind of stuff. And before you just walk in, now they had to go through all the security checkpoints and stuff. Anyway, so I, I said, well, you know, okay, so is there an answer? Um, because this became personal because I have I have this 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 family and this this young man is a friend of mine leaving the church over this thing. Um is there an answer? Mm. And 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 now I I will have to say though that in my heart of hearts, I think my bias kicks in and said, there's got to be an answer because I already know the book is true, right? So there's that bias, and and, and I totally recognize that. Um, but on the other hand, you can't just make up an answer. I mean, you have to go look for it. You have to go digging. And so that's what I decided to do, um, using the resources that we had with the universal model and started to look into the DNA research, which then if we keep this at like the 30,000 foot level, so the DNA research then led to, well, wow, there's, I mean, there, there, there is no evidence for any Hebraic peoples down in Central and South America the Mayans and the the people that the, the you know the, the Toltecs and, and Olmecs and so forth that are down there, there's no evidence for any Hebraic bloodlines down there, um, which doesn't bode well for the Book of Mormon. And then I started finding out about this half of Group X, and we'll talk about that again in more detail later on. But then that led to well, well, when did Joseph Smith know about this? And so I started doing a lot of deep dive research into you know, in anything that Joseph Smith might have said or done that we have historical documentation about um, that may indicate his 
particular viewpoints on where the Book of Mormon may have taken place. And then that led to um, going into the Book of Mormon itself and saying, okay, well, it has these prophecies. And in, 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 in the Doctrine and Covenants in section three, it says the reason why the plates were preserved was so that the prophecies and the promises that are contained within them would be made known in the latter in the last days and so forth. So I said, well, what are these prophecies and promises? I couldn't find anybody had written any really major books or treatises on the subject of these prophecies in the Book of Mormon. So then that led to, well, what are they? So we did, I started working with Bruce Porter and, uh, and, we, and we came up with the first book, which is called Prophecies and Promises, which is about the 36 prophecies in the Book of Mormon that are describing a Latter-day nation that was going to be established and raised up and lifted up and set up and so forth. Um, and what nation in the Americas best fit that description? And so that was, that went into that aspect of it. Okay. And so then, uh, then, then the second book that came up was this, this book that's in the, on the screen right here, which is the, Show the uh, first book. Um, I don't have a copy of it because it Costco called? sold it all out. What's it called? <laughs> It's called Exploring the Book of Mormon in America's Heartland. That was your first book. Well, no, okay. The, the first book was this was this book, which is the uh, the Prophecies and Promises book. Okay. Okay. It's uh, the Heartland Model, the Book of Mormon, and the United States of America. So basically, this, that was your very first book. Yeah. This is okay. With, so you with, were with studying, myself and Bruce Porter. Yeah. So you were studying DNA, mm -hmm. but that led you to come out with the book about Heartland. Yeah. Just in like a couple sentences, explain to me um, well, why didn't you do a book on book DNA in the Book of Mormon? Okay, well, yeah, well, I, I figure we'd probably get into that in a lot more detail. Just at a high level, on. but the high level basically is the DNA uh, evidence that the reason for the controversy about DNA in the Book of Mormon is because of the complete lack of any Hebrew, um, you know, lineages or bloodlines in Central and South America, or actually, originally I thought it was throughout the Americas. And there's there's four primary groups that are, they call. No, I don't want to dig into groups. that. I'm just at a high level. But there was, you well, there were was studying DNA, group. but you came yeah. up with the Heartland book because because of this haplogroup X DNA type. So the DNA yeah. led you to, to look North, to North, North Eastern, America, northeastern North America, and southeastern Canada. Because in your view, the way you read the DNA evidence, there were North American Native American tribes yeah. that had a genetic makeup by your interpretation yeah. that would be more favorable to a historical book of Mormon than central American than your right. reading or interpretation right. of central American DNA. Is that right? Um, yeah, but it's not, it's not my interpretation as to it's the journal articles that talk about well, specifically. Okay. Yeah. Well, there, we'll there, there, there's four primary groups that are all Asian. In, yeah. And then there's one, there's only one group in the genetics field that is non-Asian. It's a, and, and that's the haplogroup X. And so I said, well, where is the haplogroup X located? Well, it happens to be Northeastern United States and the Algonquin speaking language groups of Native American Indians. So that's, okay. that's where the DNA led me to Joseph Smith. Because I go, well, where did Joseph Smith? It turns out that, that Joseph Smith and his revelations in Doctrine and Covenants sections 28, 30, and 32, he's told to send missionaries unto the Lamanites and the term Lamanites is used in every one of those sections. And, um, and, and so the, the immediately dispatched was Oliver Cowdery and Peter Whitmer Jr. and Parley P. Pratt and, um, and the guy by the name of Ziba Peterson. Yeah. And he got the very first copies of the Book of Mormon that just came off the Grand and Press there in Palmyra. And he sends them on a mission to go to these Lamanites. And in section 32 in the Doctrine and Covenants, he says, well, this, assuming that you believe that it's the Lord speaking here, the Lord says, and I myself will go with them. So I, so I'm looking at this and going, I think this is like a, personal guided tour by the Lord himself to people that the Lord calls Lamanites. And so if you believe that the Lord knows who the Lamanites are and where they're located, you got to kind of pay attention to this. And so that's why it led to Joseph Smith. And then that led to, well, where did they go? And, and, uh, part of P Pratt writes in his journal and later on in his autobiography, um, he says that they, they go to New York and Ohio and Missouri, and they met with these particular tribes and these particular tribes, um, today, when we sequence their DNA, they don't come from the Mayans. Their ancestral people are these people called the Hopewell Mound Builder people who are in the central part of the United States, not the central part of America. And so that's where the, really the, the research of the heartland kind of, that's the stemming, that's where it kind of came from. So, so we had basically Joseph Smith, the prophecies, and then the Book of Mormon itself that are talking about 
people yeah. that are not down in Central America. Talking about Ohio and Missouri. And people and who have New DNA York that's not Asian. Canada. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. I mean, because we don't have, we don't, we don't know for sure what kind of DNA Lehi and Soraya or Ishmael or his wife. We don't even know her name for heaven's sake. But we do know a couple of things about what they're not. So it's kind of deductive yeah. reasoning. I mean, we, we know that they weren't, you know, Asians. We know that they weren't Africans. I mean, they, they were, they were Hebrews. At least if the Book of Mormon is true, then, then you should be looking for a, a Hebrew right. type of a lineage or no, people yeah, that, that with Hebrew traditions yeah. and Hebrew culture and so forth. And those, those are quite unique. Um, and there's some things that would be left over archaeologically yeah. for people who are Hebrews. There should be. Yeah. Okay. So the first book you were saying is the first book. Yeah. So the first book was the one I was just holding up, which is the Prophecies and Promises. The one on the, in the picture here is called uh, Exploring the Book of Mormon, America's Heartland. Um, by that time, I had gone back and, and, and done research and had taken photos of some of these because, I mean, how many people in the church or really even in the Midwest know anything about these these mounds out there? All the There's mounds, these mounds the of mound, dirt. The mounds, it, the mound building stuff. The mound builder stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, people live in Columbus, Ohio, and they and they have no idea that these mounds even exist, number one, or or anything about their history or anything like that. It's kind of, kind of been a forgotten history. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, so I started to say, well, you know what, let's take, let's go take a look and see, you know, does it match up? I mean, what, what aspects do, what aspects don't match up? You know, do the time frames line, line up? I mean, you know, does the archaeology in the, in the ground actually meet up with the, what the, with the, what's described in the Book of Mormon? You know, right. does the, does the weather, the climate, I mean, you know, metallurgy, I mean, do they have swords? Do they do smelting? You know, I mean, all of these different things, what kind of language did they have? You know, all of these things play into it. And quite honestly, and I think you're going to love this, but, uh, but that it, it just, the evidence for it in Central America is just not existent or miserable. Yeah. I mean, that's it's for just sure. not even there. That's something you, Karen, and I can it's, unanimously yeah. agree on. <laughs> you know, so, so that's one of those things that basically, I mean, the time frames don't line up. The linguistics don't line up. The, yeah. uh, the animals and plants don't line up. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's no way the Book of Mormon happened. There's a few in things America. that you could even point to, and the, and then the DNA thing is really a, a nail in the coffin as far as their 100%. As, as far as they're concerned. We 100 percent agree with you. Yeah. Um, there's I, no I think, way the I think Book of you'd Mormon probably like that particular. There's no way the Book of Mormon it, happened, comma, in yeah. South America. In, in South America. America. Yeah. In Central yeah. South America. Central America. Okay. Yeah. So really quickly, I think we're almost at the end. So you start coming out with books that talk about the Heartland theory. Yeah. Um. And then how does your movement grow? So, oh, quick, firstly, yeah. who's paying your salary these years <laughs> yeah. that you're doing all these research and writing these books? I am. I just, so I, by we, selling we books? struggled, we struggled mightily. We struggled. In fact, I, I remember uh, one, one time we were, it was getting to be the 4th of July and, and uh, you know, people's, people's hearts and minds go to barbecues and family and uh, reunions and, uh, and, and hikes and, and, national parks and so forth in the summertime. And they're not thinking about Book of Mormon stuff, right? So the first DVD, actually, actually, actually the first thing that I put out was actually not a book. It was the DVD. It was called DNA Evidence for Book of Mormon Geography. And it was four bloody hours long. <laughs> okay. I had so many people say, Rod, you know what? Nobody's going to sit down and watch a four hour long show. Nobody. I was like, okay, so which part should I take out? Start stuff about Joseph Smith? No, not that. Well, DNA? No, not that. Well, the geography itself stuff? No. Well, and finally, just kind of throw their hands up in the air and say, okay, fine, you got to have it all in there. I'm grateful that I did because it gave people enough information that they don't get shot down every time somebody asks them a question about, like, well, how come I never mentioned snow in the Book of Mormon? You know, which is which is a valid question, but it's but. Uh, Another valid question is, is, well, if it happened in Central America, then why didn't they mention rain a lot? Yeah, rain, Rain's only get... mentioned it happened twice right. so you in did a thousand a, year history. So you did a DVD, you did some DVDs on DNA. Yeah. And so that started going um, not viral in the internet sense, because this was 15 years ago, you know, 16 years ago. So it was, so uh, it, it, it kind of went or... viral and we, and we ended up having about 50 or 60,000 of those DVDs that went out. Those 2006? Ish. My my first presentation about this was in 2006 and in seven, and then this came out in, in the beginning of 2008. 
Wow. So you started doing your stuff after Mormon stories had already started. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. And and when I and when I asked you about how you made a living, yeah, you oh, were yeah. basically saying, let me just summarize what I heard. You guys were kind of super struggling financially for many years. As you were doing I was this, working, a, I was working a full time job and doing this on the side. And the job was doing what? Just I, I worked for Interact Medical. Medical um, devices. It's a, it's a, it's a 3D um, training for surgeons and and so forth for medical device companies. So you've got a job so that you're doing so to doing keep a, your family job, alive, full-time. and then you're doing these DVDs and books I'm killing all myself. I'm down to like two or three hours a night. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to stay up with this. I'm we, we're trying to you know get a website together. I've got no extra money. We got we got a family of of four. I mean, well, six of us. You know, parents poor and, kids. and poor kids. And uh, and it's a struggle. I mean, you know, we but uh, I just felt really strongly that this is something that it was it was at least a a hopeful answer to the DNA question, which was plaguing a lot of people's minds. There were a lot of people leaving the church over the DNA thing, because DNA is, I mean, let's face it, DNA is used in courts of law. You know, you can't fudge your DNA. You can't fake it. It's, it's not, you know, when, when they sequence it, it's not theoretically sequencing. It's it's real sequencing, right? Yeah. Now, there is, a, there is a hypothetical theoretical well, let's not, part of it. Let's not get there there yet. But the data itself is the data. Okay. Right. So, so yeah. okay. So it's, I got the sense that when you went to work with sessions, he was like paying you. Yeah. Now, oh yeah. But yeah. then did you guys have a falling out? Why did, uh, at what point well, did he the, stop the, fund, the funding for that actually? Well, actually we, we, we had an experiment phrase where we were doing experiments and so forth and doing the research and so forth. But once we got the research kind of gathered and so forth, then it had to be all kind of coalesced into, you know, what was going to be written in the book. Yeah. And that doesn't take, a team necessarily i mean basically but he didn't need you for that part so yeah so and and, and plus um the, the the amount of money that would you know basically kind of the deal was when we first got going is is, is that uh you know we'll, we'll we can pay you enough to keep you know keep the wolf from the door kind of thing okay but but we had to put off i mean i'll, I'll just tell you i mean basically between two and three thousand dollars a month and you know with a family of four and and so forth i mean that's not a lot of money no right so so there's a lot of things that got put off, a lot of things that you would normally do of upkeep and maintenance on your house and your properties and so forth that we just didn't do because we didn't have the money. And so I said, you know what? Um, I need to go make you know enough money so I can get like roof fixed on the house and uh, we've got appliances that are falling apart and we've got to do some stuff and I've got to make enough to do that. And you don't need me right now anyway. I will circle back around. And plus by that time, the, the research on the DNA and the Book of Mormon stuff was getting to the point where I Heating didn't have up. time to really help him with the universal model really Got anymore. It. Got it. And so I, I basically started to move over into, uh, into that arena more. And so that's where, that's where so, so I, I took I, the job with Interact Medical. Yeah. I'm so grateful that we're covering this because this really helps me understand your story and your motivations and your history. Yeah. So as you leave working with sessions directly, start creating DVDs and books you you mentioned you kind of had a marketing problem. This was kind of pre-social media, pre-Facebook, pre-YouTube even. How do you how do you start marketing your DVDs and books? Are you selling them at Deseret Book? Are you selling them at just on a random website? And then how do you yeah. amass what becomes a really large following? Yeah. How do you amass that? Amass that? My 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 initial situation was is I just wanted to let people know that there's there's at least a a logical answer to the whole dna question you know that that uh we've done and, and like and like, like, like any research it? i mean it's, it's always ongoing i mean there's always you know more research to be done but how'd you spread the word how'd you um, get, i just started you doing get, presentations just you know people at what, at what? I, I started actually with my own ward and we have a clubhouse in our ward willowbrook and and uh, they, and, and said hey you know what, um, what state is this it's in provo okay Okay. The state of confusion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Anyway, so we have, uh, so we did this, um, I did this presentation for this group there in my ward and they're going, oh my gosh, we, we'd never heard any of this before. And then that kind of started to spread. And then basically for almost about a year and a half, I just did presentations up along the Wasatch front here. No charge. I mean, I was just, you know, I just wanted to let the word get out there that there's, there is a, at least a, a reasonable answer to the whole DNA you know, controversy that was going on. And the apologetics community was answering it with what I consider to be kind of a non-answer. Um, you know, essentially that the, 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 um, 
the apologetics community of the church was essentially saying there's no evidence for the Book of Mormon either for or against. It's kind of a neutral deal. Yeah, it was basically like the yeah. there was such a it, it was in Central America, and it was such a small population that there were already got, existing Native Americans here, and they, the, and they went diluted to a super into the, what? The, and they got diluted into the Mayan culture, and that's the reason why there's no Hebrew DNA and so forth. The, only, got pro the only problem with that is, is that it doesn't and, follow the Book of Mormon uh, storyline. No, we'll all. cover that. We'll cover that later. <laughs> okay, but I'm just so, saying, I. I, yeah. I just generally speaking, what they wanted to do is shrink the target, like Farms and Maxwell Institute. They wanted to shrink the genetic DNA target to as small as possible, so you could well, never plausible deniability. Oh, there were other people here, so the reason why the DNA ties back to Asia is because when the Jaredites and or Lehites got here, there was already a bunch of other people who had Asiatic DNA, yeah. and they were in the small, super tiny area in Native in Central America. So that once they all got killed out, their DNA got swamped and killed off. And that's why we have Asiatic DNA and in Native no, Americans and no, and to no, this day. And there's no Hebrew DNA. Right. That, that, that's uh, pretty close to about, yeah, pretty accurate there. Okay. Okay. But but there a couple of things that were um And you're just like, that's not good that. enough. That's not going to fly with a lot of people. Well, the thing about it is, is some of the some of the genetics research behind it is actually accurate. I mean, like for sure. example, they, they have an Icelandic study where there was a small group of individuals that came into Icelandic population within four generations. Their their DNA didn't really show up anymore in mitochondrial DNA analysis and so forth or, or sequencing. In other words, you couldn't you couldn't find their markers specifically. So there's 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 accuracy as far as that that could happen that way. But again, that's based on one big assumption that that is not in the Book of Mormon, which is that Lehi and his family came in and assimilated with another larger population. Where is that in the Book of Mormon? Yeah, and we're going to talk about that next section. Yeah. So, so you so start go. doing these firesides all along the Wasatch Front. Yeah. And then that just People starts, I, I'm pretty soon, I'm, I'm just, I, every weekend I'm just booked with just different stuff and I've got, you know, it's, it's costing me gas. It's costing me time. I'm, I'm spending all my money. I'm, I'm, I'm running on fumes with, uh, I'm, you know, I'm trying to stay up with things. I've got emails pouring in left and right. I relate like, to, I relate to all this part. Can I, I, what, what, I mean, I've got to do something because I can see the handwriting on the wall is, is that if I'm going to continue to do this, I can't continue to work full time and do this because I'm going to kill myself in the process. Right. Yeah. And so that's basically where I was kind of coming from. And so, uh, so that's when, uh, then, then I, one of my good friends was, uh, Hartman Rector Jr. who's a journal authority and a lot of we people know, know that know guy. Him. That's Lila yeah. Tuller's dad. Yeah. Is yeah. that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've okay. got some stories about him. Not so positive though. Yeah. But anyway. yeah, I, I, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, but, uh, just that, but he was one of the first, uh, people who I would say was kind of in the, in the, in the leadership role within the church that actually took a really hard look at this. And he'd actually even been down to Central America and had a, 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 a nephew of his that actually took people down to Central America and did tours down there. And so it was kind of a big thing for him to uh, to make the switch. But after he saw the research, he was like, well, this makes a lot of sense. So he he uh, suggested that we, that we record it because I was wearing myself thin trying to do presentations all over the place. And so the only way to really get the message out faster would be to record it and have that go out, right? I mean... Okay, what, really quickly. What we're doing right now, you know, I mean, basically going out to uh, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, for, but, for our for our non Mormon listeners and for people that don't kind of know the '80s and '90s, Harbin Rector Jr. was a really, really super popular Mormon general authority. Yeah, he gave super charismatic and sometimes very controversial general conference talks. <laughs> very more orthodox. Yeah, we interviewed his daughter Lila Tuller on Mormon Stories podcast. It's one of our highly recommended, really important interviews. But you're saying as an emeritus general authority, so he right. had been put out to pasture, he had retired yep. as a Mormon general authority. Yep. He gets excited about your work because he probably is concerned about the it. church yeah. losing members over the DNA controversies and, yeah. and modern historicity scholarship. Yeah. And so when a Mormon, when a when a popular emeritus Mormon general authority comes to you, Rod Meldrum, and says, Man, what you're doing is important. I really like it. What's that like for you? That's got to be pretty, it's got to be a nice endorsement, kind of validated. Well, right? it was, it was a, uh, like I said, it was one of, one of the first actual kind of leaders and a person in a leadership position in the church that, that, that actually um, had taken a hard look at it. And then, uh, and then, 
So then he suggested, well, you should you should probably record this. So we actually set up a time when we went and, and, and uh, had a guy come and record it. And I was just standing in front of a screen. I said, well, it's not about me. It's about the research. So don't have me in the camera. Just kind of just have a picture of the screen. So you had this really boring uh, situation with a, with a screen <laughs> you know, that, and, and this talking voice in the background uh, in the video. And we decided, you know what, that's not going to fly. And so, uh, so another, another friend of mine, Bill Ingeman, um, he, he was a, uh, he was a, he's, his, his, I think it's his, his niece is married to Larry King. The, yeah. The yeah. News yeah. Anchor, the, the CNN, CNN news, news anchor guy. Right. And uh, he had a house there in Provo and he wasn't using it, but a couple of times a year. So, so we arranged for him to let me borrow his house to do a presentation like a fireside. And that's the one we recorded. And that's became, that became the uh, DNA evidence for Book of Mormon geography. Okay. So, uh, so that's where that kind of came from. That was the four hour long yeah. beast. So really quickly, <laughs> how many years did your family live in what might qualify as, as legal poverty? trying yeah. to do apologetics for the church if you had to just estimate well, I, I wouldn't say we were in legal poverty because i mean I, I i did i was working for interact medical you know they they don't pay a tremendous amount but you know it, was, it wasn't poverty level stuff at all um but then okay um, how long did your family make huge financial how many years did your family make huge financial oh. or personal sacrifices to build up this um research this research yeah and to try and provide this level of apologetics to Probably the church how many years seven eight nine years okay I so mean, you you paid dues of heavy financial and yeah. time sacrifices yeah, i, I was, I was kind of leading up to okay. uh this, this one particular fourth of july and uh and and nobody wants to you know nobody's looking at book of worm and stuff in the middle of july kind of thing so um and yeah, you know, I, I didn't have many, many presentations. And basically we had a, a house payment we had to make and I had no money. I mean, it was the second of July and I, I had zero money to pay for that. And a friend of mine called me out of the blue and said, Hey, listen, we're doing this thing down at the park there. Um, you want to come down and, and, uh, and talk to people. And it turns out that, uh, I didn't have any speaking engagements or anything there, but it turns out that other people did at this park thing. And then a couple of people didn't show up. And so I ended up speaking in their place. And, uh, and, and, and had enough DVD sales basically that, uh, when we got done with the 4th of July that weekend, um, we had enough to pay the mortgage payment and 10 bucks. <laughs> that's what we and had. That's a Mormon miracle, right? Was, I'm, I'm, to me, John, it was. Yeah. I'm not trying to mock you. No, it, 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 it was, it was, it was, it, to me, it was like a miraculous thing. I mean, it was within $10 of, of our mortgage payment. Was that 08? Um, no, I think that was after that. Cause or, I still, cause I still had some money that I had saved up to, to, to make the jump basically, you know? Um, so I had to, I had to quit, uh, you know, interact medical and it was a total leap of faith. I mean, you know, I didn't know if we were going to crash and burn, go bankrupt or whatever, you know? I and mean, around just, what year was that? Do you think? Um, uh, between eight and nine, eight and nine. Eight and nine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so you made big sacrifices, and then your love of truth and your desire to put bolster all my, faith yeah. led you to yeah. ten years of heavy financial or personal sacrifices. Well, one of the things that was I think was uh, important, and people go, "Well, well, the firm foundation isn't even a foundation. I mean, it's not a five hundred one c three nonprofit." I know that's one of the questions that come up a lot. Um, people go, "Well, well, your organization isn't a nonprofit. You know, you're a for profit deal. You're just about the money." And I, and I almost have to laugh about that because I mean, if anybody knew, you know, the financial situations that we were in at the beginning, it's laughable, but the main, just to explain, you know, to your audience, why it is that we, but we didn't do a nonprofit, um, was because of my tax account. He said, uh, he said, I, I said, well, what should we get a nonprofit if we're going to do this thing? He says, well, he says, um, what is your, you know, how are you going to raise money? I said, well, I don't know anybody who's going to put money into this deal. <laughs> I'm going to have to do it. I'm going to have to do it myself, basically, if I'm going to, if we're going to do this. He says, well, the only real reason why you need to have a 501c3 then is if you're going to basically get other people to pay for your stuff. And I said, I don't know anybody who's going to do that. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to 
go out of my own pocket in order but to don't do you this. get a lot of donations and financial support um not really not donations and so forth not really we, we don't ask for donations i mean you look at our website i've never really done that we basically just made the the money that we that we work off of is from the educational materials that we provide oh and, so you don't go and, to and, like and conferences and the, and the, and now we moved into tours and so forth. We do some tours. I do like I'll have three or four tours this year, and they're they're sold out. And you know, but I mean, you know, tours is not going to make a living by itself. And doing conferences sometimes is actually a money loser, <laughs> you know. So far, so it's really the educational materials. It's the DVDs, the books, and not just mine, but all the other infrastructure that we have. So we have a lot of other people who've written books and, and DVDs and so forth that we also have in our bookstore. And then of course we buy those wholesale and then resell them. And, and so that helps to support our efforts. So, okay. we, so we've never had to go out and actually go out and, and, and beg people for money. When, when people pay money to a 501 C three, even though it's not supposed to happen, everybody knows that they, that they're also buying influence, right? I mean, so if, if somebody is going to give a big donation to a 501c3, they want to make sure that the 501c3 is moving the direction that they want and so forth. And I just wanted to be free to pursue truth. So I didn't want other people saying, okay, well, if you're going to do this and you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this. And so it's, it's given me a freedom. I think a lot of people don't have that opportunity to just do <clears throat> just research and just let it go where the research takes you. Okay, there we go. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. There, Terry, there. you look like you're about to. Uh... I have a question. I, yeah. just, <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> Every question I ask, John's like, save it for next time. I'm going to ask it anyway. Is it about a story? <laughs> um, it's, it's a follow-up to what he just said. Because okay. um, I just want to tell you where my brain goes. Because um, it just, it doesn't really make sense to me that there needs to be a like a system a gospel wherein the difference between somebody making it to salvation and not is a rod meldrum presentation or a book or a dvd so it kind of puts this linchpin on like well, people needing to buy things not doctrinal so it's not doctrinal well, but yeah. like that they would yeah. have an extra level of convincing that they might not have had previous to reading some of your evidences and that that's the linchpin that could save someone or send them to a different kingdom and change the trajectory of their entire life depending on yeah. coming into contact with your things and so it True. does seem like there's somewhat of a financial incentive when you're selling something that people's salvation depends on. What do you have to say to that? Well, basically when it comes down to it, everybody needs to have certain needs met. You know, they need to have money for food and, and shelter and so forth. Right. And there's lots of different ways to go about doing that. Um, one way is a 501 C three, you have a nonprofit, get other people to pay you money to do stuff, what you're doing. There's also grants and so forth that people get for science. But and she's talking like about God's plan of salvation. I'm talking basically, about she's saying, yeah. why does God's plan of salvation need Rod Meldrum, basically, for people to get saved? Probably doesn't. Really. <laughs> no, you're doing. No, come you know, on. Now let's. I mean, let's hold you accountable. Yeah. You you are worried about people leaving God's one true church and no longer believing in it. That yeah. you have already said that is the, one of the underlying motivations for everything you do. Yeah. So that makes Claire's Claire's question really relevant. You're basically feeling like yeah. maybe even called by God to save Mormons testimonies. I don't think I'm called by God to do it. I just feel like it's kind of a responsibility. You feel the responsibility. I, if, if I, if I've had the opportunities to learn things from the universal model project or how, you know, how to do research using that kind of, that kind of methodologies um, and so forth. I think, I think I have a, 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 a debt to mankind, I guess, if you will, to just like what you're doing i mean basically you know you you i think you have uh, you feel a calling to uh, you know to um have people you know share their 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 stories and so forth and uh, and and i i really and maybe this is wrong of me and you can correct me if i'm wrong but i i think a lot of people feel maybe what you do and that is that you know that like the you know the church was uh you know i i, I was brought up in this whole thing and I went through all the, all the, uh, you know, the seminary and Institute and, and all these other things. And then I find out later that, uh, you know, like Jeremy Reynolds and so forth, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, that's one of his big arguments. So I feel like I was duped, you know, and that can certainly feel that way. Um, 
especially when you have apologetics that does, that basically is is trying to to uh, straddle two different worlds. And I think you need to, you know, at least for me, um, you've got to decide which world you're going to be in. So I'm not really addressing your question. Oh, you are <laughs> but, because well, what we'll go okay. through is, is the problem of evil. This you're is... basically saying why would God allow Mormons to lose their faith? And you're saying um, that it's a no. messy world. I don't, he's not claiming, Kara, that yeah. God put Rod Meldrum into his plan. No. But, but go I, ahead. I, Do you I, want to restate I, your I, question? I feel like I kind of interjected myself into his into something, you know. But but I, I just kind of feel like it's uh, it's uh, where much is given, much is required, kind of thing, you know. And um, and if I've been blessed to have the opportunities to learn and to and to find out more about the scientific research and so forth. I mean, why not share it? And uh, I mean, wouldn't in fact, wouldn't it be wrong if if you if you knew something that was going to change people's lives for the better, make them happier, and you refuse to share that with them? Is that right? I don't think so. I think if you have something that makes you happy, that's the reason why I wanted to go on a mission. The gospel makes me happy. I want other people to be happy and well in the same fashion as I am. But Most people don't do it. Some people did. I'm glad for those that did. <laughs> you know? Just a quick qualifier, though. So when yeah. you served a mission, do you feel like yeah. you were called of God to serve a mission? Well, I mean, I got a calling that I feel like was inspired. So that was God that. calling you to Italy. Was... But, but I was raised that way. I mean, you know, John and I, we both raised that way, probably, you know. When you when you get to a certain age, you're going to go on a mission. That's kind of the. But do you like you Rod? Like, do you believe that there is a literal heavenly father, and he said to the like the administration of the church to call you to that certain place for that certain time? Um, like, how, is that how you believe God works? Okay, that he was actually calling you there. I have a reason I'm asking this. Yeah, um, I have been actually in the room where those callings are done, and uh, so forth, and. Um, you know, do I believe that they're all, every single one, inspired by God or whatever? I don't know. Possibly, I'm. I'm not the one that's you allow for to do that. error in all. I, of the I, I allow for the possibility that that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, my going to Italy. I don't know. Was that was that somehow destined and in, in my whatever? And it's kind I, of not I, a very I, I orthodox answer, wouldn't you say? I don't think Rodney's orthodox in any way. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, so I just not... wanted to. Because you just mentioned that you but, don't feel like you're called yeah. of God. To do the work you're doing right now is that a representation of what you just said um yeah he did say that he feels yeah that, that basically. where much is given much is, that he, that he feels an obligation i feel an obligation but, but, that, but that's different though than being like am i like an abraham or isaac or something like that or, or like a joseph smith no you know I, I think they had a they had a calling maybe and if i did maybe i mean that would be great but i don't know that i did you know, have this calling to do this, basically this work. But you have to, you I have feel to it's have important, the... And I think it does change people's lives. And, I, and from what I can gather, most of the people that life has been changed, it's for the better. So yeah, I look at the um, fruit, you know, where's the fruit? What is the fruit of it? We'll get into that in a second. Yeah. <laughs> more, more just, I'm just curious, like in your personal relationship with God that every yeah. Latter-day Saint is supposed to have, I'm, I can't imagine that you think that God is indifferent about the work that you're doing and that yeah, because to, to borrow on that, you talked well, think, about think, the, how many times truth was mentioned yeah. in your patriarchal blessing. Yeah. So to you, you did say that you interpret yeah. that to mean that God, through the patriarchal blessing, was telling you truth was important and that you should pursue right. truth. Right. So in that sense, yeah. Kara, I think you're saying there's some divine mission. And like, you know, we as Latter-day Saints, yeah. we always try to hope that we're led by the Spirit. I'm assuming you can correct me if you're wrong, yeah. that you're, you feel like you're led to the answers that God wants you to find that will hopefully one day bolster other Latter-day well, Saints. A lot, a lot of times uh, okay. you're led to, to dead ends too. <laughs> you know? um, so what you're saying is like but, but, which is being called good. a God it, is it, not it, super it's important. It's part of the learning to... process. I mean, when you get to a dead end and you realize, okay, this is the wrong road, we got to turn back and, and look at a different road. You know, so, so really whether it's, whether it's, um, whether you get to a, a, a good spot in the road or a, or a, or a dead end, it still can help direct your path into the right path. Does that make sense? We'll get there. Things will make uh, sense as time okay, unfolds. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, there, there was something though you said though that, that I, I thought would be important to make a comment about, and I can't remember now what it was. I'm, just, oh. I'm still trying to just seek out some clarity about how you view your yeah. role 
and what you feel yeah. like your mantle is from God that if you does God approve of what you're doing? Okay. Does he love what you're doing? Does he support what you're doing? Do you have a sense for that? Is that what you're asking, Kara? Yeah, if you want to put it in those. Is there another? Yeah, okay. that's that's the most straightforward terms. Sure. Okay. Um, answer that. I would say I hope he's happy with what I'm doing. I mean, I, I think I, I really feel like if if I had the inclination that he was unhappy with what I'm doing, I'd probably what stop doing, doing it. You know, but uh, but I mean, have I had some kind of a grand whatever that uh, that that I'm here to save anything or save the church or save this or save that? Uh, the answer to that is no. I don't specifically feel that way. I feel like that uh, that if if we just it's kind of like right now in this room, there's probably. Th 25 different radio frequencies stations that are that are coming into this room but we don't hear any one of them because we're not tuned to that frequency right so so bottom line is is that uh this particular um you know so all these frequencies exist they're all still there but we're just not hearing them okay so i guess what i would what i would say in, in, in relation to that um i think the closer you can become to the frequency that basically light and knowledge is or god is then it it, it leads you into that more frequency in other words uh, the, the closer you can get into a signal on a radio station the, the clearer it becomes right so do i feel like i'm doing a bad thing no uh do i feel like i'm doing a good thing yes um is it uh my calling in life it might be but i don't know that it is i mean it, it's it's possible. I mean, you know, I believe in a pre-existence kind of thing. So, so, uh, so, you know, I mean, I think Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were probably, you know, foreordained to what they were doing and so forth. Was I, I don't know, I guess I'll find out when I die. <laughs> you know? Are you being like, like having some false humility here? It almost feels like, it seems like somebody who would put all of their work into this. Like you should say that you're confident that God is wanting you to do this work. Well, I feel I like can, there's some false humility. There. I, I you know, would just I, say I, that I, people like Avram Gilead or wrong, Denver Snuffer in this yeah. church, if you claim to have some mantle that doesn't come through priesthood lines of authority, you get excommunicated, you get cut off. So if I were Rod, right. oh, I would want to be, say, I would want to be saying what you're ah, saying okay well but okay but that, i'm not but, trying to answer well, for I mean, you that, that's, one, <laughs> that's one potential motivation but the other motivation could be just the truth and that is just i don't know of course i'm not saying you it's know. yeah if i'm it, just if, saying if but it, it is, is dangerous. great if it's not it's I, i'm not worried about it put that way you know I, I don't feel like i've been uh brought to this earth to to correct anything or whatever my my life has been just Okay, what's the truth? Let's just, just can we can we get down to the truth? Can we find out what the truth is, and then adhere to it? That's really. So when it comes down to, you know, I know the financial aspect of it is kind of another thing. You know, well, well, um, you know, how, so how do we support ourselves? That that's I think I kind of covered that to some extent. Sure. Um, then we have these, we have our conferences and so forth, and uh, people come and and, uh, and 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 present there. Um, it has become. Um, I know people just, just, ugh, it's like some people just really hate when we say it's become a kind of a movement. It's more than just a movement. I mean, it's really a gathering of the more orthodox people who are TBMs, you know, true, true believing Mormons or chapel Mormons, or as, as some of the apologetics communities said, you know, well, there's the educated Mormons and then there's the ignorant ones who basically just accept everything on faith. Well, I guess I'd have to say we're somewhere, I'm, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. I, I, I do take a lot of things on faith because I know that there's some things that we're just not going to know. And I accept that. But there's some things that if we push, if we strive, if we try to find the truth, maybe we just need to look for it in the right place or, the, or, or, or be, uh, you know, turn over all the stones and, and, and see what's going on. And that's kind of what we've done with the Universal Model Project is to, to turn over the stones. You know, that where do we get the idea that the Earth is full of molten magma? Who's been down there? How do we know that that's what it's full of? We know magma comes out of volcanoes, but does that really mean that, that the entire Earth is full of that stuff? We're going to get there. Yeah, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> it, 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 what I'm saying is it's, it's the questioning with an open mind. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so you went from DVDs and books to then and, and lots of speeches yeah lots of presentations i mean hundreds and hundreds of presentations all over the world yeah. to then conferences 
So you started a conference called what? Uh, the, the first time it was called the Book of Mormon Evidence Conference. And that was started around what year? Um, well, probably 2009. Okay. So it was right, right after the DVD came out, okay. basically. And then uh, that, and that was, was up, held that was, in Provo. That was held up at the Zermatt Resort. Up oh, in, in Alpine. In Alpine. Or, yeah, Heber. well, no, sorry. Heber, Heber, Heber Midway. Sorry. Yeah. Heber, yes. And technically in Midway. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, my, my, my dear friend, uh, Bob Fuller, was the, uh, was the owner and perpetrator of that uh, of that establishment, and so he said, "You guys can come up and have a conference, and, I'll, and charge us practically nothing." And and so I said, "Okay, well, we'll do a conference." So we had, I think, we had 250 people that showed up at that conference, and and it's like, wow, we had like four speakers, and and then it's grown to where the the last actual full conference before COVID that we did, we had 130 four speakers and 165 classes in three days at the Davis, How many attendees? Davis, Davis County Convention Center and 7,500 attendees. 7,500 attendees. Well, over, what, over the three days. I mean, 2,500 per day. That beats this, Thrive. What's that? So that beats Thrive. Beats Thrive's but, 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 but we're only in, yeah, Thrive's second year. <laughs> um, but, you know, we'll probably never catch well, up to you, yeah. honestly, because nothing, I mean, fundamentalism has its own fuel that, that secularism will just yeah. probably never have. But, Really quickly, yeah. is the conference still called Book of Mormon Evidences? Or yeah, so this is going to be the one coming up in about uh, four weeks from now. It's again at the Davis County Convention Center. It's called, it's it's actually it it kind of evolved as well. Okay, so I, I believe in evolution, just not human evolution. <laughs> but anyway, just kidding. Anyways, I, I believe I believe that things do evolve. <laughs> okay, but anyway, so this evolved from the um, uh, from the Book of Mormon Evidence Conference, and this is the 29th um consecutive semi-annual conference that we've done so that do how many years so about two, 15 two years year. yeah two, two years. year okay um and uh, we have i think it's 85 speakers this time and about 140 classes so and it's called what and, and we call it the firm foundation expo why'd you change the name um, firm, what does firm foundation stand for uh firm is a it's an acronym it's f-i-r-m it's a foundation for indigenous research and mormonism okay Every, everybody had their their their, their four letter. I hate to say it, but their their, their forward uh, like fair, four, four letter like uh, fair Mormon F word. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> fair farms. They're all four letter F words. F -words. So you needed your four letter F word, <laughs> so you went with firm. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, and and also uh, one of, one of my favorite uh, hymns is "How Firm a Foundation," and so yeah, nice. So anyway, that's kind of fun. But that, that's where I just, I needed to have something like with an acronym. So firm foundation just seemed to work because also we know uh, from the, from the scriptures or from the, from the teachings of the, of the church that, that you shouldn't start with, you know, theoretical things, but you should start from a firm foundation of something that's known to be true and then build upon that line upon line and precept upon precept. And so that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to start with that, a foundation that's actually more solid. But that's not a nonprofit, the firm foundation. Correct. Not this point. I, although um, I've had lots of people say, "Hey, you know, you need to you need to make this a firm, a, 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 a nonprofit organization." We've toyed with the idea. I've I've just not felt that I, you know, again, I, I, the main I, the main purpose of a of a foundation is to be able to raise money, and I've I've been blessed to be able to have the money that we need to keep running the operations and so forth just from the sales of the uh, of the educational materials that we offer. So and care the thing you attended that you that covered was Book of Mormon Evidence Conference. Yeah. So that's what we're talking about. Yeah, that, it's actually, probably yeah. titled something else. We, we we call it the Firm Foundation Expo, featuring the Book of Mormon Evidence Conference, okay. because because Firm Foundation is more than just Book of Mormon, as you know. Okay. Kara was there, so we, have, we we talk about science and religion. We talk about uh, you know constitutional studies. We'd have uh, signs of the times, world events, you know those prepper, kind of things. Prepper stuff, kind of some prepper stuff. Yeah, I mean. Things that would be of interest to other conservative-minded people, basically. They don't have to be conservative to be there. Um, a lot of, like, pro-liberty. There's a lot of god fearing Americans. Yeah. Talk to um, yeah, a, a lot, lot of, of people there uh, at my time there. Very respectfully, by the way. Um, and I'm awesome. assuming everyone can, can, can buy a ticket or not. Do you not encourage just anybody to show up? Hey, did we ask for an ID or... Temple record. No, but I did get in? screamed at <laughs> and told she works for John DeLynn and to get out of there. And I was like, I am being very oh, nice. Yeah, I was very nice. I had great oh. conversations. I hugged everyone when I was done. Yeah, because I, I saw you I, actually. Uh, somebody pointed you out and, and said, of course that, they did. "Hey," uh, and I said, "Great, I'm glad she's here." I was there with my mom and dad, my husband. 
I was yeah, just having a grand old time talking to people. There's we, we don't, we there's don't. so many ideas. Now, if somebody wants to get disruptive and start no, to and interrupt the classes and so forth, yes, we'll have them thrown out. But uh, if somebody just wants to be there and listen to whatever, we yeah. But there's, Ask there's a million no, questions. No I was asking a million questions because there are legitimate things I had never heard of before. Legitimate. And Good. If, and I am sorry if that sounds condescending to just to ask a question I had never heard. I did not know that that was the something that somebody <laughs> believes. Is there a respectful way I can ask that question? And I uh -huh. found out, no, apparently not. No, just kidding. So I just wanted to get your take if anyone's right. welcome so, to go. Right. It probably depends on the question. It probably also depends on the personality of the person you're asking the question to. So, so these sure. so the revenue, the revenue one of these conferences generates is probably pretty large, right? Um, you would hope, but actually, most of the time we're either just barely in in the in the black, or sometimes we've gone in the red. That's profitability, but revenue, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars per conference of revenue, right? Um, well. No, probably nope. not. Oh, okay. I mean, I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, put it this way: how many, how many conferences do you know that is a three-day conference where you're going to have over a hundred speakers, and a lot of them are, are are people that are you know pretty well known. I mean, you have your Tim Ballards, your Alex Boyes, you know, you have you have a lot of a lot Glenn of, Beck, uh, Glenn Beck, and so forth. Now we couldn't get Glenn Beck to come to physically to the conference because it's, because it's too expensive. We can't afford to have his entourage of 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 people he has to have around him to keep people from killing him, right? I mean, it's it's a legitimate deal. People want to kill him, right? So you pay your speakers? Uh, no, we don't. Okay. We don't pay our speakers. Don't pay your speakers. So, um, I, and, and I, there's been a, an occasion where somebody is a speaker and they just don't have the wherewithal to actually buy an airline ticket or I whatever. And so we've kind of helped cover some of the logic. travel, but that's actually almost never happened either. Okay. It only happened in a couple of So you're times. saying it's cheap if, if, with three days and all those speakers. We, 40 bucks. 40 I mean, bucks, 40 yeah. bucks for a three day conference. I mean, okay. So seriously? it's a deal. It's a deal. So, right? so if 7,500, we, we, we have vendors that, uh, that, that pay mostly for the, uh, for the venue. I mean, cause we're talking about the entire Davis County convention center. So when you rent a, an entire convention center for three days, that's not chump change, right? Yeah. I mean, and that's all money that I have to up front because you got to get yeah. that. That's how it has no. to be paid for yeah. at least half or more in advance before the event happens. And then the rest of it within 10 days after the event kind of thing. But that can run into, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for just an event, you know, a venue. Right. And then there's also, you got to let people know about it. So, you know, so we have, you know, advertising on radio and, and TV sometimes and, uh, and, and on, on, on Facebook ads and, and all that kind of stuff and all of that adds up too and so that pretty much is covered by the admissions that we get um and then the venue is covered pretty much by the by the uh the vendors but when it comes down to the end of it I so mean, the, the vendors last, the last pay, couple of the conferences pay to have tables there yeah, the last couple of conferences stuff. by the time you get through all of it being done um it was either a wash or a loss right that but, makes sense. But when I say a loss, basically it wasn't a loss for me personally because of the fact that we had education materials there. And so we sell enough of those to to cover the loss and still have enough to yeah. keep buying food. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a couple hundred bucks, yeah. a couple hundred thousand dollars in in in, in people, gross revenue. In gross revenue. Yeah. And, and a the, couple hundred thousand dollars in expenses. So okay. it's a wash. Yeah. 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 Okay. But it's but your Mostly. educational materials must be flying off the shelf because they pay for your your salary, your living. And do you have staff? Do you have like part time or full time staff? For I have my wife. She does my our, our, our shipping and accounting. Oh, and I have uh, Ryan who runs our events. And, is that uh, run by volunteers? Are the events and he's, staff and he's paid partially or? retired? So are the events staff volunteer or are they paid? Um, sometimes we pay some of the staff members, but most of them are volunteer. That's nice. Yeah. Sunstone's that way. Sunstone has volunteers. Yeah. It depends it's because a lot of times the volunteers don't want to continue to volunteer when they, they want to go see the presentations. They want to go hear the speakers. And so we, in order to, to have somebody who's kind of not associated with the whole event, so they, you know, we, we have to hire some people and, and usually it's just family members or something like that. We can you know just pay a minimum amount and they can just be at the table there to, to monitor yeah. who comes in and out and stuff. Okay. A couple more quick questions. Yeah. A lot of people, b both with you and me, you know, there's this idea of priestcraft in Mormonism and it's evil to make, for some reason, general authorities can sell their books. It does our book and that's fine. <laughs> but if anybody else anywhere within Mormonism or ex-Mormonism yeah. making any money, people lose their mind. So a lot of people are like, how much do you make every year? Are you getting rich off of firm foundation stuff? Why don't you publish your, 
your salary annually, what is yeah. it you're willing to say about that? Yeah. And, and basically the answer to that is, um, you know, but probably one of the, one of my big concerns that I had personally in getting going, getting started with this is, well, okay. So is this, does this constitute priestcraft? And so I actually did a lot of research involving what exactly is priestcraft. And, uh, and, and as I, as I understand priestcraft is basically, uh, people who are, who are essentially telling non-truths or partial truths or, or things that are, aren't, aren't true, um, for their own glory or for their own, you know, money or to get rich or famous or something like that. And, uh, and so I, I guess I look at it from a, from a two prong standpoint. Number one, the first prerequisite is that it has to be something that's not true. As far as I am aware, everything that we try to do is the truth. I mean, we don't, you know, so I mean, we're not deliberately trying to, you know, to, to fake people out or to, or to, you know, to mislead or misguide people. And uh, that's why I said at the beginning of our, of our conversation that, you know, if I, if I ever am in a situation where I'm more in, more involved in defending my position than in finding out the truth, then I want people to call me out. Right. Totally. Okay. So. So, so it's not pre-scrap because it's true for me. First off, it's true. And the yeah. second thing is, is if it's, you know, if, if, if it's being done so that I can become famous or rich and so forth. And I mean, if I was going to be famous, I mean, I'd probably have a Facebook account at least. You still have social media. I, 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 I don't really do that. I mean, it's uh, number one, I don't get it. Number two, I don't have time. And number three, I but come on, you're it's, more known it's, it's than not, me. It's not about you're, you're, you're me pretty anyway. Well known, but you are pretty well known. Well, because we have DVDs and, and but you're just and saying that's not your motivation. So your motivation isn't to be famous and I could care less about being famous. In fact, I mean, when 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 uh, Fair Mormon and so forth, they were calling me out and so forth. They're going, you know, people go, oh, this is going to be the end of you. And like, yeah, you know, I don't really, I don't really pay attention to what they say. Mm. It's not even really a big deal about what they say because I don't care about being famous. I just care about what about being trash though? What I, about being denigrated and, and defy, you know, spoken ill of, you know what? Anybody who isn't thick skin enough, if, if you're going to, if you're going to be in this kind of game, um, you better be thick enough to, uh, to handle, um, a little bit of, of stuff. Now I, and that, doesn't, that, care? That, that? that doesn't mean open season on rod here now. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying that, uh, that, being being uh, denigrated, I mean, you look at people in history. I mean, you know, I mean, again, let's that, let's go to uh, Abraham Lincoln. I mean, was he denigrated? Yeah, and here's this backward Southerner, basically, who uh, who had a, a drawl and so forth, and, uh, and and people thought, you know, he was a loser. I mean, he lost way more times. You know, even people like like Babe Ruth and so forth. I mean, they struck out way more times than they ever hit home runs. But they kept swinging, <laughs> you know. So, so, uh, so my my thought basically, as far as um, you know, being rich and famous, I could care less. Honestly. Well, being smeared, you didn't summarize your smeared. Of you know, I mean, Fair Mormon spent almost six months of their entire organization, this time, effort, and whatever to debunk me. And do I have a response? I had I had like a three page response. My feeling is basically this: if I'm if I'm doing what I feel like I should be doing, then yeah, you know, I continue with it, and I'm not too worried about whether or not uh, Fair Mormon agrees with me or or those guys. The only I, 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 I do have a mantra, and I'm probably going to get hammered for this, but this is my mantra in my life. A number of years ago, I said, you know what? What is my life about? What I mean? Why am I here? And I came up with a really short, simple thing. And this is it. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> I basically just want to bring as many people as I can to Jesus Christ before I die. I think that he is the, uh, I believe that he is the, um, the purveyor of truth. I mean, basically the truth comes through him and of him. And, um, I love him. And the bottom line is, is that, uh, if that's the case, then, um, then what do I have to be afraid of as far as if I, if, I, as long as I'm 
trying trying to speak truth. And that doesn't mean I'm always going to be successful at it. I mean, I, I totally admit that, you know, there's going to be times I'm going to be wrong. And that's just part of life and living. But those those times when you're wrong also give you an opportunity to correct. And uh, and that's what that that's part of the reason for my story here. What I've, what I've been telling is, is that you know, I mean, I thought that my my thing about helping to bring people to Christ and so forth was helping to people prepare for last day's stuff with a food storage company. It went broke. <laughs> you know, I was like devastated, right? But it led to better things. I love so that. That was, that was beautiful to see the sincerity of your motivations. I don't mean to bring it back to money, but I just want to close off the two questions sure. for people that say one, you're getting rich now or two, they say, just disclose your salary. What do you say to those two assertions um, or questions? They're, 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 basically it's kind of a two edged sword as I, as I think anybody who's had a 501c3 would know. Um, that I think is number one is is that uh, you have to disclose like who's who's donating and so forth and so on, um, which is fine. I, I don't have any problem with that. I really just think that it, it, you said you're not it, about it, donations. It be, it be, yeah, it, it it becomes about the money instead of about the message. And so you know, I, I've had, I mean, Fair Mormon. I mean, they they were they were saying, oh, you know, he sold sixty thousand DVDs. Let's say that they're twenty dollars a DVD. He made you know this much money and so forth, and they not not even considering the cost of doing it or the fact that we discount. I mean, we, we were doing, you know, 10 DVDs for, for like 30 or 40 bucks or something like that. I mean, like three or $4 a DVD. Um, so, you know, they don't need, in other words, it, it takes it off the message. The message is basically book of Mormon has evidence and here it is. And we're not going to argue. I mean, you, you don't see on my websites, for example, you don't see all the, all the reasons why Mesoamerica is wrong or anybody else is wrong. We just want to tell our story, which is why I love the opportunity, John, to come and, and kind of just tell our story. Because as, as you've noticed, I mean, I haven't been trying to tear down the Mesoamerica stuff or anybody else or any other belief systems or whatever. I just want to have this information be out there so that other people can look at it and say, hey, you know, does this work for me or does it not? Also, how much money has the church paid Daniel Peterson or Louis Midgley over the years? To yeah, I mean, they, the they, they've been on salaries with BYU that, with that pro probably and, twice or three times as much as anything I've ever made in this whole thing. I, I don't know that. Annually, you're saying. But I'm just saying, yeah, an yeah. An annual Plus situation. the cruises that Daniel, it's kind of hypocritical for them to attack you on well, money. yeah. Given how much the church has funded them over the years. It, it's, 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 it's an easy out for somebody if they don't agree with what you're saying, but... Um, but they don't have any other good ammunition to say, well, they're just getting rich off of this deal. Right. And uh, so but if, you, if you got, you got to, uh, I know some people talk about this, but you know, I think Glenn Beck says, you know, follow the money. A lot of people say, follow the money where, you know, where it's going. Well, there's no money flowing in from, I, so I'm not beholding to anybody. And it's so liberating <laughs> to be able to not have to suck up to anybody for anything when it comes down to, uh, you know that because nobody's going to pull my funding um because it's independently raised and 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 quite honestly um i also feel like it's kind of a, a sacred obligation for me I, I i feel like the money that comes in isn't mine in the first place it's all everything comes from god and that means money and everything else i mean you know, all our natural resources everything that we everything our our society and life is built upon came ultimately from the earth, which if you believe that God created the earth, basically, then that's everything comes from God, right? So it's not my money in the first place. And I may, I may go broke doing this. You know, right now we're in a situation where, where things are, are pretty good, you know, we're, we're a lot better. But that, what that means to me is that I have more resources to do more good. Um, my wife and I have pretty much, uh, for, for years, we, we just said, you know what, we're going to live on about 4,000 to 5,000 a month. That's, that's what we did. If, if you were to see my tax returns, one of the reasons for not showing tax returns is because some of the years it was so small that it, it, it might encourage organizations that, uh, that, that oppose us basically to say he doesn't make enough money to even defend himself. If we were to, if we were to throw a, a lawsuit against them or whatever, he wouldn't even be able to pay an attorney to to uh, to even defend himself. 
So it opens you up for those kinds of issues as well. So not something most people have thought about, but when you make as little as we made for a lot of years, that's a legitimate concern. That makes sense. But the idea that you're getting rich, you would say to that. Um, you have to take a look. I mean, it, for, for years, I mean, every car that we had, 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 you know, six digits on the odometers, <laughs> you know, and so forth. Um, you know, it, it's, it's been better, but also some people equate, for example, um, you know, I've had opportunities to meet other people who've had investment opportunities and so forth that I've done that have turned out really you know, very well and so forth. A friend of mine, Ridge Hartley, he, he raises money for high tech, uh, um, companies and so forth. And, and he convinced me to put a little bit of money into a couple of different ones. And then they, they went public and, and went huge and we took the money out and invested in other things. And so I, I do have other investments besides this. You know, but basically to me, the money that comes in for this is earmarked for this. And uh, so, for example, we just started a, uh, a, uh, a program with our streaming website. We have over a thousand videos on our streaming website with the, about 350 present presenters. And, and basically all the money that come in, a, a, a big percentage of it, about 30% of the money that comes in from subscriptions goes straight out to our content providers. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't have to do that. We didn't do that in the past. It's something that I want to do because I want to support our infrastructure. I want to support the people who are doing the research behind the scenes and working in their basements at night and work, working full-time jobs and so forth. And, and just want to share information because they love the gospel. They love the things that they're finding and they're, they're, they're teaching people. Does that make sense? And what you said is basically you guys live on five, five ish grand a month and you it sounds like what you're saying is you Plus, earmark yeah. whatever profit yeah. beyond that, you feel a responsibility to reinvest that in the cause, not to, not to have yeah. some huge fat. Yeah. You know. and, and then, and then we, when we do get, uh, when we had money come in from investments and so forth, then we put that to different things. But I mean, like, for example, I'm building a house right now down in Fairview and it's a, and it's a big house. I mean, I, it, it looked a lot smaller on paper, <laughs> you know, when we were doing the plans. But it's, it's turned out to be a, a bigger place, but that's going to give us an opportunity to have us. We'll have a ability to seat eighty people in in a section above the above the the uh, the garage in this house that we can have presentations and have kind of a studio set up like you have here and things, so we can help get the message out. So it's all it's all the Lord's, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, and so. My deal is, is that if I can get the message out more effectively or more efficiently or with, um, with greater veracity, then, then great. And if it blesses people's life, then great. And if it becomes a situation where it stops blessing people's lives, then, you know, then we'll, we'll end it. As far as like volume of books or DVDs sold, I, I think you've outsold John Sorensen. You've probably outsold. <laughs> yeah you know fair yeah, mormon yeah. and and outsold uh maxwell institute and daniel peterson like can you talk about the volume of sales just not for any yeah. other reason than just to i think there might be some envy in why people attack you because of the success of your dissemination of information well, some people think i'm kind of a marketing genius and i'm not i'm just i'm just a basic guy um now i will have to say that you know i'm not i'm not completely ignorant about you know, marketing and so forth. I mean, I, I did study, you know, uh, business administration <laughs> for the two years I went to, uh, to Utah state, but the, um, but the answer to that, I think, um, the, uh, the first DVD actually went pretty, pretty viral. I mean, you think about the, how, how the, the number of members of the church, and then you subtract the number of members of the church that don't speak English and all of our stuff is in English. And then, uh, and then the, the number of people who actually care about the Book of Mormon and the number of people who care about Book of Mormon geography, I mean, you're getting down to a very, very yeah. small little number niche, here. It's a niche audience. Yeah. yeah, it's a very, very niche audience. Um, and so, uh, but the the first DVD, I think uh, our, our total numbers was about um, 65 to 80,000. And then I discontinued that DVD because we wanted to, instead of focusing on the DNA part of it, we wanted to focus on the the, uh, the prophecies and the promises, which is the primary reason for the Book of Mormon itself. Um, then the, the, other, the, the other DVD was in Deseret Book. Um, 
a couple of interesting factors that uh, we got into Deseret Book and and I got uh, the very first uh, book signing that's going to be happening down at the Deseret Book in Fort Union uh, here in Salt Lake. And then I, I was literally heading down to do the book signing for the first time. I'm pretty excited because I've you know never had a book before kind of thing. You know, this is interesting. And and uh, then I got a call from my publisher. And he says, Rod, he says, um, book, can't, book signing has been canceled. And um, and but Deseret Book is pulling your book from the stores. Oh, no. Okay, so what? for years, did did you sell your book and or DVDs through Desert Book? Yeah, yeah. How many years? Not, not not the first DVD. The first DVD, Desert Book never even Any never had them. that. So and then this one, basically, no, but, but, some, but somebody years, had called Desert Book and said that this book is full of false doctrine and they need to pull it from the shelves. Well, that would have been Daniel <clears throat> Peterson, Lewis Midgley, the, probably, but I don't know the, Mac, the don't Maxwell know Institute, the Farms Maxwell Institute people. But I just want to yeah. establish. Yeah. So for years, you sold your some DVDs and books through Desert Book. Correct? Still do, yeah. Still do. Okay, yeah. so they have been a, a significant distribution channel for you. Yes, yeah. That that shows and, that and, applies and, some and a lot of and, 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 and a lot of independence and so forth. Well, what happened was is when we when we first came out with this this book, the, the Prophecies and Promises book here, um, it it went into Desert Book. I think it was like the middle to end of October. And so it was just a perfect timing for the Christmas season. You know, you got Black Friday coming up, you got Thanksgiving and so forth. And we thought, man, this is going to, we, we got a, a lot of books, you know, printed and so forth to be able to do that. And then, uh, and then this, this uh, book sign was going to be about a week before Thanksgiving. And, uh, and then all of a sudden the book is pulled from the shelves. You know, somebody had called and, 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 and uh, had raised a red flag that this is, oh boy, you know, you got to watch out. This book has got false doctrine and so forth in it. And so it took Deseret Book almost four weeks, about five weeks, um, to, to review the book again a second time. <laughs> they had all of their reviewers basically look through it and they said, you know what, this is one of the most well written as far as, you know, the, you know the uh the, the amount of uh of documentation and referencing and so forth that is in this book we rarely see in the the lds book market and so they put it back on the shelves january 2nd <laughs> so it got back up it did it's still up but we completely missed the entire christmas season that year how long ago was because that? of that i was um let's see where the book came out was it uh this is one of the one of the printings. I'm not sure if this is this a couple is not, years ago. I think the original printing here was um, this is the fourth printing in 2010. Yeah. So in terms so, of oh, volume, I think 2009. So we did four we did four printings in a, in a year basically. That's a lot. So so in yeah. terms of volume of books and DVDs sold, do you even have a number <laughs> estimate? Is it in the hundreds of thousands? Um, probably. In total, yeah. I mean, I I have personally about what seven DVDs and then really three books, and I've and I've kind of co-authored other books. The annotated Book of Mormon here, which is the latest one, um, which Kara actually has a uh, a copy. Show your your personal copy. Look at all it's that. It's actually not my personal copy. Got, oh, it's not. Unfortunately, did my you mom. Steal it? What did you... I borrowed it from a friend. Oh yeah. Um. Just so you know, my mom tried to get this for me, uh, but unfortunately, I lost my faith in the church just that same month. So. Oh. Just I a month borrowed too this from a friend, but okay. yeah, she's too late. <laughs> Nonetheless, I have been reading this. Um. This okay. borrowed copy. Okay. Well, wait. So this. So this particular uh, edition is called the annotated edition of the Book of Mormon, and it is in Deseret Book. And, uh, and, but, but actually surprisingly, I have, hopefully, hopefully nobody from Deseret Book is listening to this, but Costco actually has sold way more of our books than Deseret Book has. Yeah. And we, we're in, uh, 14 stores right now, I think, or no, 17 stores of Costco in Utah, Idaho, and Arizona. Um, but I think it's probably just a pricing situation that Costco just, you know, doesn't take much profit. Their stuff. You know, Mormon families, they got, they want to buy one of these for each one of their kids. That's what my mom did. She yes, said, yes. She's like, that has happened. Get the big Costco lot. cart, fill it up for all of my kids. That's right. That's right. Buy one for each grandkid. That's right. Well, Costco's I mean, the place I mean to you think it. about it. I mean, how many books can you get that's a leather bound, gold embossed, gold gilded for less than 100 bucks? I mean, really? You don't even see books like that hardly. Very I'm much sold. Anymore. Okay. I don't even care what's in it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but anyway, so. 
but you know, I mean, Desert Book is like, like 70 bucks, I think, a Desert Book, which is our retail price, which which is again thirty forty dollars less than any other book in, that is similar in quality and size and scope and scale and so forth. And then that, and then Costco has them for like forty something. So um, hundreds of thousands of books and DVDs sold, probably over a million units sold. I, I have I have never actually. It's it, fine. It's fine. It it to it's me to me it's not about the numbers. It's just about just getting the message out. But you're way out so, selling yeah. Daniel Peterson, Michael Ash, John Sorensen, correct? Um, <laughs> I don't know what their sales are, and I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> okay. I'll I, I, that I did. For I you. did hear an interview though a couple of about probably three or four years ago with John Sorensen, and uh, and they were and they were. Um, celebrating the fact that they had uh, that his book an ancient american setting for the book of mormon had sold 25,000 copies over the course of the last about what, 35 years or something like that and when i heard that i was very much encouraged because i said you know what uh, cuz my 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 book called this book that's on the screen right here that explained the book of mormon america's heartland um that has had about 65,000 copies and then the annotated book of mormon has had i don't know several thousands i mean we were on the second second printing but we did much bigger printing on that one than we did on the these other printings were like five thousand a piece uh i talked to uh cedar fort publishing uh liar Mort mortimer there a long time ago because he were they were interested in publishing for us for a little bit and then they wanted to have the complete control over everything and again i don't i don't feel comfortable with, with giving my baby over to somebody else to raise you know kind of thing so, so so I, I I turned them down, but but the bottom line is is that uh, he said I said what what would you consider to be a successful LDS book? And he said anything that sells over about three or four thousand copies yeah would be considered a success. Yeah. It says and it says if you're you know a general authority or or somebody you know a, a well known well loved or whatever person within the church, then maybe fifteen to thirty thousand copies would be. He says, but probably the top book ever um, only hit not even a million copies. So that that tells you how much of a niche market this is. So to get sixty thousand copies of my first book, and then you know these other things, and then plus all the DVDs and uh, so forth, I, I don't keep track of that stuff. It's not it's it's not a it's it's not a uh, a game or it's not a race. It's just a, it's just what it is, whatever it is. Sure. So I the the question I wanted to end with. For this episode, and we're like freaking four hours in now. I thought this would be two. Um, but of course, how could I think that? This is Mormon Stories, and I'm John DeLynn. So, um. John just got on me last week about how like he always is right about the time. Now I look at you wrong. Oh, John's man. wrong. Well, wrong, you got you got two John. guys here who can yak with the best of them. Yeah. Right? Just so, no, make me? no predictions. Yeah, about you and me. Time. I'm a yacker. That- yeah. Oh, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, do you do you not consider yourself a yacker? I just ask questions, Rod. It'll no, be, you guys, you, you, we'll, you we'll be like, on, we'll, do a, we'll do like a TikTok live stream. And the way I answer a question is like in 30 seconds or less. And John's like, let me give you the complete history. Buckle in for five That's hours. That's true. Okay. I'm <laughs> loquacious. All right. I'm the same my, way though. My, my we, question we, we is. We relate with each other that way. Oh yeah. Loquacious? Fun. I'm having fun. Yeah. Even your words are long. Okay. I know. I'm the <laughs> yeah. worst. Okay. Maybe I'll end on this. Uh, have you ever had any interactions with church employees or general authorities where you kind of got encouragement or support or felt in any way kind of, and and maybe not direct or official endorsement, but encouragement other than Hartman Rector Jr. Like, obviously, I, I mean, the fact that Deseret Book is selling all your stuff to me is a huge endorsement because I know all sorts of cool people that tried to sell their books to Deseret Book and it's a hard no. So the fact that Deseret Book is willing to sell your books makes me wonder yeah. why the Maxwell Institute and Farms and Daniel Peterson would even bother to oppose you because clearly Deseret Book has blessed you. Now, some would say Deseret yeah. Book just wants the money, but I I don't think that's their primary motive. I think the primary motive of Deseret Book is to promote faith in yeah. the church. So what do you want to say about anything you can say about support either indirect or unofficial 
or support direct and official from the church. Yeah. And Kara wants, before you answer, I just Kara's want to clarify raising, for Never Mormons what Deseret Book is so that yeah, people know that it's owned please. by the church, yeah. technically. Yeah, go so. ahead. Yeah. It's That's the church's official yeah. publishing outlet. house outlet, and yeah. retail outlet for selling books and music and knickknacks and little statues of Jesus and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So just to clarify that Thank it's you. technically owned by the church. Yeah, definitely yeah. directly, yeah. officially owned by the church. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Kara. That was and great. Part of the, 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 uh, something of the first presidency or whatever, right? Yeah, I think. Okay. Um, so as far as um, my direct involvement with uh, leadership of the church, um, let me start at the local level first. Okay. So um, I had a state president when I first started doing this and, uh, and, and, and I, I wanted to make sure that that my local leadership knew what I was doing, right? Because I was doing this completely without any without I didn't I didn't ask anybody's opinions or or ask for any permissions or anything. I just kind of did what I did. And so uh, so my first DVD came out. I went to our stake uh, stake offices, basically their stake presidency offices, and I put a DVD in each one of the cubby holes of my, of my state presidency leadership, and. Um, I said, you know, I, I just want them to know what's going on because I live in a in a stake basically that has uh, got a lot of BYU people that live there as well. So I, I live literally about a mile and a half from BYU Lavelle Edwards Stadium, which that's Care's hometown. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Are you in North Provo or South Provo? Um, you know where Grandview area is. Yeah, yeah that's where we live. Okay. Okay. So now, now Edgemont. everybody can come and egg my house or whatever. Anyway, guys, so, be nice. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so basically the situation has been is that, that the, um, that, um, so I, I just wanted them to know about what I was doing and what was going on to, you know, and, uh, but there was, you know, but by this point in time, I'd, I'd ruffled a few feathers, I guess, there at, at, at some of the apologetics communities. And, um, and so I just wanted him to know that I wasn't saying anything really, you know, derogatory or whatever, as far as the church is concerned and whatever. Anyway, and so uh, then I, I, I'm, I'm not going to get into all the details, but basically uh, kind of got called in by my state president. And uh, he said, I'm, I'm really, you know, concerned about you and what you're doing. I said, well, have you, have you watched my DVD? He said, well, no. And I said, well, would you watch it? He says, no, I'm not going to watch it. He says, I already know. And I already know. Kind of reminded me of Simon the other day when, when, when he was doing his thing. He said, he hasn't read the universal model, but he knows it's not true. <laughs> it's like, Okay. It was the same kind of a thing. What year was this about? Uh, probably 2009. It was right after my first DVD came out, and basically, and 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 uh, he was he was somewhat upset by the fact that uh, Elder Rector Hartman Rector Jr. had actually done the forward. I didn't ask him to do the forward. He actually volunteered to do the forward. I said, "Well, that's that's you know that's that's awesome. You know, be it does lend some amount of credibility, which I lack because I don't have a PhD, right?" <laughs> and so, and I wasn't in Deseret Book at the time or any of that stuff. So it's kind of nice to have a general authority who who came on it. And he didn't give it a, a strict endorsement. He said, you know, it says, in fact, if you, if you watch the beginning of the DVD, um, he says, you know, he says, we don't know where it happened. We don't say where it happened, but we think it's a good fit for where it could have happened. And that's actually almost a direct quote from what he said. So, so he didn't get himself in trouble and I didn't get in trouble, but uh, my state president was upset by the fact that I was using a, a, you know, a, a general authority in my DVD to help promote my research. And uh, so anyway, that, that's really the only kind of a negative encounter. It turns out I found out that he actually had served his mission in Guatemala. So it was kind of an interesting thing. But, but, uh, but then after, after him. Um, he left you alone. He left you alone. He didn't pursue it any further. Um, no. Uh, well, I mean, hopefully, you know, he, I, I don't think he ever actually probably watched it or the information, but he, you know, he, he was keeping a handle on what was going on. I do know that there have been people in the administrative aspects of the church that watch our stuff pretty carefully. Um, I've actually been to some extent kind of disillusioned by the fact that I've, that I've had really no contact with the, with the leadership of the church. I've been, I've kind of thought, well, gosh, you know, if you have one of the best-selling books and so over the Book of Mormon and you have all this kind of stuff that you would naturally, you know, somebody would be there kind of, you know, saying, hey, you know, uh, okay, you know, do this, do that, whatever. And I've been kind of disillusioned by the fact that I have gotten nothing. I mean, if, in fact, I'm kind of, kind of going, you know, why not kind of thing, you know. 
I, I don't know if it's because I'm a pariah or I, I, you know, I, I don't think so, but, uh, but basically it's the fact that it stays in desert book is a, is a good sign, you know, but, but there was a definite, a deliberate effort to try to get my stuff out of there, you what know, about? by some other, some more or other organizations. And I, and that, I think that's, that's, that's unfortunate because we don't try to get anybody else's stuff censored or whatever. I mean, I kind of hate to say this, but this is a kind of, a little political bit, but it seems like those of a more conservative persuasion are okay with people having whatever their opinions are going to be. People who are a little more on the progressive side, they don't like it when people have opinions different than them, so they try to censor things. So I, I see that happening in the in the media in general, people being censored and uh, so forth because they because the people who own the media companies disagree with their opinions. Just my observation. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So you, so you, you wish sometimes you you feel like you would have liked to some of the brethren to reach out and cooperate yeah, nice. with you yeah. and collaborate with you. Yeah. The, the 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 only the only thing that I've ever really heard. Now I probably shouldn't say that, but <laughs> I, I had a friend of mine who was actually in the office of one of the uh, the apostles, and he said, he said, "By the way, I, I noticed your book was on his desk. That's all I know." Okay. That could be a good thing or a bad thing. It could be a bad thing too. Yeah. It could, <laughs> could be either way. I mean, I, I have no idea what the position of that particular apostle is or whatever, but I'm just, you know, it was, it was just nice that it made it on somebody's desk at least. If you had to guess how many Mormon testimonies you've helped save or strengthen, could you even estimate or guess? I don't know. I'd hope all of them. <laughs> Seriously. that I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, see... I, I, I had, I had at one point in time, I was, I would, I was receiving, I mean, I'd received like literally tens of thousands of emails and to the point I was getting 60, 70, 80 emails a day. I just, just no way my wife was trying to help me go through them and whatever. And she just kind of flagged the ones that were the most important. But for a while I was actually printing out any email that came out that said, you know, Hey, you know what? I'm, I'm grateful for your research. I'm, you know, I, I was, I was going to leave the church and now I'm, I'm think I'm rethinking that idea or people who weren't even aware of the church and so forth and say, Hey, I was just on your website and I saw this DVD and what are you talking about with this stuff? And this sounds interesting or whatever. Um, I had seven, like three ring binders, you know, the big, like the three inch, three ring binder, that's seven of those um, full of just print off, printed out, uh, you know, emails and so forth of, of people. I, I don't know. I don't try to keep track of it. It's not like I'm trying to keep records of it. I, I figure, you know, maybe if God's keeping records in the other side, maybe I'll find out then. But it doesn't really, you know, affect me really. I, I, I hope that the research that we do does affect people and does cause people to uh, to rethink um, their their uh, their their doubts, maybe. I mean, we've all had doubts. I think, you know, everybody has doubts. I mean, we, you know, there's things that just sometimes don't seem to add up and we don't have answers to everything, but I wish I had the opportunity to, uh, to address more of the, uh, the, the concerns that Jeremy Reynolds expressed and, in, in his, you're about to thing because, uh, <laughs> that's what we're going to next. <laughs> really? Cause, uh, cause again, it, you know, I, I'm, I'm the, I'm the kind of a person, if I don't have an answer for you, I'm just going to tell you straight up. I don't have an answer. I don't know this. Sure. But in areas where I've had the opportunity to do some some deep dive research, I'm I'm ready to to talk about it. Yeah, um, yeah. I would just say that I found the apologetics from Farms and Fair Mormon and the Maxwell Institute overall to be much more damaging and harmful to people's faith than actually helpful. And that's why. And I find them, especially the you know, the Peterson Midgley types to be not only disingenuous, but also mean spirited. And so one thing that you and I share is that we've both been victims of what I think is, is mean spiritedness and cruelty and dishonesty at their direction. Yeah. And, but the other, other thing is I think at achieving the goal of not just unit sales, which isn't your goal, it's probably not theirs either, but in terms of achieving the goal of bolstering faith, Kara, I don't know if you'd agree with this. I think you've been way more effective at bolstering Mormon faith than Fair Mormon and Farms and the Maxwell Institute. 
Because I, because they're like, revol- as far as I'm concerned, they're a revolving, they're a revolving door. door. They're a revolving door. They're like, like RFM a used to be a you know work for fair, and so did Bill Real. And there's just so many people who, at some point, those answers just kind of run dry. But at least where Rod's trying to go is something that has somewhat a scientific region to it whether or not we agree on the findings but it feels like it's <laughs> yeah. it goes back to that yeah. fundamental thing they're not trying to nuance the answers and have a yeah. progressive I take think, on things well i think we're kind of like all in yeah on, all, the, on yeah. the church side right. and i think and, you have credit i think you have you know, integrity in the sense that so, you're not throwing you're not wanting your cake and eating it too of like yeah the prophets are prophets there's revelators in the book of mormon scripture and now we're going to make a bunch of explanations that basically say they're not really prophets and it's not really scripture and it's not really history. It throws both of them under the bus yeah. I mean, to some extent. That, that's the way I kind of see it. Now, some would say you, you throw... try to reconcile the science and the religion um, and, 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 you, and you're using it. It's, it's, I look at it like kind of like this when I when I was first came out with my research. OK, um, basically everything in CES and so forth is all pretty much mesoamerica yeah right and 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 so they said well you well you have to address the questions that we want to ask and i said well why do i have to do that i i, I have some new questions that you guys maybe haven't thought of and 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 it's kind of like playing oh, playing on a, on a on a soccer field and you're playing the other level. team and the soccer field is raised about to this level towards their goal yeah you're fighting an endless battle. There's there's no way you can fight them on their own field. So you have to level the playing field. And when you get the playing field level, then all of a sudden you go, wow, okay, this makes some sense. So that so leveling that playing field, in other words, I didn't try to go publish through farms or fair or any of these organizations because I knew that they're not going to publish my stuff. Yeah. And I and I would just say, Kara, this might be a slightly different characteristic than yours. I some might say that. Well, you might say that um, that the Maxwell Institute, Fair Mormon, Farms type people are kind of throwing the scriptures and the restoration and the prophets here's and revelators under the bus a little bit. Uh, okay, I, I want to be really careful about how I how I how I particularly phrase this because I I really believe that Dan Peterson and and Lewis Midgley and so forth. Not so sure about Lewis because he and I had a run in one time and it was not pretty, um, <laughs> but pro- probably the the, the rudest person I think I've ever encountered in this whole thing was Lewis Midgley, but that's just between me and him. Dan Peterson, on the other hand, very likable, very enjoyable. We've had dinner together and so forth. In person. In person, yeah. <laughs> um, and he, and but, he, but he can get a little, you know, mean-spirited and so forth. My feeling is, is, you know, you don't need to attack the other person. But at hominem, will, at hominem, is, feel, the, at hominem is the currency of modern Mormon apologetics. I well, think. it, and... If that's the case, then that's that's sad, and that's another area where I respect you way more than you know the, the because uh, because you can, you can you should be able to agree to disagree without being disagreeable, and uh, and 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 let people kind of make their own minds up. You know, you don't have to you know force feed or shove things down people's throat, and you don't have to disprove somebody else to show that your that your information may be more correct. Yeah, you know, um, so. I, I don't ha- I don't have any really ax- access to grind. I mean, I've been I've been you know I mean Fair Mormon and these guys and and uh, and Maxwell Institute, they have spent. I, I I actually shudder to think of the money that they've spent in trying to debunk me and my research, but it just but it continues on and um, you know it hasn't squelched it. If anything, it's kind of like their uh, it, it 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 follows the the process of. Of, uh, of 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 paradigm changes basically at first it's ignored and then it's violently attacked and then it's shown to be correct and then it's then it said Embraced. well this is the, this is what we believe all along <laughs> you know kind of thing yeah. <laughs> um and so so the violently attacked part was one of the earliest earliest stages and i think we're well beyond that um we had um we did have some amount of reconciliation i actually got to meet i you know people who were attacking me kind of thing I didn't really know who they were and so forth. And, but we had, a, we had an opportunity to go back East and actually take a number of these individuals and a bunch of uh, church education people and administration people and so forth back to, um, uh, to, to the heartland. And we spent four days out there showing them some of the archeology span and the and, and other research that we've been doing. When was this? And I got to meet a lot of these guys and they're, they're, they're great guys. They're, they're, they're really nice. Um, 
you know, especially in person. When was this? Uh, probably about five, six years ago. Okay. And uh, anyway, so I got to actually, I, I'd never met, you know, Jack Welch before, you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, you know, Roper and, and all these other people there, but, but they're genuinely good people. I mean, they're, they're nice guys. I, I, I don't know if I'd be like buddies with, uh, with, with, uh, you know, Jack or whatever, <laughs> but anyway, so, but, uh, but we, at least they got to see that I'm not just a, a wild eyed, crazy guy. I think that's kind of how they wanted to, to, uh, portray me and our researches that we're, we're, you know, we're, but, you know, I mean, some of the things that we've been called is, you know, well, you, you guys are, or you know nationalists and you're you're racist and so forth you know and you're and you're you're white supremacy people and and all these funny things i think it's it's so hilarious because i think the one you you came to kara mm -hmm. we had a native american celebration with like 20 native americans and so forth if that's racist or somehow white supremacist i'm i'm kind of like and we'll beyond people me. do things for interesting reasons. That's that's a different topic for another reason. Yeah, I mean, there was a singing of the Red Man song at that celebration too. So that's neither here nor there, in my opinion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah we can, we'll cover that. We'll cover that topic in next yeah. next part. Okay. But but anyway, yeah. So you know, so but uh, but I'm not going to apologize for things that I feel that the Lord said about America and the uh, and specifically the um, yeah. the founding fathers and uh, so forth. I mean. If he said he raised up men for the very purpose of establishing the United States of America, and that America has a particular special place in the in the in human history, I'm not apologizing for that. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, let and the we'll, cards work, you know fall where they may. And we'll cover that. But you're basically saying you've been able to reconcile a little bit with uh, with the with the other types. Yeah, of and, and it's calmed down a lot. I mean, the last several years, it's been pretty pretty quiet on the Western Front. You know, when it comes down to uh, you it's know, super strategically dumb things. for a house to be divided. Like Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. For the Maxwell Institute Absolutely. and Fair Mormon to yeah. be attacking you guys and and Deseret Books selling your books yeah. makes no sense. What, what's smart is what the church apparently appears to be doing, which is to support multiple models. Yeah. So that whatever you want to believe, you've got a model. Well, and that, and that was kind of the goal of having this 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 um this get together, if you will. Uh, yeah. the, the, the idea was basically we were going to go to uh, to uh, the Heartland and 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 have us myself and uh, about five or six other Heartland you know proponents of the Book of Mormon geography. Um, and then there was about uh, eight or ten of the Mesoamerica uh, proponents, and they were there. And then there was a bunch of church administration people and so yeah. forth as well. Uh, but with the goal of kind of some kind of reconciliation, because, you know, it, it just stinks, you know, to high heaven to have, you know, I, I put something up online and then you got uh, these, these apologetics organizations basically going in and hammering me and so forth. I'm like, guys, we're on the same team here. Yeah. You know, if, if we were a football game or whatever, you know, I mean, we're trying to, you know, we're, we're on the same team. We're just trying to decide whether we're going to take it around the end or go up the middle or do a pass. In the meantime, the other, the other side is kicking our behinds and taking it down the field. Okay, that was going to be my last question for this episode. <laughs> yeah. Why in the, if your goal is to bring people to Jesus, and by the way, yeah. I'm just going to say very specifically, our goal is not to cause people to stop believing in God. I'm talking about Mormon Stories now, the Open Stories Foundation. Kara, I hope you agree with this. I think you do. Our goal is not to cause people to stop believing in God. It's not to stop people believing in Jesus. It's not even... To get people to stop believing in the Book of Mormon or the Church, it's to the goal. it's it's to provide information so that people can make informed consent, and then it's to promote healing and growth for people who find the Church Orthodox Mormonism going to work for them. But yeah, that's that's so you you're okay with that? Kara? Yeah, you can quote me all the way back to my Mormon Stories interview where I said that the Church is always going to be around, and some people like my parents joining the Church was their leveling up. And I don't know everybody's situation about what right, works right. best for them, but I do think the information should be as transparent and open as possible. And at Mormon Stories, we let people tell their stories, positive, negative, and well, let people come very, to their own conclusions about how that, what yeah. kind of interaction they want to have with the church, especially going back to how they want to have their kids interact with the church. Um, we just, you know, highlight uh, issues with systemic abuse within the church, and then you have to then decide what your level of involvement is in, a, in an institution that often cares more about PR and money and um, authority than sometimes the children that are in the church. So I think making a very important informed decision about what kind of influence you want to have with your children in the church is how I would put it. Yeah. And that's just to say, I'm just telling you, looking in the eye, our goal isn't to tear down the church. 
our goal isn't to even destroy faith. It's literally just, we felt we weren't given all the information. We sometimes see the harm the church causes. So we feel like everybody deserves to have all the information and to, and the church needs to harm less people. And then we're here to help people for whom the church doesn't work. We're here to help them heal and grow in other ways. However, that was just a long way of saying, regardless of all that, we're viewed, Mormon Stories is viewed as one of the top enemies of the church. We've even been named as maybe the top enemy of yeah. the church. Yeah. Um, and we're viewed by people on, let's just say, your aisle as tearing down faith, destroying faith, taking people out of the church. And so I was going to end with this question. Why in the world would you come on Mormon Stories podcast? Why would you sit in a room with Mormon Voldemort, as I like to call myself, <laughs> which makes you, Rita Skeeter, who are you? <laughs> If I'm Voldemort, who are you, Kara? I Did don't know anything this? about Harry Potter. I'm Neither not a very good I, Mormon. So you're you're yeah. talking to two people who uh, okay. don't know. Well, if I'm <laughs> if I'm literally like modern Mormonism's core whore, why would you ever? Agree? No, a better way to put it is a uh, chat, and I think it was the one that yelled at me when I was at the Book of Mormon Evidence Conference, who told me to get out of here, don't talk to her. She works for John Dolan. So why would you come? here where one of your supporters says don't even talk to Kara don't let anyone talk to Kara at the Book of Mormon events conference why would you come to our podcast and talk with John and me with one many, of your own supporters how many people did you actually end up talking about at the, at the conference how many people did I talk to, to directly I mean, like 20 30 40 oh how many did I talk 50? to directly yeah uh, at least like six that I had good conversations with. Okay, and uh, and one of those was one of those said, one. "Get out of here, Kara." I don't but, think but she, everybody else was pretty okay. Everyone though, right? else was okay. Everyone I don't think she's right. saying the bad. Okay. Your, okay. your conference has bad. Yeah, no, I, I would be disappointed if you if if, if, if I'm you saying everybody that specifically. Our conference was like, no, no, I'm just I'm trying to like really hone down John's point that if there's yeah. somebody who's like in our chat right now who's watching this, yeah, who like is trying to facilitate this understand Why that we're trying I to facilitate on? a conversation yeah she was wondering at the conference what's Kara doing here still the question does remain why would you come and talk to us yeah okay um actually it's several several fold uh like probably one of the first things was uh was is the interview with simon you know and so forth i mean you know we drew he, first blood he, he, yeah yeah <laughs> well, I mean, well, well the thing is is that i mean he and i have actually had several you know you know back and forth and so forth on emails and so forth. I've never actually had the opportunity or privilege to meet him. You know, he seems like a nice guy and so forth, you know, so, you know, I'm, but then I, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I can be a little naive and it comes down to some stuff, but anyway, but then, uh, so there was the, the, the direct, um, you know, throw down of, you know, Hey, if Rod Meldrum wants to come on this podcast and, and, uh, and, and address what uh, Simon's saying, you know, then, then he's, he's, you've, you've, get, you've got an open, channel to be able to do that so i thought well that was me yeah that was you I, yeah <laughs> it's your fault anyway, and then and then, the, and then there was uh you know i and and, and and i'm going to be really candid here for a second and that is that uh i have had personal friends of mine who've who've uh had their their kids and so forth have watched mormon stories and have and have and have lost their faith you know so that's 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 kind of another factor um for me is be able to, uh, to, to maybe, maybe we can address this from a, from not the, the not the same apologetics that, that we've been getting. I think we've had faulty apologetics. I mean, and that's, that's just my personal opinion. I think we've had a lot of people trying to have a foot in both camps. And I think you're going to find through our interviews here that I'm, I'm all in when it comes down to the church. So I think that we have ways that we can show why there's discrepancies and that's what that that's what the whole scientific you know conversation will be about is that that you know if the book of mormon and, and so forth is true and so forth you know i mean what what about the creation what about adam and eve what about you know and all these different things noah's ark and all that stuff and uh, and is there any any kind of evidence to suggest any of those things may have actually happened and and uh, so we'll address that when we get to that point the spoiler alert Anyway, <laughs> so, so, uh, so why would I come? Um, I have, I, I think I've found that you have been less combative than a lot of, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I'm almost embarrassed by some of the things that have happened with like uh, fair Mormon and so forth. I mean, you know, but they, they've just uh, attacked and uh, done some stuff and I'm like, why are you doing this? 
you know, is this really what Christian people do? And I think some of the some of the times that you know the way that they've treated you and uh, and and so forth has been, um, I think not a little bit more mean spirited than I would have liked to have seen. You know, um, I, although I, I will have to say that I think you can dish it out pretty well as you know. I mean, you're 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 not a novice in this situation either, so I'm going into it you know, eyes open. But I really feel like with the with with the uh, with the new information that we have to be able to share with a lot of your listeners who have um, who have questioned and have maybe have lost their faith or are on the on the verge or or just want it, you know, where we need some answers, you know. Um, hopefully, through this uh, through this interview, my hope is that they'll see that there's there maybe there's a reason for faith, maybe there's a reason to stay involved um maybe it's uh may seem a little hocus pocus to some people but i think that when you take a look at the really take a look at it um it's based on some really sound scientific things that are not pseudoscience and i mean it, it, it could be considered pseudoscience because it's not mainstream necessarily but the information that we're going to be using and talking about is from mainstream sources of data and just a different interpretation and by just looking at the a different interpretation of the of the observations that we have in nature we'll find i think um some real opportunities to say hey you know what maybe there's something to this love that and uh and if that's the case uh maybe some people who have who have left the faith and have, and and have that 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 feeling of being duped and 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 uh so forth and you know conned um We'll come come back around and say, you know what? Maybe there's, maybe it's not what we thought. Maybe there's more to it, and uh, that's 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 the reason why I tend to come into the lion's den. Thanks. And, uh, <laughs> and, We've been and nice as kittens kidding. here, I swear. You guys have been great. I I, I will say so. Anyway, so thank well, you I, for that. Well, thank you. I really there's so many uh, people, you know. Givenses, the Bushmans, the Ma Masons, like they used to come on Mormon stories, but now they won't. And I, I've lost respect for a lot of them. They'll have their excuses, but I honestly believe at the heart of hearts, they, they, they know that they can't really defend what a lot of their arguments are claiming and they'll do private firesides that are secret, but they don't want to say publicly the types of arguments they're making. And what I really respect is you're willing to stand behind your arguments and come, like you say, into the lion's den and look look us in the eye and and give us respect, but also uh, share with us your positions. And so I, I really respect yeah. that. And I really respect, uh, I think there's a real integrity and a real sincerity to what you're doing. And I, I feel like I can see it. I think, and, I, I think uh, every, every, every soul is precious in god's eyes and that doesn't matter whether you're an alma or a nephi or a you know a you know paul or a or a, you know whatever whatever it might be you know so i, I you know the, the one the one one of the things i really love about the gospel basically is that we get do-overs <laughs> we all get do-overs you know what? We we make mistakes. We do screw up. So we 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 uh, we think incorrectly, or we find out information that turns out not to be correct. Or we rely on things that aren't necessarily true, and uh, we may go off in different directions and so forth. But uh, but ultimately, um, we can we can change. We can we can adjust. We can you know have a different trajectory in our lives and. And I guess that's what my hope is. Maybe coming coming here and and uh, and having this conversation with you guys is that maybe it will touch some people's lives. Maybe it won't. Maybe it'll touch yours. Maybe it'll touch mine. I don't know. Um, but I, I appreciate the opportunity either way. Thank you. Beautiful. All right. Is that enough for this particular segment? I think, that's, I think we Woo, hit four dang. hours and 30 minutes. So, Kara, how are you doing? Dang. I'm actually doing really good. This is fun. John knows that I came in this morning kind of on like a NyQuil hangover where I was like, I don't know how this is going to yeah, go. Yeah, you said you had a fever even. Yeah. Where's your mask, young lady? I Just know. Kidding. 
six feet apart. I am, I, I am like, just kidding. It's just I, a sinus I'm, I'm infection. Like worst, You'll probably heard me nasty. like, you know, snuffling. But anyway, okay. this has been a really good four and a half hours. Can't believe we still have more to do. So thanks to all. Well, first of all, thank you, Rod. Kara, you're amazing. Thank you so much for uh, helping to make woot, this woot. happen. Thanks to Gerardo that makes all this possible. Jen is over there doing time notes, show code, time codes he and show talk. notes. So thanks, Jen. And uh, yeah, um, thanks to all our viewers and who are making wonderful comments. We've had pretty much close to 500 people this whole time sustained on the live stream, which is a pretty big number for middle of the day. Um, a Wednesday, and, middle of the week, middle of the day. Yeah. And just thanks to everyone who makes more <laughs> stories possible. We couldn't do it without you. Um, okay, so I have a problem, and Kara, we need to talk about this like real time. So we didn't like, expect this to go till three p.m. We did <laughs> not expect the part one to go four and a half hours. That was part one. I thought it was part one and part two. We well, didn't. No, no uh -uh, we didn't get into Harlan. No, we didn't get into no. anything. Oh, I want to okay. talk about how you how you view the gospel, like just the, the history stuff, the Jeremy Reynolds stuff. Like, what is your what is it? How do you Book how do you view Translation. history in the gospel? And uh, what is your kind of, how do you, how do you still believe in 2022? I kind of wanted to do that. And okay. and what explanations do you give for just the high level problems that the critics make with, with the church, like Sear Stone in the Hat? I want to know, I want to know how my mom went from believing in one Book of Mormon translation theory, and then she went to one of your conferences over a course of years. And then when I'm like, mom, Russell Nelson has his fate face in a hat, looking at a stone in a hat, saying this is how the Book of Mormon was translated. She sends me a bunch of your stuff. So I want you to explain that whole Book of Mormon <laughs> translation thing to me because it just don't All make right. no sense. So we yeah. have to have a whole other part of it. We can do a deep dive into that if you'd like. That would be One fun. day. Well, I'm yeah. just saying. Probably, I, we'll maybe, run out of time probably Maybe today. not now. I don't know. Whatever. I would, I'm would. i just saying I would love to understand Rod Meldrum's faith and testimony. That would be my part two. I think we kind of covered a lot of that well but, yeah. the foundations of it but i mean the, yeah. the details of it i'm i'm curious yeah. what you think about joseph smith's treasure digging i'm curious what you think about the translation of the book of mormon i'm curious what you think about his polygamy his polyandry um and some of the I'm, things i have opinions about and uh and research and done research on and some of those i haven't so yeah i'll tell you when i haven't yeah and, then I'm, <laughs> and, and just what what does scripture mean to you what do prophets mean to you we've covered that maybe it's only an hour discussion but anyway yeah i came in wanting to have that conversation as a second conversation okay and then the third conversation is the conversation about the heartland what theory is it? and uh three o'clock yeah what? yeah so oh, i don't cool. so what we're gonna have to do is have a talk about whether we try and cover all this today or whether we schedule a part two but even after, even if we do a part three, which is about the Heartland theory, I still want to have at least a part four or five where we get Simon or Thomas Murphy or others in the room with you. And we have scientists talking to you about both the universal model and about the Heartland theory and the scientific problems that, that might be addressed. Yeah. So yeah. I guess I'm saying viewers and listeners, I'm not sure exactly what parts two or three or four are going to look like and i'm not even sure about what today's live stream is going to be like Kara, do we want to end this live stream and start a new one or do we just want to keep this live stream going take a break and then come right back and keep the live stream going do you have an opinion what i think, think we should end it and start a new one okay all it's right own separate so, youtube video so we're going to be doing a part two today at least a part two today and for those of you who have been watching and want to partake in part two you're just gonna have to watch uh, the YouTube channel, Mormon Stories Podcast YouTube channel, or the the Mormon Stories Podcast Facebook page, where we'll be soon putting up part two. And then we'll decide, we'll see whether we have time for a part three today. And regardless, listeners, viewers, whenever you're viewing or listening, you can count on, at least from our commitment, at least a part three, if not a part four, where we talk about the Heartland model in depth, and we bring scientists on to have sort of Rodney Meldrum talks to scientists, hopefully in a non-combative, <laughs> constructive way. Yeah. yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. Sounds Kara, good to me. Good, Kara? Kara? Amazing. You good? All right. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. And uh, thanks, Rod, again. You're awesome uh, in so many ways. And we disagree with you in some fundamental ways, or we see things differently, and that's okay, too. That's right. And uh, we'll make we'll, the world go around and different, different ideas, different thoughts, different opinions. Yeah. So we'll, uh, we'll see you guys all back really soon. 
for another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast and for more with Rod Meltzer. See you guys soon.